Here. Myers. Here. Peterson here. Ray. Here. Williams. Here. Weininger. Here. Okay, Pledge of Allegiance. Moving on to our DCSD spotlight, and I'll turn it over to Acting Superintendents Abner and Hyatt. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm honored to lead the student and staff recognitions portion of tonight's Board of Education meeting along with my teammate and acting, co-acting superintendent, Ms. Danell Hyatt. We have a phenomenal school counselor and two incredibly talented students to recognize this evening. Let's start with our students. Colorado State Representative Jason Crow recently named the winners of the 2021 Congressional App Challenge in Colorado's 6th District. And those winners are none other than two students from our very own Rock Canyon High School. Please join me for, um, up front here, students Audie Kana and Sujay Potlapelli. Give them a big round of applause as they make their way up. Recording in progress. Right here, guys, and the board can see and the audience can see and everybody at home can see you. Um, also, could I please have uh, Rock Canyon High School Interim Principal Megan Brown join us up here, give her a big round of applause. And Executive Director of Schools for the Rock Canyon Feeder, Mr. John Gutierrez. All right, Audi and Sujay, congratulations. App developers, I understand your winning app is called DCSD Core Select, so you're trying to help us do our work, which is even more appreciated. We appreciate that from you guys. Can you tell us a little bit about the app and what inspired you to create it? Um, we were just sort of inspired by our own experiences and like, the things that we thought we could improve in, uh, in course selection. And the app really just helps students pick out their whole high school career and really improve that process um, and by making it all in one place. And we really just wanted to help the district and students alike by just eliminating a lot of the, um, a lot of inefficient processes that really go into course selection, make it easier for everyone. Yeah, I agree, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it just makes um, course selection a lot easier. So it lets like students plan out their entire or high school career, and then it shows all the credits. And we're currently working with um, Mark Blair and his team, like the technology staff, I guess. And we're trying to implement it. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, thank you for recognizing us. Absolutely, and thanks for making our systems better. That's awesome. Interim Principal Brown, would you like to say a few words about these two young men? Uh, well, yeah, I, when, when we first heard about this, my first reaction was was right on. Um, That's really cool, this, this amazing competition that they just won. But after you see the app, it's not even fully built out yet. And it's really incredible, the potential of it the, to bring ease and efficiency and, and saving time for any school that might potentially implement it in the future. So my second reaction on hearing this was, well, of course, it's really incredible what these two have um, developed in such a short short time. So we're really, really proud of, of both Audi and CJ, um, CJ for um, kind of living the mission and being great examples of students living our mission at Rock Canyon because they were, you know, s explored something, they excelled at something, they, they went beyond the scope of the classroom to develop something that is now being um, recognized at the national level, but they've also created something that is an extension of their learning at, at Rock Canyon. And so I'm really grateful to them uh, um, excelling in the classroom, but then now excelling outside of the classroom for all of their hard work. Um, but I'm also really grateful to the teachers um, that have played uh, any small role in, in inspiring them to do this and to, um, to extend their learning outside the classroom and, and empowering them to, uh, with the self-confidence to, to take this on and, and and um, have this amazing achievement. So yeah, they are amazing Jaguars and we're very, very proud of them. All right, yeah, let's give one more big round of applause. All right, now it's picture time, guys. So we'll present you here with your certificates. Congratulations. If you guys could come right over here, we'll get a picture. Ms. Hyatt, you wanna join us for a picture here? 
Both superintendents need to be in the picture here. <laughs> Yep, absolutely. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to our co-acting superintendent, Ms. Hyatt. Thank you, Mr. Abner. Next, we have the honor of recognizing an outstanding school counselor from right here in Castle Rock, Ms. Ann Halcrum. Will you please join us from Mesa Middle School? And Anne and I have had the sincere pleasure of working together since 2004 when we were both at Crest Hill Middle School. And so I know of your talents as a counselor. So it's a privilege to recognize you. And Principal Tony Joukowsky unfortunately wasn't able to be here um, this evening because he is a leading a sixth grade transition night at Mesa Middle. So Anne buzzed over here from Mesa and we'll be buzzing back that way in just a minute. Earlier this month, we celebrated National School Counseling Week. As part of that, we received a letter from the Colorado School Counselor Association recognizing Ann Halcrum's involvement in the association. Ann serves as middle school vice president on their board of directors. I want to read a couple of snippets from that letter. The CSCA board is especially lucky to have Anne's warm personality and her positive attitude. She faithfully attends our quarterly meetings where she shares her good ideas and encourages growth in both the organization and in other board members. She will be transitioning to assist our region representatives in their roles so that our organization will truly represent the whole state. It's pretty incredible, Anne. Congratulations on this well-deserved recognition. Can you share why you enjoy being a part of this board and what influence you make in serving in this capacity? Sure. Well, I have enjoyed for the past four years working with the Colorado School Counselor Association Board as the vice president for middle school level. And my term for that position is up. And I was asked by the director if I could continue on on the board and being the coordinator for the region representatives, so regions throughout the state of Colorado. So I was honored that he invited me and asked me to do that. So I'll continue working, being a counselor leader and representative, not only for Douglas County, but for the state of Colorado. And it's been my honor to be working with Colorado School Counselor Association and networking with them and striving for excellence in the counseling field. Let's give Anne a round of applause. And as many of you know, it was National School Counselor Recognition Week a couple of weeks ago. And we just want to shout out to all of our school counselors in the Douglas County School District for doing such an exceptional job supporting all of our students, our families, and our staff with the essentially important work that they do each and every day. And so, Anne, congratulations and thank you to you. And to all of our school counselors in the Douglas County School District, we are uh, extremely grateful for everything that you do to support our students. So, thank you very much. Now it's time for a photo. Ready? Okay, moving on to the acceptance of the agenda. Do I have a motion to accept the agenda as, pre as presented? Motion to accept the agenda. Second. Motion by Ray, seconded by Meek. Hanson? Aye. Meek? Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Aye. Okay, on to our superintendent reports. We'll bring up uh, Ms. Amanda Thompson and Ms. Kate Kataska to talk about the compensation update.
could use my, oh, there it is, it's better. I don't have to use my principal Thank voice. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity uh, for the both of us to share with you the latest updates in terms of our compensation project, including some recent feedback from all of our sites. And um, as we prepare for school year 22-23, which is hiring season is right among us, please know it is our hope and desire for your approval of the um, information that we're gonna share with you at a future board meeting. As you know, um, all of the work that we do is grounded all throughout the work of our values um, in our district and our board end statements through the multiple resolutions that we've been working hard on since 2018 till current and also in our strategic plan themes. Um, each of our departments also have, have that goal. So in human resources, this trails down to one of our major goals as well. We're gonna spend just a moment on this particular slide. Um, it's really important that we share and communicate what our needs are now in the future, knowing that immediately it's that initial implementation of our licensed pay schedule, so there are three, for school year 22, 23 for our licensed staff. In terms of our classified admin and professional technical group, or the other basically 50%-ish of our employees, we are continuing to review and revise every single job description, every single pay range, every single person in their position within those pay ranges against our market analysis uh, neighbors and neighboring districts for proposed um, implemented scale, uh, scale adjustments and also individual adjustments accordingly. And that's also for school year 22, 23. And we'll talk about the timeline later, but know that we are committed to every single employee here and continuing to grow our pay system. So we know that in terms of the future, after from school year 22 or 23, 24 and beyond, we know that we need to continue to adjust those pay schedules to make them even better, more competitive. Um, and uh, you'll see that in our feedback here in a minute. And the, a big piece as well is we need that long-term sustainability in funding so that we can ensure that we can continue to have the system that we want to implement in place and also continue to um, grow and, and keep those schedules competitive. We know that absent that funding, and you'll hear a little bit more later into our presentation with the brilliant Kate Kataska, that with insufficient funding, there, there could be long-term impacts um, systemically, which is all a process that we would go into in the future. We typically do the timeline at the end, but it's important to know kind of where we're at in our current state as we share further. So as I shared a moment ago, we're continuing to analyze over 600 job types and make those individual recommend, recommended adjustments for school year 22-23 for our non-licensed staff. In March, which starts very soon, our hiring season launches. And what we plan to do or what we'd like to do is post our licensed salary schedule drafts pending board approval so that we may hire uh, with the intention of utilizing that and recruiting individuals under those new pay schedules. It is our hope, we said a, a, I said potential, we said potential approval. Um, we, we are flexible in working with our deputy superintendents and, and when that would be. It's our goal to send out notifications of where our individual licensed staff would fall in terms of cell placement on the schedule so that our current employees will know where they fall coming into the school year. With final approval as we do every spring with licensed contracts, license renewals and other employment actions, including individuals' um, pay in May and June with final approval of the budget in June. I shared a little bit earlier, won't spend too much time. Again, want to emphasize when we talk about our pay um, structure revision and our pay project, we are talking about all employees, including our individual um, licensed employees. We're at the place of uh, reviewing each employee group against the market analysis um, by small job types. So we begin to have small conversations on different employee groups, for example, security, um, to talk about individual adjustments and also large group adjustments. 
In terms of our license uh, salary schedule framework, we've talked about this in the past. This has been referenced multiple times. This is just a recap of how the three schedules are organized with particular lanes ranging from bachelor all the way to PhD, knowing our overall ranges range from 43,680 to almost 115,000 and so forth. Um, we've had past conversation on those who are under cell would be brought to their cell designation. Um, and those that are above cell would remain at their above cell designation with their um, annual um, yearly progression. Also, this, is, this has not changed since we last talked about it in terms of licensed categories and how we arrange our three schedules. We have gotten feedback um, from our system here and there for individuals wanting to shift their particular job category onto a different schedule. And we have added that as part of our feedback for future um, improvement. We will continue to review these on an annual basis as well in terms of candidate pools. Now the most important part, our site engagement feedback. Thank you to all of our leaders. We have some here this evening. Thank you to um, all of our district level departments as well, who all had an opportunity um, with their leadership, thank you, to engage with their staff and asking them two different questions. This first one is, what are the positives of this? Some of the major trends that we saw are wonderful in that they align with our board resolution details, such as they're transparent, it's predictable. They can look not only for where they are with their education attainment currently, they can project and do some life planning forward and set some not only professional growth goals, but they can also see where they would be um, within a particular number of years. Uh, of course, honoring continuing education, should employees want to do that. It is more competitive and we know that we wanna make it even better than that in years to come. At this point, it honors seven years of external experience so our current employees are pleased that we're utilizing that information, um, the information that they turned in, thank you to our teachers, and um, to utilize that in determining where their placement is. It's easy to understand as it looks a lot like other districts around us and people are liking that those have been under sell or will be brought to sell and to be paid um, commensurate with those with the same credentials as, as um, them. Then we opened it wide up. What else do you want us to know? Some of the major themes are, in particular points in the schedules, it still seems less than neighboring districts. We do know that based on the funding that we had allocated for this and working with a group of employees and their data that we had the blessing of, of collecting again and being back at a starting point again with having their data, that is um, our best scenario in terms of a starting place for all of our employees with the goal of continuing to enhance various parts of all three structures in future years. There's feedback regarding wanting more than seven years external experience, um, also about capping those that are above sell, knowing that in particular years they would get a one-time pay, and Kate can refer to that later. Um, so our veteran employees want to see more than that. Also feedback around longevity pay. So we do recognize longevity in terms of placement on the schedule. That was one of the pieces of feedback in the very beginning that we went through a couple of years ago at years five, 10, and so forth. This feedback pertains to longevity just being at a certain point in your career in the district, not necessarily at those particular cells. This we've heard before, and we'll just reiterate again, it is a desire to continue to find new ways to recognize for professional learning, specifically outside of university credit and for our professional development credit here in DCSD. And some individuals want to see some of those lanes stretch longer down so that there would be less people um, positioned at that very end of a particular lane. But overall, it's important to know the majority of the feedback uh, was centered around wanting confirmation that there's sustainability to continue this structure. I would love to turn it over to the brilliant Kate Kataska. Thank you, Amanda. Um, all right, so to step through um, really what the total cost of this, this plan looks like. While the numbers here are still um, holding pretty steady at about 24 million for the first year of implementation, a lot has changed in the background. Um, so we continue to update as teachers are turning in, our licensed staff are turning in any additional um, education or validating their years of service. Uh, we continue to have new hires uh, into the system as well. 
Um, we also have been continually updating um, to, to just look at where everyone is falling. Um, one more significant change that has happened um, since we last saw this uh, is we're actually modeling out to ensure that every employee gets the equivalent of a 2% increase. So there were some instances for those employees that were just slightly below sell, where we had previously just said we would you know, bring them up to sell and that could have been a couple hundred bucks, um, or in some cases, you know, tens of dollars. So really to make sure that each uh, staff member is entitled to that 2% adjustment. Now, for those that are um, sort of split between being brought to sell and needing to guarantee that 2%, Anything above their sell amount would be paid as a one-time payment so that we maintain the integrity of the schedule itself. Um, also continuing to model uh, the 2% one-time for anyone uh, over sell as well. And so here also that it's possible that it's someone would be split. So a very small increment um, could bring them to sell, but we need to make sure that they've got uh, the 1% the or sorry, 2% as a one-time payment or um, you know, they're just slightly above that cell and making sure that we're, we're honoring that as well. Uh, actually, let me go back here one more time. So uh, also still holding at about a $10 million estimate, really very, very rough estimate on the non-licensed work. As Ms. Thompson said, that's just a, a much different um, web to untangle as we figure out the nuances of each individual job title, description, uh, and market comparability um, across a variety of different positions. Oops. All right, so um, here the major changes have been to update on the revenue side. We are seeing more favorable um, uh, revenue estimates coming from the state. We still don't have um, legislation introduced that would set the long bill, uh, but things are, are looking up. Um, so we have modeled out our, our current estimates of PPR for next year. The thing though that um, is also now built into here are some longer term um, enrollment forecasts. So it's much harder to offset um, the loss of a student at $8,500, $9,000 a kid, as it is to incrementally um, increase the PPR for all students. So trying to uh, model out as, as best as we possibly can those two um, factors at play, whether it's the per pupil rate going up or the enrollment count coming down. Um, the number that we're paying really close attention to is on that bottom bar. So it's the remaining available unassigned fund balance. So our unassigned fund balance is really uh, as it reads. It's, it's that which we have not committed to a purpose. Uh, it is that which we are not re required by you know, statute as far as Tabor or our Board of Ed Reserves. It is that which we have to make um, some flexible decisions on. So you can see we're, we're Looking pretty good here in 22-23 as we, we look at about almost $57 million of fund balance. I'm absolutely okay with drawing that down. Um, what I wouldn't want to see as we get to a place uh, as that bottom line reads there, you know, close to that 15 to $20 million range, much farther below that. That's about the lowest we've gone. And I want us to be really conservative about how far we're willing to tap into, into that fund balance. Now the question that I've received um, most commonly from many of you as well as, as our staff and the community is what's plan B? Um, so we did try to model out some potential options for a plan B. This first one looks at phasing the implementation over the course of two years. So essentially what we would say here is that any um, particular licensed employee would receive no more than a 10% increase in year one. Then they would be brought fully up to their next cell for year two. So that takes us down from uh, 24 million in year one to about 14 million in year one. So what that allows us to do is kind of slow the, slow the progression of the salary schedule until some of these things become firmer in terms of um, state revenue, potential additional um, revenue sources outside of our school finance, and gives us the flexibility to continue to make um, decisions based on revenue that we know is committed and available to us. But really, it, it does catch itself up by year two. We get to the place of a cumulative compensation increase at about 31.7 million, roughly the same as, as a full implementation. So while it slows it, it doesn't necessarily you know, give us a really uh, farther extended runway um, as possible. But again, paying attention to those numbers on the bottom line there, taking fund balance down to about 32 million in 24-25, and then we're really in a sticky wicket by 25, 26, and, and I wouldn't be recommending um, that we are moving much past that. So in option C, um, would look at full implementation in year one, 
then let's say um, the, some of those alternative re revenue sources don't come to fruition. What's our stopgap at that point? If we fully in implemented, what can we do at that point? So this would look at not awarding COLA or a cost of living adjustment in the out years um, from, from here on out. So once we know the status of funding, being able to pull that lever on a cost of living adjustment and basically freezing um, that portion of the salary schedule. In this proposal, um, uh, steps would still be awarded, so employees would still see between a two, two and a half percent increase depending on where they're at. Um, but the, the cost of living adjustment that would continue to bring the entirety of the schedule up would be frozen. And then we also need to make some additional assumptions around our um, non-licensed employee groups as well. So some things that could change here, obviously um, a lot to, to a lot of unknown around revenue, right? Um, we still have a lot of work to do on the non-licensed compensation number. My hope is that that comes down a bit. But in large part, this is, this is the bogey that we're looking at. About $35 million as uh, a year one implementation cost should we choose to fully implement um, in one fell swoop. Uh, and as Ms. Thompson said, this is, is holding pretty flat. So um, the current model, again, has 2% steps, uh, except for years 5 through 10, where it's at 2.5%. We know we've got work to do uh, within the middle ranges and the end ranges of those schedules. Um, uh, absent additional funding, it would prevent us from, from being able to further um, improve and keep competitive. Um, should we fully implement in, in year one? Um, and funding doesn't come to fruition, we could be having some very hard conversations uh, in the 23-24 year so to be preparing for um, those future years. That could look like some of the budget reductions that we saw heading into um, uh, 2021, excuse me, where we would need to have a very broad sweeping community engagement process to figure out exactly where those reductions would be coming from. It could be at the expense of programs, other FTE uh, in the district, and we could, um, all of those would have to be um, on the table in order to, to be able to sustain. So I'm gonna close it out there. Um, we've got some other um, brilliant staff folks yes, behind us. So if there are other questions where the, I call her the supercomputer, Ms. Colleen Doan uh, needs to step up. We would have her do that. But at this point, we'd like to open it up to any questions. Yeah, before we do, excellent work on the plan B and C. I think that's a lot of questions that I've been receiving around this, and I didn't know the answer uh, until you gave the presentation tonight. But uh, thank you for the extensive work. Yeah. I don't have any questions. Other directors? Director Ray. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, this is so exciting. You know, we, we've traveled this journey for I don't know how many years and to finally feel like we're right there, ready to, to flip the switch um, is, is, again, many accolades to both of you and, and your departments. I know this is, this is uh, some pretty hard work to come to this point. Um, I guess I have a couple questions. So Ms. Kataska, if, if we wanted to do full implementation mm -hmm. and we wanted to give you the confidence that the additional revenue would be there, what would that additional revenue need to be? How much, how much would you need to feel comfortable that we could sustain this for the next five years? What I would say is probably in the order of magnitude of about the 25 million so that we're covering that implementation cost, we can absorb the out year um, incremental increases, but that would give us the flexibility, I think, to continue to make those refinements. So 25 million, and that sustains us, but that doesn't improve Correct. some of the other areas. Correct. So my other question then is, so we know we've got some work to do with those mid-career folks, the 10 years mm -hmm. and, and, and older. Um, did we do any modeling to see what we could do if, I mean, again, if we want to build a rationale for a potential MLO, for instance, could we come out and say 50 million MLO allows us to cure this kind of issue for these people that are mid-career? Yep, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, Director Ray. However, we did model um, several neighboring district salary schedules. Um, I believe our friends to the north were in the range of about 50 to 55 million that it would take to implement their schedule um, in earnest. Um, so we could, I mean, if there are sort of target audiences or target peers that you would want us to model out, I think that is a very, very valuable question as we mm -hmm. have conversations around what that ask might be on the ballot. Good, good. I'm sorry, I have one more question. Um, just a, a minor question on the total available unassigned fund balance. 
Um, does that include or not include the carryover from your year the principals have? So that would not include carryover from our schools. Annually, that's about $23 million. And if Colleen is giving me daggers in the back of my head, let me know. Um, 21, uh, she says. OK, 21 million <laughs> uh, from our schools. And so for our new directors, what that is is our schools have the ability to carry over or roll over funds, um, a portion of their funds that they don't spend on an annual basis. So it's their discretionary money that would carry forward uh, and remains available and within the school only. Very good. And if I may, so a couple, couple of uh, comments on, um, I think it's slide four, where, um, one of the things I think is important, because I know, I think, uh, Director, or um, Ms. Thompson, you were saying that some of the feedback, and I, I, I guess that's slide five, sorry. Uh, one more. Do you want the feedback one, Director? Off. I'm looking for the links that... Um, oh, my apologies. Yes. So I know, I think, Ms. Thompson, you said some of the feedback you got from staff is just this nervousness of, is this going to happen? And, and when can we have some security in knowing that it is happening? And, and I think what would be important on this slide is this board unanimously approved on December 14th a motion that says that we approved staff moving forward and that we wanted the, fi the salary schedules to be finalized as soon as possible. So I just want to kind of advocate for that for our staff's sake because I do think that there's some question about when, when are you going to flip the switch? Um, and then, and I think there's also a myth out there that says that we have to wait till June um, for our approval of our budget. But with the exception of the last couple of years that have been wonky years, the board always does do a formal approval of pay increases, usually in May, um, just to give staff again that assurance that you know we we mean what we say. We want to improve your compensation as soon as possible, and we also want you to stay in Douglas County. Um, so we want to give you that reassurance as soon as possible. So in terms of the timeline, I would, just, I would just encourage us to say we're ready. As soon as you want to get those salary schedules to us so that you don't have to say pending board approval, uh, I know I speak for one director to say I'm ready to approve it as soon as possible so that we give that reassurance to our staff. But I would, add, I would just add that point and then um, just, again, uh, reiterate that we do have have some times when boards do approve something um, separate from the end of June when we actually approve the budget. Great. Yeah, sure. and I'll, I'll comment on Director Ray's thing. I think this is a point that we have seen common uh, uh, values and goals and a desire among the seven of us up here. So uh, again, one director here, but I would just say as soon as you're ready, I know there's still some, some tweaking going on and I know we're about to hear about benefits and things, but as soon as you think it's ready to go and the staff thinks it's ready to go and you've got a broad consensus, I would have no problem from an agenda planning aspect to bring it up forward as long as we can legally do so. And I'm, I'm seeing head shake up and down the dais. Um, right, so as soon as it's ready, please let us know and we will move it forward to give that certainty to staff, um, all our staff and employees so they, they don't have to fear about will this happen. Um, and we can give them some certainty. Thank you. Any other directors? Director Meek. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a great presentation. I'm wondering, have you had a chance to get feedback from employees on option B and option C? Um, we are taking this to employee council. Uh, is it Monday? Yes. Amanda? So that will go through employee council. Um, it has not been, it was not directly asked in the survey that went out. Um, so to be frank, that was our sort of internal option planning. Um, so I don't know if, if you've got any other feedback avenues that have been out there, but um, largely internal um, forecasting yes. on those on those different options. Yes, agreed. I would assume there would be some angst mm -hmm. around what um, option option B would would bring yes. up. Well, I'm sure option A is preferred. Yeah. Um, and it would be great just to hear from the employees. You know, they're thinking they may have option D that might be an amazing option, so thank you. I'm sorry, uh, Acting Superintendent Hyatt. So we appreciate so much the board's support in regards to this compensation work in our plan um, was to bring forth an action item at the March 22nd board meeting, but if you are asking that to happen sooner through agenda planning, we will absolutely take that feedback. 
Okay, if we're ready to move to the next item, the benefits update. Thank you so much. Sorry I'm up here so much this evening, but thank you uh, for the opportunity, as we do annually, to share about um, our benefits update. So typically in spring, we bring forward what our benefit premium information is. And um, along with this, I'm pleased to share and introduce Leo Tokar, one of our locked-in partners, and also Jay Calderon. I know they have a big team underneath them that support us and meet frequently with us. They've been our partners for over a decade, I believe. Right on a decade. And also a special thanks to Scott Barnes and other members of Team HR and Team Finance, who we all work very closely together um, in all things comp and benefits, actually. So with that, um, what we want to share with you this evening is just, again, where this work comes from, some historical information on what we've provided in terms of benefits over the last several years, some planning, and that also includes our employee feedback process, some options for school year 22-23, which are a little bit more detailed than, uh, than typical, and at that point, we also, as mentioned in uh, the last presentation, we would want to work with you, and it is our hope and desire to have you approve in terms of uh, the benefit premium information so that we may start communicating with our employees um, in, after a future board meeting, um, a review and approval of that, and also prepare for our open enrollment season. And then also that, that locked-in recommendation information. So in terms of grounding our work, again, we are grounded in all of the purpose, values, and beliefs of our district, which include our board end statements, on um, including our quality educators and staff, recruit and retaining them as well, and giving our staff multiple opportunities to be heard and give feedback. We do have our board um, benefit values resolution from 2018. And that is about um, ensuring that we have a comprehensive benefit structure and allow our employees um, opportunity for feedback. And then also it relates to our strategic plan themes. So I will open this up and then turn it over to our locked in team. And uh, what I want to say um, overall is that it has been um, a historical value and um, something we've been able to provide for our employees in terms of benefit is employee choice in benefit plan offerings. And we'll go into more detail, um, but however, we currently have a choice for our employees between a couple of Kaiser benefit plans for medical and also Cigna Allegiance. Uh, and so we are thrilled that we have been able to provide choice for over a decade, and what you'll see this evening is an opportunity for continued and enhanced choice options. I'll turn it over to the Lockton team. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity today, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to serve the district for the last 10 years. Um, give you some historical perspective. Um, uh, cost savings, um, uh, really at the end of the day, we've budgeted $54 million for your health and welfare uh, program. So this is the Allegiance and Kaiser combined. This is total dollars. The split of that right now sits at about 74% district funded and about 26% employees. Um, this split or this cost perspective from an employee side of the equation has only changed once in the last eight years. And I can tell you 25 years, 25 plus years in the business, there aren't many employers that get to say we've only increased employee contributions once in eight years. Um, in addition to that, uh, when we did increase it, we only increased it once. Uh, and that was in school year 1920. 2.5% increase to Kaiser, 7% increase to the folks on Allegiance. In addition to that, what the employees pay out of pocket when they actually use services is the other critical component. And in that same year, eight, eight year period, we've only tweaked benefits, what I would call incrementally. In school year 16, 17, we increased coinsurance on a couple of the plans for members from 10% to 20, did not change the out of pocket maximum. And then in 17 and 18, we did increase some co pays. Uh, and we did add a deductible to the Kaiser plan. But again, these are the traditional levers that employers have to flip to help manage cost. Okay, and just this goes next. Mm -hmm. So how are we gonna manage the ever increasing healthcare costs? Uh, this is your current run rate in 2021, about $50 million um, is where you're running. And the blue line is if you continue to trend at about 8% per year. 
And in 2025, you'll be fast approaching $70 million. Um, and if we don't do something, um, or if we can do some things and, ma and manage the plan, hopefully we can manage that to a more reasonable number in and around 3%. So we as a group uh, met in the fall of 2020 to discuss what that might look like. What can we do um, uh, to manage costs? So, um, because the reality of this, and I'm not going to read all these words because there's a lot on there. Uh, in reality, $70 million is going to erode what Amanda is trying to accomplish from a compensation standpoint. So what will we do? Um, we'll eventually have to pass on increases either in monthly contributions or plan design. Um, so we uh, partnered with the district. We did a, an RFP in uh, 2021 for 2022. And we did not act on that RFP. We went to the market to find out what's available to the district, looked at other carriers, other networks, other uh, information. And unfortunately, or we stopped short of making a change last year. And the, there were some reasons why. Um, probably the most important is one of our parameters for change was we wanted to solicit employee feedback before we made a change. And I'll talk about that here in a second. The other items up there that are listed is when we consider a change, we have to continue uh, we need to continue to provide choice to the employees. We need to um, be minimally disruptive. And when we say that, really disrupting the, the patient and doctor relationship. Um, and it also has to be, it can't be just a short-term money grab. It's got to be both a short-term solution as well as long-term. And then again, be aligned with uh, the board uh, resolutions. So um, let me talk about the survey that we, uh, we released in November of 2021. 46% um, of the employees responded to the survey. That was almost 3,000 employees. Pretty good from a, a survey perspective. Of those responding, 61% were licensed employees. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole survey, but a, a very good mark is 56% of your employees said they ranked your benefit satisfaction one and two, okay? Um, one being the best. And 87% were three or higher. And I can tell you, uh, we don't work at Nordstrom's. We work in insurance. So we don't have net promoter scores of 90% like we do at Nordstrom's. But I can tell you, this is a very good indicator from your employees. The other piece that we asked them about was, what would you be willing to trade off? If we could provide you alternative, pardon me, alternative solutions, what would you be willing to give up? And one of the things that we asked them is, is would you be willing to accept a narrower network or a smaller provider network? in exchange for better benefits and lower premiums. And 39% indicated that they would be interested in that. Okay. So with that, um, let me talk about future state. So what we, uh, every year we sit down with Amanda and the team and we project your renewals. Uh, the Kaiser renewal is the Kaiser renewal because it's insured. However, your self-funded plan, we set budget, we help you set budget projections. And based on that is, if we, uh, if we don't make any changes, we stay, stay pat with Allegiance, we don't make any plan design changes, um, we're looking at about a 3.1, almost $3.2 million increase to your budget. Okay? Um, and then uh, while you may be able to absorb that in its current year, how does that look? Again, back to that blue line on my, on my fancy chart. Okay? So what I really want to talk about is option two. So when we went to market, um, we surveyed all the major insurance companies um, out there. And um, what we're proposing is, is, first of all, no changes to the Kaiser programs. Okay, the Kaiser plans would remain the same at the same contributions. So all we're talking about really is a change from Cigna Allegiance to United Healthcare. Um, with United Healthcare, um, we would also offer a third option, and I'll talk about that third option here in a second. Um, for those of, uh, again, keeping in the theme with being minimally disruptive, we would recreate the exact same two plans that you have today, the PPO and the high deductible health plan, but you would use the United Healthcare network. And there's about a 98% overlap between the Cigna and the United Healthcare networks. We actually got claims data and did a match with United Healthcare. But really what I want to talk about is the Colorado doctor's plan. This would be a third option that we would offer employees. This is a narrower network or a smaller network, less physicians, less hospitals. Um, but in return for that, we can achieve 15 to 20% in additional provider discounts, so a, a win. Um, 
When we talk about narrowing the network, the network would include all the Centura facilities, all of the Health One HCA facilities, as well as Children's Hospital. Um, but what this would really allow is, is employees to make a choice. They could keep what they have, or they could take a look at this new option. And we could offer it to them at a lower premium and at a lower cost sharing when they actually use uh, services. Okay, Couple things uh, also to point out, if you fall outside of the narrow network, the benefits are still payable at the same levels, even if you go to a non-narrow network provider. So if you have a kid away at school, uh, something along those lines, okay? All right, some additional value adds of the United Healthcare proposal. In addition to this, United has partnered with Centura, the major hospital system, and they have agreed to two strategic planning sessions per year with the CEOs of these hospitals. And the intent of these meetings would be to address cost management strategies. Let's look at the data. What's driving costs? What solutions could we put to bear to help better um, uh, manage our cost? Also address member experience. How are people going through, pardon me, going through the system? Sorry, talk with my hands. Uh, as well as what they've also indicated is, is that they'd be willing to expand this kind of partnership beyond just the employees of the, count, of the school district, but really to the community at large. Okay. In addition, for those who elect the Colorado Doctors Plan, Centura would actually provide a nurse care coordinator that employees would have access to to help them navigate through the healthcare system. It can be a very confusing and complex system, and having a clinical advocate on the inside that doesn't work for the insurance company; they work for the they're on the clinical side. Real quick, yeah, that could include that could include. Um, post-operational um, procedure, post-urgent care, follow-up instructions, supporting with appointments. Um, it could include individuals of which um, once their, um, their health information is reviewed by this nurse care coordinator, if he or she sees that there is uh, that, per that patient is headed into a particular health condition, they can alert and help get that patient some care, um, among other things too. Absolutely. And that's an evolution of what this role would be, uh, but super excited about the opportunity to provide that service to, to district employees. In addition, uh, United Healthcare is willing to offer a $600,000 implementation credit to help defray the cost of change, communications, IT, programming, those types of things. Uh, and in addition, um, they are putting a trend guarantee out. So as I showed you, hey, well, well we think United Healthcare, our costs will be here. Well, they're actually putting some money where their mouth is and they're willing to um, put about $300,000 at risk. Okay. So let me talk about the plan design real quick. Um, does this have a pointer? Oh, it does. So this is your current PPO plan. Uh, it does say allegiance, but we would replicate this plan under the United Healthcare uh, program. So it'd be the exact same deductibles, out of pocket maximums, co pays, everything. The only difference is, is now you'd be going through United Healthcare as opposed to allegiance Cigna. Um, we would do the same thing on the high deductible health plan, which is the $3,000 deductible plan. And then we'd be adding this third option as a choice. And what it is, it's a $1,000 individual deductible, $2,000 family deductible, five and $10,000 out of pocket. But the value of this program are the things that are highlighted in green. 100% coverage for all of your primary care visits. That's for you and for all of your family members. No deductible, no copay. 100% uh, coverage for outpatient mental health services, okay, for you and your family members. Preventive care covered at 100%. In addition to 100% coverage for urgent care. So we're going to, in uh, this plan design, really incense employees to actually engage in the system and take care of their health, okay? Uh, and then there are some traditional uh, prescription drug copays. And then hospitalizations would be deductible coinsurance similar to your other programs. But the real value is, is, the, is the stressor on primary care and mental health services. Okay? And, and as I think about this potential option for our, our employees, we often hear that some of our hourly employees and others often work for benefits for their family. And so this could provide another option, full choice or not for our employees to consider that could be more affordable. Okay, so as I indicated, this would be a, a richer plan design, meaning less cost sharing for the members, but then what would employees have to pay to participate? So what we've put together here um, is, 
Currently, this is what employees pay per month for the PPO program. And as I indicated, we're proposing no change for the, for the coming year. Same thing with the high deductible health plan, current premiums, and what they would pay into the coming year. That also includes the HSA seed money that the district does provide. What we're proposing is this Colorado doctor's plan is we could offer this as low as $31.12 for the employee only. I won't read all of these numbers, but down to $388 for a family. Okay, so I did the math for you. Um, and that includes keeping also current Kaiser rates. So yes. we still will offer all of the Kaiser plans as well. Okay, so what I did here is, is this is the current enrollment in the programs. You have 805 employee only, 53 covering spouses, 90 with children and 135 family. And then the similar data down below. Well, what I did was, is I just did the math. If I was on the PPO and I moved to this doctor's plan, on an annual basis, I could save $500, okay? So I could save $500 in premium and have a better plan design. In exchange, I have to use the narrower network, okay? Well, you can see the numbers get quite significant when you start looking at families. So an employee could move from PPO to the Colorado doctor's plan and save themselves, actually give themselves a $7,000 raise and get a better plan, okay? And then again, you can see the math here. It's not as severe. Um, but the one thing that I will tell you is if you're a family covering yourself under um, that, um, I'm going to go back two slides, you have a $6,000 family deductible, okay? So I can save you dollars um, if you move to the doctor's plan um, and give you a better program, okay? So I call that kind of a double win. So um, our recommendation, uh, again, we've been working with you guys for 10 years, um, uh, it is our recommendation that you do replace the Allegiant plans with the proposed United Healthcare programs, the three options. Um, we maintain employee contributions for the PPO and the HDHP, as I described. No plan changes. Again, no changes to the Kaiser programs. Uh, and then we offer this new plan uh, to your employees. And did some math. Now, we can't predict 100 or with accuracy how many people will take this plan, but if we move, uh, if, if about 20% of the current Allegiance people move to this plan, we can mitigate that $1.2 million uh, uh, down to about 1.86% increase, um, which is a million three in savings. And again, the $600,000 credit hasn't been accounted for in those numbers. And again, no changes to the Kaiser program. Okay. okay. So, yep. You want to? So, so, again, this is just a recap. And a quick summary page. So again, this, this shares the medical, so maintains employee choice and uh, multiple carriers and adds a third carrier. And really the shift for the, the majority of this change would be a new card, a new place to log in, and there would be support in terms of transferring over uh, the, the transition of care that we can, we can talk about in the future. Um, dental and vision, there would be no changes to those plan designs either. And we are pleased to be able to continue to enhance benefit offerings for our employees. And this partnership with the Centura Hospital System, and I believe the access to the care coordinator is unique to Douglas County. Uh, there is another district that may move toward the Colorado Doctors Plan who may be located near our district. <laughs> However, there are certain things unique to uh, this Douglas County School District partnership, um, and part of it is a lot of these locations are with uh, Douglas, the Douglas County itself, hospital and medical networks. And um, always, we want to make sure that as long as we can, we are keeping our benefits affordable, and what a great opportunity to offer Again, no premium increases to employees for the eighth or ninth year, um, knowing that that is extremely rare um, in any organization. Anything else you want to add? I, the only other piece I would uh, is the complete uniqueness of the relationship uh, uh, with Centura as well as the care coordinator. This is not something that is regularly offered to employers, and I think it shows the support of the hospital system, but it also shows the support of United Healthcare trying to figure out a way to contain cost uh, long term. And I, I would um, accent that to say a partnership between Douglas County School District and Douglas County. So again, timeline for the remainder of the year, it's at the end this time. So we are going to share this, actually, we can uh, share this uh, next week with our employee council, 
And again, it is our best hope and desire to have board approval of this information um, on the Sooner side so we can prepare for open enrollment. We do have a communication strategy. We are pleased if this change were to occur that we would be able to work with Lockton and the United Healthcare System to roll out communication, to roll out um, lots of um, uh, webinars and individual sessions. Any other information you want to share about what that could look like? It, it's um, quite I, comprehensive than what we have done in the past. We are standing at the way, ready to go and to communicate uh, kind of in all channels, right? Because we know health insurance is very personal. And if you make a change in that, we got to make sure that employees understand what the opportunity is to maintain what they have, but also educate them as to what might be an option for them to take it to really at the end of the day to give themselves a raise. And then as you know, um, our benefits open enrollment season is coming during the month of May, which takes the preparedness month for us April, if not sooner. So with that, we would love to take any questions that you have for any of the three of us. I know Director Ray has something, um, but before he does, uh, I just stepping back from this, no increases for that long time, incredible achievement, uh, especially in the, the environment that we have. So I, I take it, this is a pay raise by not chipping away here, have a pay raise, but then we're gonna take it all back and increase benefit premiums. So that I thought those two briefs are very complimentary uh, and more choice is never the wrong answer. So you're maintaining what we have, you're offering a third option, uh, very impressed with the ability to maintain what we have and then add additional options. So thank you to Locked In Group and, and to uh, Ms. Thompson and the HR staff. Uh, my only question, and I, I'm sure you're gonna come back with it soon, is gonna be around what do the teachers think? What do the rest of our staff think? You know, what do all the employees think about this? And uh, again, with the previous uh, proposal, I think as soon as we have that feedback and as soon as you're moving towards certainty, please bring it to the board. Mm -hmm. Director Ray. Say so we, uh, a few oh, things. Yeah. Um, one refers to, you know, as we look at how we offer benefits and, and other districts do as well, um, I know that there's confusion in terms of some districts offer a particular amount of benefit dollars, but then pass their premium increases on to employees. We don't offer those particular benefit dollars towards, say, for example, medical um, selection of benefits. But we, again, through this commitment, we have um, not passed on premium increases to employees. So very rare, and, and it's something that we are very proud of. Um, when it comes to employee feedback on these two options, um, we are prepared, much like we did with our um, voice over presentation on compensation. We're prepared to work with our deputy superintendents um, to implement a similar process quickly so that we can gather that information um, for our employees. Great. I would, I would echo uh, Director Peterson's remarks about how wonderful it is that we've been able to not have uh, premiums passed on to employees. But I'm wondering, what are we doing right? Um, is it just because we have locked in and you guys are the gods of, of finding us these good deals? Or what are we doing right as an organization to keep those, those costs down? Mm -hmm. Is there something else that we're doing besides you just finding us the right plans? <laughs> Please. <laughs> we, we could have a separate study session on um, all that drivers of healthcare and um, ways to mitigate it. So there are a number of pieces that come into play, but really it's a dissecting the individual pieces. I'll give you one example and I won't belabor it. But because you're self-funded, you assume the risk. You're effectively the insurance company. And so the question becomes, how do you dig deep enough into the different components to identify what's driving your cost spend and just take more concerted action than, than the RFP level? And so when we did that for the pharmacy program and found millions of dollars that basically compound year over year over year. When you find opportunities like that, you could repeat it, but you need to find them in specific areas of spend because healthcare is not one thing. It's a continuum of tens of thousands of services. And so it's really going through those types of programs and making sure we have a balanced population between Kaiser and Cigna that actually torpedoes a lot of plans. So Jefferson County School District tried to coexist, but there are certain things that they didn't have the ability within their structure to do. Their plan fell apart. They were just after years 
now able to reintroduce choice. And so how we balance membership between the two plans through the rates, through the underlying risk, has been another big component. Is, is that sufficient to respond to? Sure. I mean, I, I think there's a, a selfish hope that I would hear you talk about um, wellness, mm -hmm. that when we have a strong um, preventative wellness program that parallels to this that we see our uh, staff's needs are not as great in terms of the claims that they filed for help, but you don't see a correlation between a, you know, a preventative wellness program that parallels with this? I'll, I'll answer it in a few ways. Um, wellness has been culturally accretive. It has also helped with how we see people manage early, on, or early conditions. It is extremely difficult to tie a correlation between wellness and the big stuff because the things that really move your claims are the high dollar things and there's a lot that happens in between. And so what we've been sensitive to is dictating what people should do as part of a wellness program saying you must do these things to get, for example, lower premiums. We've stayed away from that, but without doing those kinds of things where we can measure specific correlation, it's hard to say what you gotcha. just put out. Fair enough. But from my heart and belief in the amazing yes. employees of our district and our wellness work, um, thank you to not only um, members of the student side of wellness, but also the staff side. So Holly Hirone and all of the wellness champions that we have, unique to Douglas County, who help share this information forward, who provide monthly calendars and opportunities for um, staff wellness, who provide, there's work at opportunities, family cooking sessions, um, dietary, financial um, counseling, fun, sessions of fun for each, uh, we all have to have fun here in, in the amazing and hard work that we all do in our schools. And so there is a, a mindfulness of how we approach wellness uh, always looking to enhance and listen to our schools through each of our wellness champions inside of, of each of our buildings. Um, that paired with, I, I will say, since I have been here, um, I have noticed an increase in use of our EAP, our Employee Assistance Program. Not that there are more issues or anything, but that says good things about our employees can reach out and get support, whether that is on, um, there's adult, Adult child, adult care, child care, financial support, wellness support through the EAP counseling. So um, we will continue to, and our survey said that, you know, there's some opportunity for us to continue to enhance educational um, resources and sharing of information. But I, I mean, I, I just, and, and this, some of these things were in place well before I was here. So I, I commend the district and I, I am proud of a district who um, inspires and focuses on wellness and then over time has placed employee premium increase at the heart of um, one of the important things as we think of employee compensation and total compensation and a special plug to our finance team. They are brilliant people who really try to keep a mind of what's most important in terms of funding. Do you know, uh, Ms. Thompson, off the top of your head, what percentage of our employees are signal allegiance uh, or enrolled in that? I knew that question was coming. Uh -huh. Bear with me a moment. So currently there are about 2,600 employees who elect the Cigna allegiance programs and 2,137 employees elect Kaiser. So close to that 50-50 split. And so if there is a transition to U, um, UHC, did I say that right? Yes. Or, okay. Um, how, how is that transition? Is, is it pretty seamless? I mean, I, I know you said other than maybe 2% of the doctors that um, are teachers that have um, Cigna may not have in this new health plan. But other than that, is the transition pretty seamless when they open enroll? Is it pretty, I mean, as far as? Yeah, um, again, it'd be traditional open enrollment an employee would have uh, the choice of five plans versus four. Um, again, they make to make a decision who they're gonna cover under the program, whether it's just themselves and including mm -hmm. family members. The change will be um, uh, you're gonna get a new ID card. There is gonna be a new website, um, new mobile tools, a uh, mobile app that will be deployed. So if you're a Signal Allegiance member, there could be a change uh, from that perspective. But I can tell you that there are organizations that change carriers every year. Um, you guys have been lucky. You've had a lot of stability 
Um, but again, we, we think that the opportunity that's being presented is, is worth, worth the change. So that 2% of doctors that are not on, that are overlapped, do we see the other plans possibly covering those doctors that are not on no, the list? No, so what we did was we looked at claims data for your Signal Allegiance folks and we gave it to United Healthcare and said, tell us how many are in your network. Um, and that came back at 98%. Okay. I can tell you the 2% fallout of that, some of it was out of state emergency rooms, uh, right? We're, we're looking at it, the, the smallest of the small. I will tell you that disruption would be minimal. Um, the other part of the, the communication and the transition plan is if people are in, have certain conditions, um, and I will say if you're pregnant and you're in your third trimester and your OB is not in the new network, we would work with that, as, that employee to say, go ahead and deliver the baby, you know, uh, and we would cover that at network levels. Eventually, you would have to. <laughs> nice of you to allow them to deliver yeah. the baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Have the baby with. The, anyway, but the similar similar situation if someone's going through a cancer regimen, something along those lines. Uh, so transition of care would be a key component of the communication. And we would work with United Healthcare and our partners at Locked In on every single resource available, and we're happy to bring back what that communication plan would look like, along with that employee feedback. Uh, at our at a next opportunity so that everyone is clear of the multitude of resources that would be available under um, United Healthcare Partners. Other directors? All right, thank you very much. And then we'll thank move you. to Mr. Matt Reynolds to provide us with a COVID update. Thank you. Good evening, directors. Uh, while we wait for the technology uh, to come up, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you some information regarding COVID. Uh, we do have some updates that are in, trending in the positive direction, um, which I want to share with you. Um, the first is our substitute rates. If you'll recall, several weeks ago when I was here, uh, we had sub rates in, in a few of those weeks where it was in the mid to upper 70s percent um, in the latest data poll that we did in this last week. We're in our usual stance of mid to upper 90s. Uh, we do have a relatively healthy sub pool in Douglas County. We always have. Um, our community has always stepped in and really assisted us in that. Uh, so really happy to report that number. Um, the absences due to COVID, uh, again, this is a self-reported um, statistic. We're sitting at 4%. Several weeks ago, that number was way up to 38%. Um, so I just want you to keep those in mind as I start showing you some of the future data. Um, next is the severity data. This is uh, identified in the board resolution um, in December uh, where we have deaths and hospitalization. Um, the deaths are fairly stable at the moment. Um, the one thing that is does change uh, over here is this uh, marker for um, cases, hospitalization by group. That does fluctuate. Um, that's a data point that's an entire month. So as you enter the month, you'll see a lot of variations with that data, but as you end, you get more st stability. Uh, because you end up with a larger data set because you have more days in the month. Um, this is, correlates to our previous data regarding subs. Um, this is the overall incident rate. You'll see that there was a, a peak um, at the beginning of January, which corresponds to one of the last times that I shared data with you that showed uh, the absences rates from our staff was coinciding with the increased number of cases. Um, this gray area here is uh, data that's still not complete yet. It's still in that gray area. So hopefully, if it continues in that same trend, we'll continue that downward trajectory. Um, another big update that it came uh, was in February 11th, as CDPHE released its new guidance. Um, this seems to be a recurring theme every time I share data with you that there's new guidance out. Um, but this is new guidance for strategies for K-12 schools. And really the position shift is from individual case investigations um, and that response down to a more disease controlled model. Uh, the idea here is uh, moving away from that targeted contact tracing and moving to uh, a standard disease response. Uh, this is relatively new information. 
Uh, the rut routine di disease control strategies are those things that we've typically talked about. Uh, those safety mitigation strategies that you want to implement to reduce uh, the spread of COVID. Um, so I'm not going to read the entire slide to you, but I left it in there as a point of reference. Um, the other thing that's probably the most important is not what it is, but what it's not. Um, the major changes here. Uh, the biggest thing is individual case investigations. Uh, we've talked about that for the last oh, two years as a big thing with our nursing staff of having to do contact tracing and do list lines where they have positive uh, cases. Under this new uh, state, uh, you wouldn't have to do that um, anymore. The other part is the quarantining uh, with staff associated with school exposures. Again, this is something we'd have to connect with our, our partners over our health department to discuss what the impact this would be, along with everything else here. Um, but that would give us another tool in our toolbox in, in terms of how we respond. Um, something that we think is, uh, could be potentially a very positive thing. Um, outbreaks would still be responded in a similar fashion. But again, this information, uh, we'd have to continue to work with our partners um, at our health department in Jogan to determine how best to implement these strategies. Again, this is guidance from the state. We always want to partner with our local health department to see what's the best way for us to continue to partner together and implement these new strategies. Um, the targeted implementation date um, is February 28th. Um, I am envisioning that we'll continue our conversations well beyond that with our health department to see what the impact of these new changes would have on us as a system. Um, the other thing that I do want to say, I, I say it quite a bit when I'm up here, is just thank you. Um, you know, we, we had a really tough January um, in terms of the impact. Um, you know, we had a lot of people that were sick um, and a lot of people that were impacted by those that were sick. So we had a lot of staff step up and, and really step in, whether that's coverage for each other or having people from other schools and other departments and leadership step in roles to keep our schools functioning um, at a safe level. And so I just wanted to say thank you again uh, for all of that work and just a continued appreciation for uh, what people have been doing just to keep our schools functioning. So uh, with that, I would stop and answer any questions that you may have. Okay, no questions. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. And with unanimous consent, a 10 minute break, if we are agreed. Okay, we'll call it uh, 12 minutes after, we'll come back at 22 after, and then we will start with student comment. Thank you.
Noah Cassay, followed by Tyler Waxman, followed by Cole Bradley. Noah, are you here? Good evening, directors. <clears throat> On the Douglas County School District website, it says that the Student Advisory Group, SAG, provides an opportunity for the board and district personnel to have a focus group of high school students who, who express what they think is important regarding their education. At the board meeting on February 4th, Director Ray read a letter that, that was signed by the SAG saying that they represent all 64,000 students. Based on the mission statement, it is only about high schoolers. So for the SAG to claim that they represent all 64,000 students is way off the mark. I've heard many board meetings where the SAG gave different presentations, and I don't agree with everything they say, and I don't think they have a full understanding of where every student in DCSD stands. Recently, I reached out to get more information about the SAG. I was told that there are approximately 70 members in the SAG, but I wasn't able to get an answer if any members attended charter schools and if every high school has at least one representative. In my time as a student in DCSD, I have never received an email, text, survey, meeting, or hangout from the SAG. I'd like to better understand what the SAG does and how they're trying to accomplish their goals. As a middle schooler, I, like my peers, have a voice and I don't feel like the SAG represents all of our opinions. It appears that the SAG is using their position to influence the board and other students to a single point of view. I think we need to make changes to the SAG and where I would start first is to expand it to have both middle school and elementary school student voices heard. To really represent the students of Douglas County, we need to hear from as many students as possible. I'm not sure how the SAG collects their information or conducts their business, but a significant population is completely left out and it's inaccurate for them to claim that they speak for all of us. I would like to request that the board consider examining the SAG about how they operate, how they collect data, what initiatives they are working on, and how many and how they interact with the student body in order to determine how many students they actually interact with. In conclusion, I think the board should look into expanding SAG to any interest in middle school students, and I think there should be some type of outreach program for elementary school students to be able to share their voice to the SAG. Until the SAG has representation in every school, we won't know the full extent of the diverse opinions and needs of every uh, DCSD student. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cusay. Next will be Tyler Waxman, Cole Bradley, filed by Owen Wicks. Tyler Waxman. Hello, DCSD Bold. My name is Tyler Waxman, and I am the fifth grade student council representative at Snow Mountain Elementary. I would like to give some suggestions about choices that you have made. First, I feel like you should slow down when you are making decisions about the superintendent position because your decisions affect the students, teachers, and our families. Before you vote on the superintendent, please hear from the students, staff, and parents' suggestions. I would like the board to think about what our teachers, students, and parents want instead of just thinking about what the board wants. Additionally, I think you need to spend more time thinking about issues in the public schools. I would like you all to visit schools like Stone Mountain Elementary to talk to students and staff. That way you can see what good things are happening in our schools and what we need uh, to help. I feel sad that there are teachers that are leaving to go to other districts because of the board's choices. I also know the board is not getting along, so I recommend that you engage in a bonding event so you can get along better. Instead of arguing, I would like to see you all listen to each other and be respectful, like I was taught to do in school. The board needs to spend more time thinking about their decisions before you all act. You fired a superintendent, and I don't know the reason because it was never explained. I would like... I would have liked to see you have listened to the superintendent wise and let him lead the school district. I liked him because he worked in our district for two decades and helped us through the toughest time in Douglas County because of COVID. He also wanted students to have the best possible education. When you fired superintendent wise, people started to not trust you. I think you need to listen to our teachers, principals, and students. In the future, I think you should listen to everybody before you make your decision about the new superintendent. Thank you for listening to my ideas. I would love to see you grow as a board uh, for DCSD. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Cole Bradley, followed by Owen Wicks, followed by Vita Chansey. Cole Bradley. She's so awesome. 
Hello, directors. I was recently researching school board issues surrounding superintendents in general. I found a question and answer in an interview with a candidate that I wanted to share with you. The question was, what is the most important role of a member in, of the school board? It's a long answer, but I really liked it. This is the candidate's answer. Our most important role is holding the superintendent accountable for effective leadership that ensures all students are making adequate growth to be successful upon graduation. Uh, the, this accountability involves representing the values of the surrounding community, implementing practices that reflect the expertise of educator, educators, and continually graduate, gathering satisfaction feedback from the community. The research is conclusive that an involved community who supports the educational system correlates to increased student achievement. Confusion, distrust, and division mar the current, re current relationship. For three years, the community has not been surveyed to collect feedback. Allowance for public comment at school board meetings has re been reduced to a fraction of the time it once was. Collaborative conversations with our community have replaced with divisiveness and defensiveness as opposed to seeking to understand their concerns. My actions, conduct a co community survey, increase time for public comment at board meetings, and respond to differing views with respect. The, that answer was given by our own David Ray in October 2015. What happened to that David Ray? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Next will be Owen Wicks, Vita Chansey, and then we will move to Ruben Chansey. Owen Wicks. Before I start today, I'd like to address some mudslinging that's been done online about my family. I am here of my own volition, and I write every single word I speak before you. To those cowards online who claim that my mother is using me for political gain, Come and talk to me before you decide to use me as your own political pawn. Now, to the subject of, of my, uh, my speech. Back when I was in sixth grade, quite a few years ago, I was attacked by another student at a school meet and greet in front of my parents, their parents, and the principal. Surprisingly, that student wasn't even suspended, as far as we're aware. We weren't told what disciplinary action was done against them. And, of course, my family was not too happy with that situation, so we reached out to the then school board, which led my mom to being in contact with then Superintendent Corey Wise. And over the course of that conversation, he had the gall to ask my mom if her pushing for this kid to be punished had anything to do with his race. He also happened to be black, but that had never once crossed the topic of conversation. That kid had attacked me to the point where I had a limp for three weeks, and he decides to inject race into that situation in which it had never been presented before. This is why I wholeheartedly support the board's decision to fire Corey Wise, because he was someone who injected race into a situation that had nothing to do with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wicks. Our last student will be Vita Chansey. Vita, are you here? So Vita is online, sir? Okay, we'll have Vita online. We're asking to unmute right now. My name is Vita Chansey. I'm 10 years old in fifth grade. The board majority have been making terrible decisions about our education. Even the fifth graders could make better decisions. It seems like the board members have lost focus about who their decisions are benefiting. The board majority hired their own lawyer at $400 per hour, even though our district already has a lawyer. That doesn't make any sense. This money is being wasted when it could be going to our classrooms. I have listened to the comments from other meetings. I hear students and parents and community members asking for the four board members to make decisions that would benefit kids. But they do the exact opposite. Why doesn't the board member majority want to benefit kids? Teachers had a sick out because they were so mad about what the school board was doing. The teachers wanted to take action. I thought it would make a big difference that the four in the four school board members would start to listen to what the teachers were saying but it seems like it did the opposite. 
It seems like the school board members should listen to our teachers since the teachers are the ones who are educating us. Why are the teachers being bad guys to them? I love my teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chansey. We will now have Ruben Chansey followed by Stephanie Chansey followed by Amity Wicks. Mr. Chansey. Hi, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Oh, hi, I'm actually gonna read this on behalf of my husband because he's not home from work yet. <laughs> Um, directors Myers, Weiniger, Williams, and Peterson, I am asking for your resignation. In less than three months, this board majority has been responsible for several pi pri uh, pricey lawsuits. In fact, this Friday, they will be in court defending their violations of Sunshine Laws. Whether or not they are held accountable by the courts with the recordings garnered from the telephone conversations with minority board members, it is crystal clear that their intent was to go behind the backs of other board members and make unilateral decisions. This is not the transparency you all promised during your campaigns. Last Friday, an extensive CORA request was made by Corey Wise's attorneys. This evidence will surely reveal your intent in implementing your political agenda. You all may say you gave Corey a chance and you did not plan to fire him without cause, but again, your actions and the evidence will show your true intentions. Poor governance, preparation, and reckless disregard for the DCSD community will undoubtedly bring you many additional lawsuits, costing this district time and resources we cannot for afford to give. It does create an interesting question, though. If it was your personal money defending your actions, would you be so inclined to disregard ethics and policy? Given your anti-public school stance that has been made clear by your decisions, is exposing the district to all these lawsuits an effort to bankrupt our district piece by piece to prove that public education needs reforming, again, creating a problem you heroically swoop in to fix, please resign before you cost our district more money. Resigning will spare this district and community the cost of a potential recall. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Chansey. On behalf of Mr. Chansey, we now have Stephanie Chansey followed by Jason Cassay. In the February 16th meeting, Director Meek stated to Director Peterson, I think it is highly unethical that you reached out to Aaron Kane. Mike Peterson responded, please refrain from calling people unethical or immoral. Let that sink in. I can fill a page with Mike Peterson's unethical and immoral actions in the two months that he has been on the school board. When Peterson and Williams had their secret meeting with Corey Wise to give him an ultimatum, to resign or be, to be fired, Peterson looked at directors Meek, Ray, and Hansen and told them that they were all to blame for creating the distrust on the board. To directors Meek, Ray, and Hansen, thank you for being an unwavering leaders to Peterson's narcissistic words and actions. Thank you for explaining the laws that he must follow and for demonstrating ethical and moral practices. Peterson and his puppets intentionally create chaos, then insist on rushing through their extremist agenda, claiming that there is too much instability and divisiveness that they must fix it with hiring a superintendent immediately. Their plan is clear. They will hire Aaron Kane, despite the pushback from the community. They will create a deeper divide and a larger debt. Their actions will continue to dismantle the public education system in Douglas County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chansey. We will now have Jason Kitsay, Brandy Bradley, and, and please, no noisemakers there, just because we can't hear. Uh, we have Jason Kitsay, Brandy Bradley, followed by Adam Hillard. Mr. Cassay. I'm sorry, thank you, Amity Wicks, uh, who is here to speak after her child. Thank you very much. Amity Wicks, Jason Cassay, Brandy Bradley. Hello, my father was a teacher for 40 years. He taught elementary, middle, and high school and was one of the most beloved teachers at my high school for decades. My senior year, I actually took his psychology class and was his TA for a second period of the day, which meant that I got to see behind the scenes what it was like to be a teacher and all the work that went into his lesson plans, grading papers, etc. I watched him at school and at home. I did a lot of the paper grading years before I was even his TA. Living in a teacher's household, I grew up with a limited budget Without lavish vacations, expensive clothes, and cars, but I had a father who poured himself out into the lives of kids every day, and it was a privilege to watch. He died this last August, and I had the honor of playing voice messages from students who had become lifelong friends to him as he lay on his deathbed. I tell you this because I understand the life of a teacher, the workload, and the financial limits of that profession, but I also know what a deep impact a teacher can have on the lives of their students. Teachers 
We parents are deeply grateful for your dedication and the sacrifices you make in some areas of your life to pour into our children. I really hope we can bridge the divide that was widened recently to get back to a partnership in educating our kids. We do want to find common ground and work together. You are valued and we want to see you compensated well and in a way that is commensurate with surrounding areas. Parental passion for their children is not a dismissal of, of the teacher's role and in their impact. Let's come together to support funding for kids, new schools and teachers so that we can once again be the destination school district we know we can be. Thank you, Ms. Wicks. Jason Cassay, Brandy Bradley, followed by Adam Hillard. Mr. Cassay. Good evening. I received an email today that one of my son's teachers is moving because they cannot afford to support their family in Colorado on the salary they earn from Douglas County. From the recent MBEC meetings, I have a much better understanding why this is happening. On average, teachers in Douglas County make $16,000 less than teachers in Cherry Creek and $9,000 less than LPS. The problem here is the way that this board, members of the community, teachers and staff have been behaving lately. It reminds me of a short story by Dr. Seuss titled The Zacks. Each side believes that they are right and refuses to compromise. As Dr. Seuss wrote, never budge, that's my rule. Never budge in the least, not an inch to the west, not an inch to the east. I'll stay here not budging, I can and I will if it makes you and me and the whole world stand still. Well, of course the world didn't stand still, the world grew. In a couple of years, the new highway came through and they built it right over those two stubborn Zacks and they left them there standing unbudged in their tracks. Like in the story of the Zacks, this county is not standing still. Teachers are leaving the district and so have over 3,000 students. Parents are going to steer clear of keeping their children here, just like how the highway was built over the Zacks. The board and this community need to take a long, hard look in the mirror and decide if your pride and intransigent behavior is more important than the future of this county. If we can find a way to work together, to fix teacher compensation for good, to build schools we desperately need, and to improve transportation, the world won't move on without us, but instead, Douglas County would be the example for all other counties for Colorado to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cassay. Brandy Bradley, Adam Hilliard, followed by Bobby Hilliard. Good evening, my son just spoke. Director Ray, I think you've become the most dangerous man in Douglas County. You are bankrupting teachers and creating mass chaos in our county between parents and teachers, and our children are caught in the crossfire. Did you hold Corey Wise accountable for effective leadership when we lost 3,000 kids out of the district, when he spent $37,000 on Gemini training, when 50% of our kids don't read at grade level? Or did you hold him accountable when he entered a lawsuit to sue our district with nine other families? Oh, and he got another job, by the way. You also said you would gather satisfaction feedback from the community, but when the previous board sent out a survey about in-person learning and over 70% of parents wanted to have their kids return to school, it fell on deaf ears. Let's be clear, the last board never listened to the parents of the majority. You said confusion, distrust, division, and mar barred the current relationship, but you held a very divisive January 31st board meeting, recorded conversations between directors, and leaked information to the media. The three of you have Facebook friends who started a recall effort three weeks before the new directors were even seated. And teachers, with the 2018 MLO bond, you got a whopping raise of 112 a month, while Corey Wise got 315 a month. Some of you can't even afford to live in the district where you teach. Teachers, we love you, support you, and need you in Douglas County. Please do not be swayed by the lies of the media, the union, and the minority of parents whose only goal is to smear the names of the Kids First directors and moms like me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. We have Adam Hilliard, Bobby Hilliard, followed by Iko Browning. Adam Hilliard. Thank you. Uh, due to the shortened time limit, I'd like to yield my time to Bobby Hillard. Bobby Hillard. Well. So will that be moved up to three? Nice. Okay. Pursuant to uh, section GP 1.8.74 of the DCSD Board of Education Policy Governance Book, we call for the public censure of directors David Ray, Susan Meek, and Elizabeth Hansen for multiple policy violations, as well as misuse of their elected positions in regards to the public meeting they held on January 31st of this year. I identified the following policy violations from that governance book, section GP governance processes. 
They violated GP 1.8.1 by displaying a much higher degree of loyalty to a staff member than to the board itself. They violated GP 1.8.4 by publicly disclosing and discussing sensitive personnel matters related to the superintendent. They violated GP 1.8.7 by not following the established process, yes, there is an established process if a violation uh, is suspected. And number four, their actions created an ethical violation of GP 1.8 because the three made several accusations during their meeting, yet presented only hearsay, while constantly using inflammatory language to rile up their supporters and provide media fodder. There was nothing, this was nothing more than political theater, and they used their elected positions to hold this public forum instead of, instead of following the established protocol. For these reasons, we call for all three of those directors, Meek, uh, Ray, and Hansen, to receive public censure, again in pursuance to GP 1.8.74. In addition, we call for an additional public censure of David Ray for abuse of his elected public position and ethical violations. Yes, I'm using the word ethical. I didn't realize there was a prohibition. During the special meeting on uh, February 4th, a meeting for which no public comment was permitted, David Ray read out loud and for the record, not one but two letters from members of the public. During that same public meeting on February 4th, Director Ray named the minor child of another board member. This was not only creepy, but dangerous given the current environment and could be viewed as a call to action for some of his more fervent supporters. During the public meeting on February 16th, a Zoom meeting due to inclement weather, David Ray turned off his camera during the Pledge of Allegiance <clears throat> and turned it back on as soon as the pledge was over. This behavior is unbecoming of a school board member, any American for that matter, and especially disrespectful to the veterans and gold star families of our community. For these reasons, we call for the additional public censure of David Ray. And to the directors, Ray, Meek, and Hansen, if you are unwilling or unable to work with all of the directors elected by this community, then just resign. Resign tonight. Thank you, Ms. Thank Shelley. you. We have Iko Browning, Hannah Lee, followed by Allison Comer. Iko Browning. Hello, President Peterson, directors, acting Superintendent Hyatt, and acting Superintendent Abner. May I remind you that public business is conducted in public forums with public input. Do you support excellent education for all kids? At the February 8th, 2022 study session, I was concerned to hear a board director verbalizing his support for specialized charters without verbalizing strong support for planning to build a true neighborhood public elementary school in Sterling Ranch. Sterling Ranch needs an elementary school and neighborhood schools serve all kids. My son receives specialized educational support through the significant special needs program. If I lived in Sterling Ranch and I had a child requiring specialized educational supports through the significant special needs program, would it be fair to tell that child that they need to drive outside of their neighborhood to receive their free appropriate public education? Neighborhood schools need to be the first schools built and are the foundation of public education. This particular board director's verbalized support for charter schools without likewise enthusiastic support of neighborhood schools raises my concerns for an agenda of privatization. First, by allowing rampant proliferation of charter schools at the expense of development and enrollment to neighborhood schools, such as in Sterling Ranch, and later, likely a return of a private school voucher program. Of course, it would be under a different name than vouchers, such as choice or scholarship support to divert public educational resources into private Thank products. you, Dr. Browning. Hannah Lee, followed by Allison Comer, followed by Greg Francisco. Hannah Lee. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thank you for your time today. I'm a resident of the Sterling Ranch community. I have three children and I'm also a graduate of DCSD public schools. In Sterling Ranch, we currently have only one location approved for a school which would serve our community as well as the Solstice community nearby. I am here on behalf of the many residents within the neighborhood to ask that you approve a bond to show support for all kids and support the development of a traditional public neighborhood school and deny any charter application until a public neighborhood school is approved. Sterling Ranch does not need just any school. And in particular, it does not need a niche, niche school or specialty charter school such as STEM school. I have dedicated my entire career to the STEM field, but a neighborhood school that's, but I am here to advocate for the importance of a neighborhood school that supports all kids with diverse needs, not just a subset of kids. STEM school is a 10 minute drive from Sterling Ranch and already very accessible to the residents who wish to educate their kids there. Further, 70% of elementary school kids within the Sterling Ranch community um, already attend neighborhood public schools, demonstrating that the near-term need for the area is indeed a neighborhood public school. As a district resident, mom, and STEM professional, I ask the board to truly represent all kids and all children in the district and therefore deny the application for any charter application until a bond is passed in support of a neighborhood school in Sterling Ranch. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Allison Comer, Greg Francisco, followed by Krista Gilstrap. Allison Comer. My name is Allison Comer and I live in Sterling Ranch. I'm a proud mother of an energetic three-year-old that has battled a rare eye disease since birth, which has caused him to become blind in his left eye. Being born with Coates disease has caused a domino effect as far as developmental fine and gross motor delays. I'm here today to ask you, President Peterson, to make good on a campaign promise and put students with special needs at the top of your priority list and push for them to get into school and resources they need to thrive. I'm requesting you and the rest of the board to approve a bond to be added to the 2022 ballot in support of a traditional neighborhood school to be built in Sterling Ranch. I'm asking the board to deny all charter applications that come through for Sterling Ranch starting in March, especially STEM. I'm not anti-charter and I'm not anti-STEM. I went to a charter school myself. This is just simply not the right time for us to invite a charter school into our neighborhood. The first school in Sterling Ranch needs to be a traditional public school that will help foster a welcoming environment for all students of all ability levels and backgrounds, as well as provide extra supports for students who need it. Right now, my son receives occupational therapy, speech, and general special education support at his public school. He has absolutely blossomed this year because of it. Charter schools do not have the resources to adequately support students with special needs, nor are they required to accept them in the admissions process. I've been fighting for this sweet boy from the second he graced this world, and he deserves a school board that will do the same. Please deny all charter applications and approve a bond to be added to the 2022 ballot. Our neighborhood needs a public neighborhood school where all students can be supported in order to achieve ultimate success. Our children deserve- Thank you, Ms. Comer. We have Greg Francisco, followed by Krista Gilstrap, followed by Denise Dirks. Mr. Francisco. Corey Wise got a job. Time to move on. He did. To the minority board members, your scorched earth policy for power is not going to have the effect you're hoping for. You messed up the last MLO, one I personally didn't vote for because I knew it wouldn't be the last. We need to give teachers a raise. This is the best shot you're going to get with this new board, but at the rate you three are going, you will get nothing. Doug Coe is going to have to come to voters for another MLO this November. Quit lining up behind frivolous lawsuits like that against the county and majority board members brought by an individual who I personally witnessed assault another in the crosswalk of a busy intersection. Is this the type of individual you wanna get behind to further your cause? Maybe, I highly doubt it though. One of you stated that you were also elected by a big majority and revealed to us what your admiration for teachers unions and how many teachers support, how many teachers support make up these organizations. Well, let me remind you of the most important union you three disregarded during the COVID and continue disregarding three months after an election, the parents. Guess what? We outnumber your union and their members, so let me be very clear about something. The only reason there isn't seven new board members sitting at this dais is because not all seven of you were on the ballot this election cycle. Otherwise, removing an ineffective superintendent never would have been an issue. 
Nobody is saying you three don't have Thank a voice. You, We're just Francisco. asking you to be to use it in a. Krista Gilstrap, Krista Gilstrap, Denise Sturks, then Amy uh, Wind, but I believe it's Windju. Uh, Krista Gilstrap. What are we even doing? We've spent the better part of a year fighting about an equity policy that based on the actions of late will never be anything more than words on a page. If this is how the adults in this community treat each other, how can we possibly expect our kids to do any better? This is not the dream Martin Luther King Jr. had. How did we get here? Fear. Fear has been controlling our actions for two, and decisions for two years now. Currently, we have one side afraid of a union takeover and the other side afraid of the return of the reform years. As a result, we appear content to rip the district apart. Well, let me tell you, fear is just a liar running out of breath. Our Douglas County school community is better than the headlines. We are loving and caring and kind. We fight for justice and I deeply believe every single one of us wants what's best for our kids. We just need to figure out how to agree on what that is. For starters, I believe we can all agree we need to secure funding to increase teacher salaries and to build neighborhood schools. We are barreling toward a fiscal, fiscal cliff if we don't secure funding. We have to ask ourselves, is seeing the other side lose worth it? Because if we don't change trajectories soon, I promise there will be no winners, just losers, and the biggest of all will be our 64,000 students. I want to thank this board for what I viewed as a page turn at the last meeting. You all still have big disagreements, but you were able to have a discussion and come to an agreement with civility and humility. We haven't seen yet from this board, so thank you. I'm asking that you all continue leading this way, and I implore everyone listening to follow suit because our kids deserve better. We must do better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gilstrap, Denise Dirks, Amy Windu, followed by Robin Webb. Denise Dirks. Okay, Ms. Dirks is not here. Amy Windu, Robin Webb, followed by Tammy Fleming. Hi, good evening, and uh, thank you all for having me this evening. Um, I want to talk about the fact of how trust was broken in this district. How did that happen? On the 25th, the school board approved changes to the equity policy, which focuses on students' needs individually. On the 28th, the president of the teacher union in Douglas County presented a letter to the majority members of the school board demanding that resolution be revoked. On the 31st, the minority board held a rogue Zoom call with the intent of spreading mis- and disinformation in this community. Right after that call, the teacher union's call happened. What did they plan? A sick out. Why? Because of equity changes policies made. Y'all need to think about students. Think about what their needs are. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Winju. Robin Webb, Tammy Fleming, followed by Miles Cortez. Robin Webb. Sorry, I was way back there. <laughs> I think everybody deserves to be listened to. None of the old board ever listened to me. I came up here and told you how harmful the masks were to my children. None of you cared. We would get lectures about how we were spreading misinformation and sending too many emails. You want to talk about broken trust? I was one of the parents who begged the new health board to pass the PHO to unmask our kids. They actually listened to me and understood that I knew it was best for my kids. Corey sued us, apparently at the old board's direction, which I never saw a public meeting about. I would love to see this new board of seven be successful for our district. We desperately need it. But let me give you a perfect example of bullying. Call, calling fellow board members ignorant and arrogant because you don't agree. Is that a good example for our children? I've been told I should have my kids taken away from me. I've had death wished on me. Is that what tolerance and unity looks like? There is a lot of trust to regain. Can we please as a community find a way to get some common ground and come together. I think we can all agree, for example, that our teachers making an average of 16,000 less than Cherry Creek teachers is unacceptable and needs to be changed. Please, can we just move on? Everyone's angry and come together, please. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Webb. Tammy Fleming, Miles Cortez, then Angie Frank. Tammy Fleming. This is a little scary. Oh my gosh, I'm on the microphone. So uh, I'd like to offer my support of the decision to seek a new superintendent. This election proved that the voters wanted change. A clear majority of those who voted, who chose to cast their vote, cast it in support of you guys and your goals. And it's disingenuous to claim that this decision is somehow some great travesty. I hope you'll find one who'll focus on academic excellence, advocate for a thorough review of DCSD finances and increased funding for DCSD teachers and support staff. It's time to stop focusing on what we have in conflict and focus on what we have in common. I grew up in the home of a single mother who taught high school special ed with the lowest functioning students you could have in a public school. <laughs> she taught one student how to shave because he was afraid of a razor, and she got physically assaulted by another student. But besides all this, she loved her job and she never gave up on her kids. I understand how rewarding a career, it can, how rewarding a career teaching can be, but also the struggles that teachers face financially. This community supports teachers and supports staff and wants them to be paid fairly. I know our teachers are paid less than surrounding districts, but there's a finite number of teaching jobs in those districts and our goal should be for teachers to want to stay here, not just to stay here because they can't go elsewhere. What we should be doing is asking ourselves, in the words of Sandra Brownrigg, does this help funding? If our future in this district consists of more walkouts and constant talk of recall, this will only continue to divide the community, compromising the chances of passing the MLO. We need everyone to come together to support the MBAC in their task of determining feasibility of funding in November and work towards passing the MLO with a clear understanding. Thank you, Ms. Fleming. <laughs> Miles Cortez, Angie Frank, followed by Allison Kalinsky. Mr. Cortez. I thank you. What the heck happened to David Ray from 2015? David, you have prioritized your own return to power above everything else. You are quite deliberately and methodically tearing down and destroying the one thing you pledged to protect and nurture. The people have spoken. Stop trying to overturn the election and stop disrupting the peaceful transfer of power. Stop creating manufactured outrage. Stop disseminating misinformation. Stop encouraging the assault on democracy that you started on 131. Stop pitting teachers against teachers. Teachers are being bullied in classrooms in front of children during lesson time. That happened at an elementary school. I am begging you to do the right thing. Come out and make a public statement this week. Unite the community. Say something like, despite the fact that I disagree with the new directors on a variety of issues, we must respect their majority and work through our differences to develop a cohesive community and a united district which puts education kids and teachers above all else. Feel, feel free to plagiarize that. David, Susan, and Liz, we need education in our classrooms, not activism. There are a small group of your foot soldiers and extremists doing remarkable damage to our district and trying to overturn a fair election. It's unconstitutional. Call them off. Unite the community and stop attempting to grab the power back the, the, the voters lawfully took from you. You all three know in your hearts it's the right thing to do. Unite the community. Do what's right for everyone instead of putting yourself first and trying to recapture power and control. It is the height of selfishness. Thank you, Mr. Cortez. We'll have Angie Frank, Allison Kalinsky, followed by Will Johnson in audience, please, while the speaker is speaking, please no sounds or let the person have their time at the podium. So Angie Frank. Good evening, directors. My name is Angie Frank. I am a SAC member. I'm an engaged voter, and Matt Reynolds knows I love data. I'm a mother of three kids here in the Douglas County. I've been here for 13 years, and I have special needs kids, and I got all sorts of kids that I love, and not just my own, but all this community, and I mean that with my full heart. Last fall, I saw the back of people's cars that say, said, the conservative choice, vote for you for. Conservative. I, 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 when I think of conservative, I think of fiscal responsibility. What is the fiscal responsibility of firing somebody without just cause? And now we have a lawsuit. All this money is being spent not on kids, but a political funding of some sort. 
I don't feel it was responsible, physically responsible, Mr. Peterson, to pay $247,000 to somebody when we could have worked with him. I started doing research. I have a doctorate. That's what I do, I do research. I started looking up turnover costs. Did you know there are, there are studies, conservative studies from Texas and Florida about turnover costs with teachers? Thank you, Ms. Frank. Allison Kalinske, Will Johnson, Catherine Lees. Ms. Kalinske. Evening. These words are not my own, so I'm gonna be reading for Mike Young. I'm sorry I could not be here in person to speak. My name is Mike Young. My wife, Alicia, and I chose to relocate to Douglas County because of the reported excellence in schools, and we put three children through the school system here. Now we have several grandchildren in the system and feel the district is at a critical crossroads. In the last two weeks, I've had at least four DC teachers tell me that they are simply pointing out all of the historical societal wrongs that were muted, neglected, and ignored when they were in high school and college. The problem with that argument is that when I went to school and college 30 years before most of them, somehow I was taught all of those embarrassing points of history. Did they maybe skip school that day? And unlike these sheltered teachers, I was also taught how to take in the full view and context of uncomfortable topics like manifest, manifest destiny, civil war, and the industrial revolution. Context matters, but now it simply is this side was bad and this side was good and our ancestors, at least the ones with pale skin, were shamelessly evil. One teacher told me that the US was irreversibly despised throughout the world, certainly not true beyond the shuttered walls of American academia, and another told me that my blatant patriotism was delusional. My old man response was not the proper contrition. Instead, I thought, what classes do you teach and are any of my grandchildren in them? No one is asking you to leave out the sometimes shameful historical facts, but also don't neglect to celebrate the amazing su success stories of our shared history. In the United States of America, you're free to believe what you believe and walk the path you choose to walk. But DC teachers must realize that they work for the community they serve. Thank you, Ms. Kalinske. Will Johnson, Catherine Lees, Kelly Mayer. Mr. Johnson. Thank you. We all can agree that our next superintendent should lead by empowering teachers, partnering with parents, and helping our kids thrive. Erin Kane has already proven she can lead DCSD like this. If she applies for the role, here's why many of us think she's the right person for the job. Ms. Kane was the interim superintendent from 2016 to 18, so she knows DCSD well. In her first three months on the job, she visited all 89 schools and listened to staff and teachers. No surprise, the teacher retention improved during her tenure. She also identified around 20 million in spending that could be reallocated to more productive ends, like increasing teacher pay. She was instrumental in getting an MLO passed that would have substantially increased teacher pay if our previous board hadn't chosen to use much of the money elsewhere. During Ms. Kane's leadership, student academic performance improved and fewer schools needed to be on improvement plans. She now leads a successful uh, public charter school, a key reason she'd make a great superintendent. Parents choose to send their kids to public charters and can choose to leave. So charters have to constantly be providing a great service to earn that parent choice. American Academy has grown substantially under her leadership, meaning it's delivering an educational experience that families want and that teachers are eager to provide. That's the kind of experience we want for all families across DCSD. Erin Kane is the proven principal leader we need right now. For our teachers, parents, and kids' sake, let's get DCSD back on track. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, Catherine Lees, Kelly Mayer, Jennifer Iverson. Catherine Lees. Hello, my name is Kathy Lees. I have two children at Thunder Ridge. I've been volunteering in our school district for well over a decade. I am speaking on behalf of myself. I'd like to take this time to thank the District Accountability Committee for another excellent DAC forum last Thursday. This topic was supporting our students through mental health resources and supports. Not knowing that I attended the forum, my daughter's therapist sent my daughter and I a link to the video of the keynote speaker on anxiety. The breakout sessions were on point, covering topics from SEL, trauma response practice, layered counseling supports, and layered counseling supports. I particularly enjoyed the hands-on calming strategies from the occupational therapist. 
I provided a copy of the schedule so you can all see what great work this district is doing on behalf of the mental health of our students. I've been attending DAC forums since 2015. All of them have been very informative and relevant to the topics of the day. Not only are they an opportunity to learn about the district and meet with other parents and district staff, it also gives the parents an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with school board directors. I had heard more than one person say how happy they were to see and speak with Director Ray and DAC board liaison director Meek about this topic. That said, I was very disheartened that none of the kids' first directors were there. This was their priority. This was on their platform. Leadership is where you show up. Where were you? What is your priority? Thank you, Ms. Lees, Kelly Mayer, Jennifer Iverson, followed by Molly Milley. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Kelly Mayer. I'm a mom of nine former and current Douglas County School District students. I am really confused by what has happened. I'm not sure that you're aware, but you won. You have the majority. You can push through whatever you want. All we are asking is for the majority to follow the appropriate process, be truthful, and show transparency. I can't for the life of me figure out why the majority couldn't take the time necessary to handle things correctly. The majority have been making backroom decisions that will cost the district hundreds of thousands of dollars. More importantly, you have fired a popular superintendent and lost an incredible and beloved expert on special education. These people are not replaceable. As I have said before, good governance is slow. This rush to act is harming our district, hurting our students and staff. Funding for schools is so important. The rash actions of the majority of this board may cost us a much needed MLO and bond. Please let your actions show that you know how to lead and that you understand servant leadership. Please collect input from all stakeholders and take the time necessary to find the most highly qualified superintendent for Douglas County School District. DCSD students, staff, and parents deserve better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor, Jennifer Iverson, Molly Milley, followed by Sarah Wu. Good evening. To honor Mr. Sid Rundle tonight, since he didn't get a well-deserved well retirement recognition, I'm reading one of the many from the principal's desk, the love letters he wrote to Crest Hill, Crest Hill Middle School families. I love a good argument. I am firmly of the opinion, both professionally and as a parent, that we do a tremendous disservice to our children, especially young adolescents, when we shield them from conflict and disagreements. Getting passionate without being consumed by the passion, disagreeing without being disagreeable, to have a good, healthy argument without it becoming personal is a critical life skill and a foundational to becoming a sturdy human being. It is something we are losing sight of in our culture and we need desperately to reclaim. Our children need to learn the value and purpose of thoughtful disagreement and how to do it well. We know if, that if children are not exposed to and welcome into Purposeful debates and arguments, it will drastically limit their creativity and resilience as adults. Many, if not most, highly creative and successful entrepreneurs grew up in families in which robust debates took place all the time. Debates and arguments about beliefs, values, politics, money, recreation, art, music, family functions, etc. Fortunately, young, adult, young adolescents are biologically built for this, and it only needs to be kindled. They have an exaggerated sense of righteous indignation already bubbling up inside. Thank you, Ms. Iverson. Molly, My Molly Miley Milley, by, followed by Sarah Wu, followed by Carolyn Williamson. Ms. Milley. Good evening, directors. As proud principals of Douglas County, representing all feeders and all regions, we wanted to introduce ourselves to you and open the door for future conversation and collaboration. We are passionate and invested in our future success. We love Douglas County. We are Douglas County. It is our greatest desire that all stakeholder voices are not only heard, but valued 
and considered in the aspect of moving our district forward in a united direction. We are blessed to have the best of the best educators in our schools, and we invite you to come to our buildings to meet with the people who have dedicated their lives to putting students first. We hope to build this relationship so that when you are making decisions on their behalf, you will better know their perspectives, their realities, and the impact you have on their world. As leaders, we would love to partner with you through the superintendent selection process because we believe that is one of the most important decisions that you will make. After all, while a superintendent may be the captain of the ship, we are the ones who make it sail. We have a deep understanding of our schools and can provide you input on what our stakeholders desire and respect in a district leader. We hope to set up a meeting with you collectively as a board to support you during the superintendent selection process and in other future decisions that will impact the success of Douglas County. We are loyal and invested in our district and want nothing more than to Thank you, Principal Millie. We now have Sarah Wu, Carolyn Williamson, Robert Marshall, Miss Wu. Thank you. I am here to echo the calls for the new board members to resign for the benefit of our district due to lack of integrity, transparency, and accountability. These were campaign promises of the new board members and appear to be just that, empty campaign promises. To quote the Colorado Constitution, Article 29, Section 1, the people of the state of Colorado hereby find and declare that the conduct of public officers, members of the General Assembly, local government officials, and government employees must hold the respect and confidence of the people. They shall carry out their duties for the benefit of the people of the state. They shall therefore avoid conduct that is in violation of their public trust or that creates a justifiable impression among members of the public that such trust is being violated. And it continues, but I have to be quick tonight. Multiple times, one or more of the board members have been caught out in their own lies. This is not integrity. And attacking the people who tell the truth doesn't make it any better. The repeated backroom conversations just won't stop and that's not transparency. Having an agenda when you took office that you still refuse to release to the public as our new direction is not transparency. It is not accountable when you try to silence your critics, cut out key stakeholders in decision making, and reduce public comment to this absurd 90 seconds. It is not accountable when you refuse to acknowledge events that happened only days ago in the, mo in the name of moving forward. Please stop the destruction of our school district. The new board members lack integrity. You do not operate with transparency, and you refuse to take account. Thank you, Miss Wu, Carolyn Williamson, Robert Marshall, and then Kurt Stroman. Uh, audience, audience, please do not address each other during the intervening period. Carolyn Williamson, Robert Marshall, and then Mr. Stroman. Thank you. I join others tonight who call for the resignation of the extremist far-right board majority members. During their campaigns, the board majority appeared to be heavily influenced by several outside extremist groups, and their steamrolling actions since being sworn in show this reliance has only gotten heavier. FEC United, a local extremist group, endorsed all four majority board members. A reminder, the founder of this group has called for the mass execution of politicians, including the hanging of our governor and secretary of state. Last October, FEC United called up its militia arm to attend one of our school board meetings. The board majority members were also endorsed by the 1776 Project Political Action Committee an extremist group out of New York that opposes anti-racist education. The 1776 project openly declares its intentions of hostile takeovers of school boards across the country. Another outside influencer of this new board majority's agenda is the Douglas County chapter of FAIR. 
It is a national organization opposed to anti-racism efforts and rallies around the perceived fear of critical race theory. Three of the four board majority members are members of FAIR. In fact, Mr. Peterson was Thank a member you, when Ms. it was- Williamson. Robert Marshall, Kurt Stroman, followed by Kathy Dorman. Mr. Marshall. Hello, once again, repetition, mother of all understanding. Vocational training, in-house construction and in-house auto shops, and Jay Rotzi, we get a Jay Rotzi unit. Um, I don't want to be snide, but I think there can be some remedial character development. So I didn't, there's too much to cover. So I had no idea what to bring in, but I, I'm flabbergasted. I have offered many, twice, ways for the majority to get what they exactly wanted without causing the hate and discontent that has happened. If you can't lead a whole unit, you can't lead. That's a basic, basic command thing learned in every military unit. Sure, you have 55% of the majority, but if you can't bring the other 45% at least to go along, and they would have if you would have done it in a proper process, you can't lead. These are all self-inflicted wounds, and how many more skeletons are gonna come up? Today we had in the paper that uh, your superintendent choice had Corey Wise's contract in front of her when she emailed you all while you were sharpening the knives to go after him. I mean, I don't know, is the superintendent incompetent or is she dishonest in sending out a text like that? And which character trait is the one that you like in a superintendent? And finally, you go after these unions constantly. And unions are a pain in the butt. They are a pain in the butt. But I think people should take a step back and think we wouldn't have Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Teacher, hey. Kurt Stroman, Kathy Dorman, Carolyn Newkirk. Mr. Stroman. Good evening. My name is Kurt Stroman, and I am a 30-year career educator here in Douglas County. My wife and I became teachers in this district early in the 90s. It has been my goal as an educator to immerse myself in the community and build strong student, parent, and family relationships. In my time here, I've had the honor of teaching thousands of students. Our own children have been taught by teachers who have committed themselves to teaching not only content, but modeling integrity, hard work, and trust. I and the teachers and leaders who have been my colleagues over the years have been champions for students and their families. I am not a member of any union. My disdain comes from the way that you fired a leader without cause who was willing to work with you, who asked to be challenged, a man who was the link that could have bridged the community. The majority directors missed an opportunity to be champions for students, to work together and to show the community what real compromise and integrity look like. Firing Corey Wise broke the spirit of the people who have also devoted our lives to education in this district. Many of those who voted for you have since expressed their regret publicly. Majority directors, your lack of transparency, lack of integrity, and abandonment of compromise has caused an awakening in those who voted for you and confirmation of your agenda in those who did not. With my students and my own children, I have expectations of truthfulness, integrity, and trustworthiness. These are expectations, not hopes. We should not have to hope for these things from you. We should expect them. Paying the salary of a fired competent superintendent is irresponsible. Because of your actions, I simply do not trust the majority members. You have chosen politics over ethics. Thank you, Mr. Stroman, Kathy Dorman, Carolyn Newkirk, followed by Craig Mason. It's Ms. Dorman here. Okay, moving to Carolyn Newkirk, Craig Mason, followed by Heidi Carreau. I realize that this, um, this get up is not very professional to be here, but it is Tuesday. I have the best job. I teach 25 eight and nine year olds how to read, how to multiply and divide, and mo probably most importantly, how to be kind, respectable, and responsive humans. I love what I do. And four months ago, I had no reason to doubt my career or whether parents supported me or whether I wanted to even stay in Douglas County. Our test scores were up, morale was high, and things were headed in the right direction. However, now I'm filled with doubt and constant worry. 
I'm worried that some board members are not listening to administrators, teachers, staff, parents, or students. I'm worried that the same tactics that were used by the last conservative board we had are in our very near future, instituting ridiculous evaluations for teachers and staff, overall degradation of district employee morale, which created a mass exodus of teachers and staff, a, vouch, a voucher fight that helped bankrupt our district, and intentional frivolous spending that further sealed the deal. If the MLO is put on the ballot and passes, how can we be sure you will spend it appropriately? On staff, and not on another voucher fight. Whether this is or is not the plan, I'm asking you to be transparent and courageous enough to state it for the record so that we teachers can make possibly life-altering decisions. Thank you, Ms. Newkirk. I believe we have Kathy Dorman in the room now. Kathy Dorman, Craig Mason, Heidi Carell. President Peterson, we missed this lady. Yeah, she's, she's up next. Go ahead, Ms. Dorman. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Kathy Dorman. I am a proud teacher who dedicated 37 years of teaching science at Ponderosa High School. I also enjoyed 25 years of coaching cross country and track. I am proud to be a Mustang. I am also a proud member of the Douglas County Federation. My comments are about the recent resolution concerning Douglas County school district's culture of individual excellence and inclusion. In the resolution it states, and I quote, whereas legitimate questions have arisen from school district staff and parents in the community at large regarding board policy, ADB's underlying assumptions and implementation, et cetera. So the members of the DCSD's Equity Advisory Council need to know what are these legitimate concerns. As far as we know, those concerns have never been publicly stated. Are the concerns with policy ADB or with implementation or both? If the legitimate concerns are not explicitly identified, it is impossible for the Equity Advisory Council to move forward in our work. My final question is, you claim that the resolution does not change the equity policy. I understand that, but what is the actual vision you have for the equity policy. The community deserves to know. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dorman, Craig Mason, Heidi Caro, followed by Daniel Nice. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Craig Mason. I am a parent of a uh, Hines Ranch High School student, and I'm also director of membership for the Freedom From Religion Foundation Colorado chapter. Um, I'm going to be referring to this handout that I had uh, delivered to you folks. Uh, the title of it is The Case Against Vouchers and Tuition Tax Credits. I won't read it, of course, but um, uh, first of all, Director Peterson, I want to say thank you for addressing my questions on KOA. I submitted two specific questions to you, which were, uh, do you intend to review vouchers and do you intend to look at the banning of certain books that are offensive? And you said no to both those things on KOA, so thank you for that. Um, I try to be a student of what's going on with respect to uncertainty. Um, the thing I can say that I'm hearing in this room tonight is, for example, uh, a lot of folks are concerned about this destabilization occurring in the district will have this effect of privatizing uh, education. That is a concern that we have. So uh, this, um, this handout talks about the issues with vouchers. And specifically, there's one, one issue that is irrefutable, which is it's unconstitutional. Voucher programs transfer monies from tax funds to religious institutions. In fact, uh, in this um, handout, Colorado is actually famous for the 2015 situation where it was overturned for that exact reason, religious schools. So please look at the handout and let's not move forward. Thank voucher. you, Mr. Mason. Thank you. Heidi Corot, Daniel Nice, followed by Gwen Spahn. Oh, I'm sorry, withdrew. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Daniel Nice, Gwen Spahn, followed by Matthew Smith. Uh, 
Good evening, board members. Those are not easy seats that you guys occupy. The seven of you each have been granted a position of authority, leadership, and responsibility. I'm a Douglas County resident with two kids entering grade school in the fall, and I vote Republican. What has transpired these past couple of weeks is not what is best for our district. Terminating a beloved superintendent will cost taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars in salaries and much more in legal fees. This is taxpayer money that could have gone to staff, that could have gone to students, and instead is being wasted, and now we need to ask for more money for our amazing Douglas County staff who desperately need it after you have just mishandled public funds. I firmly believe this will cause an exodus of good teachers in our district who were already on edge and who genuinely loved a superintendent who worked for them. This board has shown a complete lack of leadership and professionalism, in my opinion. Let's change that. I do not know any of you personally. I imagine you are all great people, but we need great leaders. Mr. Board President, you have mentioned teachers unions. I, like you, don't believe that's what's best for our district. I worry that what's transpired is going to cause that. We cannot go back, but I hope it is not too late to curb this damage. I've heard it said many times at this point that our district needs to go in a different direction. I have yet to hear what that direction is. Honestly, looking at several statistics, Douglas County leads in categories such as high school graduation rates. If I had more time to speak, I would love to go into more statistics. To me, it seems like our district has done pretty well during the pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Nice. Gwen Spahn, Matthew Smith, followed by Lisa Mason. Ms. Spahn. Okay, we'll move to Matthew Smith, Lisa Mason, followed by Jimmy Grant. Good evening, directors. So what did happen to 2015 David Ray? Oh, sorry, did I just dox you? Sometime during your first term, you got drunk on power and control. You became a megalomaniac. Since you're a registered psychotherapist, I don't need to read the, defi the definition for you, but I like this definition. A megalomaniac is a pathological egotist. That is someone with a psychological disorder with symptoms like delusions of grandeur and obsession with power. To say the shoe fits is an understatement. I sat here in the fall watching parent after parent come before your little fiefdom and explain over and over again how mass were hurting their kids. However, they were ignored. Then when they went to their county representatives and those representatives listened, your response was to file a frivolous lawsuit against the county. Those parents told the four former board members that they were coming for them in November, and they did. They told you that the former superintendent had to go, but you didn't listen. 2015 David Ray would have held the former superintendent accountable for not representing the values of the surrounding community. That's a quote. The new board did listen. You are deliberately hurting the very thing that you were elected to protect. It would be bad enough if you were standing by idly while your supporters try to tear down this district, but you are not idle. You are encouraging them and contributing to this manufactured outrage every step of the way. There is a car painting event by your supporters this Sunday in Highlands Ranch Town Center can't claiming that, I quote, DCSD schools are under attack, which is true, actually, Thank except you, your Smith. side is doing the attack. Lisa Mason, Jimmy Graham, Sean Wills. Lisa Mason. Okay, Jimmy Graham, Sean Wills, Erica Devlin. I'm a veteran U.S. Navy SEAL, a bodyguard for the CIA, and a father of four amazing children in this county. The best parts of my character were formed by adversity, through hard work, personal sacrifice, and by the grace of God, not government. To suggest that anyone would deny my children that same form of character development because you see them as biracial is not only naive, it's racist. On behalf of my family, we deny any racist handout of equity. My children will be judged by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. It is ultimately my responsibility to educate and protect my children. I pay taxes so that professionals can assess me toward my objectives regarding their education and safety. I've heard it said here that it's not a teacher's role to protect children. I strongly disagree. It is every adult's responsibility to protect children to the best of their ability. Being a teacher has changed, and for that I'm sorry, but it's true. It'll be three years in May since the STEM school shooting. 
The county identified millions of dollars to make our schools safer for our children. It bothers me that half of that money, three years later, is still in the bank collecting interest. It has not gone towards protecting children. Much of that money, was, um, money that was spent was spent recklessly. For example, protective film placed on glass is, in, is applied incorrectly and on doors that are not locked. How does that enhance our children's safety? As a direct message to this board, change is hard. You knew this fight would be real. Be encouraged that you were chosen for a reason. You do not stand alone. We can't fix the world overnight, but by design, we the people, if we refuse to be divided, can hold Douglas County. Thank you all for your sacrifice for our children. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Sean Wheels, Erica Devlin, followed by Tina Stroman. Good evening. I've been a resident of Parker since 2009. My two boys have gone to school in this district their whole childhood. I moved my family to Parker for greener pastures. All the schools were rated very high. Legend High School was rated a nine when we moved here. It recently reached as low as five. Two election cycles ago for the school board, I was told certain people were gonna come in and fix the problems with this district. I asked myself, what kind of problems do we have? I jumped in line and voted for the people who, who proclaimed they'd repair this district's problems. Since that day, our district has had more problems than ever. What happened to the former superintendent, Dr. Thomas Tucker? It was obvious that the previous school board and Dr. Tucker didn't see eye to eye. An investigation was started on him for workplace discrimination. On July 25th, 2021, the Denver Post wrote an article on Dr. Tucker, Dr. Tucker, and I quote, in a statement, the Douglas County School District said the investigator found that the complaint was made in good faith, <clears throat> but there was no policy violation, end quote. Basically, he did nothing wrong. This is not quarter, but I suspect Dr. Tucker knew he either resigned or he'll just keep getting investigated. Fortunately, with this last school board election cycle, we had four members of this community that saw the same problems I did and decided to do something about it. I am envious of your bravery and dedication to the students of the school district. The school board is doing nothing short of following the rules and getting beat up in the process by some very ugly- Thank you, Mr. Wheels. Erica Devlin, Tina Stroman, followed by Jason Hurd. Ms. Devlin. Hello, thank you so much for letting me speak tonight. I'm here to ask you for unity and that the election results be respected. The children should be at the forefront of all our decisions, and I'm not seeing that right now. We need a new superintendent that will refocus the district on student academic success, success excuse me, the past two years have been extremely difficult on the kids. If this district wants a mill bond pass, there needs to be a commitment and specific language that proposed increased taxes will directly benefit teachers and paraprofessionals in the classroom. These two important matters are being diluted right now by all the negativity, such as multiple lawsuits being brought against the, the district sick outs, minority board supporters bashing majority board members on social media, threats of recall of uh, majority board members, hit pieces by even Kyle Clark on Nine News because they didn't like the election results and they just want their power back. The constant whining, pouting and tantrums and lying false narratives are extremely disappointing. Does any of this benefit the kids? No. What about the kids? Please think of the kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Devlin, Tina Stroman, Jason Hurd, David Turner. Good evening, directors. My name is Tina Stroman, and once again, thank you, thanks for having me as a voice for many educators tonight. What brings me here tonight is to share my thoughts on trust and values. Frankly, after watching and listening to what has transpired in the past three weeks in this district that I have poured my career into, I can say without reservation that I do not trust the board majority on the school board. Here's why. These are elected public officials. I've watched them fire a superintendent for no reason and seemingly organize that behind closed doors. I've watched as they have tried to play cleanup from that decision by being very selective about what radio stations and news stations to appear on. And I've listened to their comments on each one of those stations. 
I listened as one board member told the public that he directly contacted a charter school director to ask her to, ask her to apply for a job that didn't yet exist. And I listened just last week to the confusion about posting a job internally versus externally in order to ensure that the said charter school director could apply. I've said it before and I'll say it again. My moral compass is shaking and for good reason. This is unethical behavior and I can't pretend like I don't see it or that it's okay. I will always stand up for what's right. We tell our children and students that they make choices every day and those choices come with consequences. The same applies to us as adults. We too make our choices. Watching the choices of these four board members has led me to my firm decision, one that I have never considered before in all my years of education. If a move is made to request passage of an MLO by this board majority, I cannot in good faith vote to support that. And there is one simple reason. Thank I you, just Ms. Stroman. Jason Hurd, David Turnit, followed by Sarah Porter. Hi. At the February 4th meeting, Director Ray made a statement about Christy Williams having her children attend a charter school. My interpretation of this is that Director Ray, one, does not consider charter schools to be part of the district, and that, two, he does not like or approve of charter schools. Both of my children have attended an excellent charter school in Douglas County for over 10 years. The curriculum equal at equal grade, grade level are far ahead of their peers attending standard district schools. Our charter school has little to no adult politics in the classroom. Instead, the focus is on academic excellence and building good character. This charter school stayed in class during the district's remote learning from November 20, 2020 to February 2021. This charter school did not force our children to wear masks when it was able to opt out. This charter school did not participate in the sick out on February 3rd. I bring up these things because the school that my kids go to put kids first. We do not hear from this charter school staff statements such as, we are taking back power, or kids will be equally behind. I do not agree with Director Ray's apparent notion that charter schools are bad or that students who attend them do not count as regular district students. The rest of the county should learn some lessons from these charter schools. I really wish that nobody on the board would actually disparage schools that are in fact part of Douglas County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd, David Turnit, Sarah Porter, followed by Sean Benson. David Turnit. Yeah, um, so I'd like to thank the uh, new uh, board president and the new directors. Um, mass mandates are gone. I um, think we're all doing okay here, right? Nobody dropping dead. Um, I like uh, that we can applaud here. That not killing anybody on that. Everybody feel safe? No, you don't. There's a lot of accusations in here. Um, I, I want to echo the uh, comments by the previous person. I really don't get the uh, comments by Director Ray on charter schools. Um, you've, you've spoken a lot on this uh, at these uh, meetings. Um, I'd like to invite you to comment on that, clarify that, because what is it? I mean, is it because you don't have control of them? You can't put your thumb on them? or are they second-class citizens to you? Um, Director Hansen, uh, you're, I hear you're an attorney. Um, you ought to look at the ethics as well um, and file some complaints for yourself and maybe the others. Um, you can't, uh, well, I guess we, we found out through the open request that you didn't tape and record the conversations. That's good because Colorado Bar says that's illegal. Thank you, Mr. Turnit. We have Sarah Porter, Sean Benson, followed by Luke Ribich. Good evening. I had hopes that with the four newly elected board members that both sides would feel represented and we could just move forward, but here we are. I would like to address the DCSD community. We are all universally wanting the very best for our children. 
We are not adversaries. If we really took the time to listen to each other, we would realize that we have more things in common than not. I implore you not to listen to the fringe on social media. Focus instead on the unifying mission of educating our kids. All seven of our school board directors care about this district deeply, and they are spending countless unpaid hours of service for our students and for the future of our community. We've seen what they've received in return. If this is the treatment board members can expect from their community, it will be next to impossible to inspire quality candidates to fill these roles in the future. Instead, the primary qualification will be the ability to withstand abuse. We cannot afford to waste any more time with past grievances. We all have them, but we need to move forward. Douglas County is the fifth wealthiest in the country, and we have caring, educated families and fantastic teachers. We should be unstoppable, yet we are distracted by the lure of villainizing others, by walkouts and recalls, by bickering online, by listening to newscasters who have everything to gain by sowing the seeds of division. To attract and keep the very best teachers, we need to focus our efforts on eliminating the wage gap between our teachers and the teachers in neighboring districts. All seven members agree that this is a priority. They also all agree that vouchers would detract from that mission. Fortunately, they all agree that vouchers are off the table. Thank you, Ms. Porter. Sean Benson, Luke Ribich, followed by Luke Johnson. Hello, I identify as unprivileged, unnarcissistic, not special, and my pronouns are normal and do not require clarification. Why is this ridiculous indoctrination in public school? My 10-year-old daughter was required to read a book about cross-dressing, and that is perfectly fine for boys to paint their nails and wear a dress while shaming any thought against it. Remember, sticks and stones may break your bones, but no names will never hurt me. Learn to brush it off your shoulder and not make yourself a victim. Now, kids are taught that everything is bullying, nothing is teasing, and inclusion means that she must invite the kids she doesn't like to her birthday party because the policy is invite everyone or invite no one. We're filing a lawsuit. We're walking out of class. We're staging a sick out the day after a snow day. Translation, we don't care about learning at all. Hey, protesters, where were you when the American flag and free speech were banned? Now you're all upset over a superintendent whom hardly anyone has met and most people never work with. And lest we forget that Corey, along with every other member, stood united for the mandates and a lawsuit against her own county. My daughter's school is a joke. I have to teach her cursive because uh, school forgot and never bothered to get around to it. I have to give her math and vocabulary homework, and I have to give her her spelling test. This picture book was her only required reading assignment the past six months, while this was what she read in the same time frame at home. Convince me why I should devalue her potential by keeping her in public school. Help me avoid topics like cross-dressing at the dinner table. Thank make you, Mr. Benson. Luke Ribich, Luke Johnson, then Gary Colley. Thank you, Mr. President, Board of Directors, Administrators, Faculty, Support Staff, and Community Members. My name is Luke Ribich. I'm a parent of multiple students in the district and a resident of Castle Rock. The purpose of my comments this evening is to address issues we've all experienced as stakeholders of this district, specifically its culture and district policies and the and propose a remedy. Please know that I'm an informed consumer of school law, school board operations, successful and unsuccessful district and board policies, procedures, and academic excellence, having been a school board member for 13 years as a, in a, another state, prior to my family's relocation to Castle Rock. In that time, I helped to lead the turnaround of an underperforming and financially distressed school district that has risen to become one of the highest performing districts in the state in terms of student performance, post-graduation preparedness, and financial stewardship. With that, I am here to tell this board and its entire community that what I witnessed in watching the video of the February 4th school board meeting was akin to Jesus flipping over the tables in the synagogue, and it needed to happen. The bottom line is that while Corey Wise was not the person necessarily directly responsible, he was certainly the leader, and the board did not have his trust. And without that trust, he could not govern, period. The culture of DCSD is completely broken. This district appears to operate to serve the needs of the employees Thank and you, special Mr. interests. Luke Johnson, Gary Cowley, followed by Serenity Hayes. 
Luke Johnson. It's Mr. Johnson here. Okay, Gary Colley, followed by Serenity Hayes. And then we will take a break before transitioning to online speakers. The first online speaker will be Jenny Brady. Gary Colley. Good evening, board. You know, I want to make a point right from the get-go here. You know, I voted for what's referred to as the minority board, because there's three of seven, um, as well as the previous board before that. This time around, I voted for the four. So in essence, I voted for all seven. There's a reason for that. It has to do with confidence, betrayal of trust, that type of thing. What I am requesting with the Community Accountability Committee is uh, greater accountability from all seven of you. Somehow, it's got to be better. Board members who can't accept the will of the community, not the community that's given you public comment, but the broader community, if you can measure it, and, can, and uh, accept the will of that community and continue to promote unrest in the board meetings and the broader community, because I think some of you are instigating the challenges we're having in our community. And shame on you for doing that. If you're doing that, you should step down as a board member. And as things progress, as you want to start people being um, removed from the board, join the party. Why can't we just come together? Um, the selection process for hiring our new superintendent really is not a lot different than what you did to hire Corey after you got rid of Dr. Tucker. So it looks quite similar, but I think this process, from my perspective, I would appreciate. Thank, thank you, Mr. Colley. Serenity Hayes is our last in-person speaker. Ms. Hayes, then we will take a break. First three speakers on Zoom will be Jenny Brady, Lucy Squire, followed by Triana Burdick. Ms. Hayes. Good evening. Thank you, Peterson, Myers, William, and Weiniger. You have given... I feel touched because I think you guys have given us hope. Um, I appreciate your commitment to parental responsibility and choice. This school year is so different than last. My kids are happy, thriving, and excited to go to school. <laughs> oh, this is so embarrassing. Um, seeing the smiling faces of their friends and teachers makes a huge difference. Thank you for, for modeling professionalism, even when insults and false accusations are thrown your way. Thank you for, for putting yourselves out there for our kids, our teachers, and our district as a whole. I know it's not easy, but please remember that you're valued and supported. Please stay strong and continue on. I appreciate and support the expedited timeline for hiring a new superintendent. My hope is that you all can work together to mark a di this day as a new start, a new start for a seven member board where each and every board member takes ownership for all of their own actions, past and present. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. And without exception, a uh, 10 minute break and start at eight o'clock. And we will start with the Zoom uh, speakers. Again, Jenny Brady, Lucy Squire, Triana Burdick.
here in person, Tiffany Wilson. If you are here, we'll have Tiffany Wilson followed by Jenny Brady and then Lucy Squire, the second two via Zoom, Ms. Wilson. Good evening. First, I want to voice my support and excitement for new leadership in the district. I am looking forward to having a leader who will be there as a support to parents, kids, teachers, and staff equally. From personal experience, this was seriously lacking. This change gives me new hope. When there is a change in board leadership, there is often a change in superintendents. This isn't anything new. So why are we fighting this? Why are we wishing failure on this community instead of accepting the change? Although change can feel hard, it is often necessary to move forward in the right direction. What is also necess necessary, unity. That means the finger pointing and misinformation does not help this community, it hinders it. Second, I would like to request an auditor of financials within the Dugco School District. We want full transparency. Cut the fat where it needs to be cut, and if we are going to fight for an MLO, we need to be assured that our teachers are getting fairly compensated and that the schools are being funded for our kids. When my aunt, a teacher for over 30 years, tells me that she always votes against these increases because the money never goes where it's being told it does, that speaks volumes. Please, don't misunderstand my drive to fight for my kids as being an anti-teacher. That is far from the truth. As a mom, my kids come first, and as a mom, I also understand the importance of their education. I'm fighting for that too. Let us come together so we can once again be a district people run to and not run away from. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. We'll now trans, uh, transfer to online. Jenny Brady, Lucy Squire, Triana Burdick. Is Ms. Brady online? She is online, sir. <laughs> Ms. Brady, can you hear us? I can hear you now. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I am concerned about Cora re requests. Specifically, I'm troubled by the seemingly ambiguous process in CORA fulfillment. It seems it is simply at the whim of the individual filling them. I'd like to see more transparency with the process of completing the CORA request. Please also consider an audit on which CORA requests are completed versus what was asked for. Additionally, I'd be happy to volunteer to be the Douglas County School District Corazar or a task force leader. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brady. Lucy Squire, Triana Burdick, followed by Rochelle Wood. Ms. Squire. Can you hear me? We can, go ahead. There are so many things I want to talk to you about, so many things that you need to know in order to truly understand the work that the previous two boards did to repair the damage done during the dark ages. However, the thing that keeps coming to the forefront right now is this. If you want to make a good gesture in good faith to show us that you're here for the right reasons and you truly value educators, allow us to have a collective bargaining agreement. It isn't any additional cost to you or the district. It solely means that you will listen to us and allow us to have a voice. Teachers deserve to have a seat at the table and to have a CBA. We are the largest metro area school district without one currently. Teachers' working conditions are students' learning conditions, and by granting us a CBA, educators in the district would have a seat at the table to collaboratively work towards restoring the reputation of this district. Restoring a CBA for your educators would allow for teacher input and feedback for district decisions regarding all of the work on the compensation plan, as well as working towards a bond and mill levy. We also want our union to have a working and restored relationship with the district. Our union is made up of the teachers in this district. Douglas County Federation and Douglas County School District have a long history of working cohesively and collaboratively together, and it would be ideal for this to once again be the case. Educators are the union. If you support teachers, then it should seem that you also support our union. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Squire, Triana Burdick, Rochelle Wood, followed by Marie Cranson. Triana Burdick. Yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. I'm speaking to the board majority this evening and echoing others asking for their resignation. You four are solely responsible for the loss of two highly effective and respected leaders who each devoted more than 25 years of service to DCSD. In his resignation letter, Sid Rundle specifically named you as the reason for his exit, writing, 
Despite their propaganda, they do not value loyalty, hard work, dedication, relationships, decency, humility, or integrity. Instead, they show themselves to be firmly yoked to a political influence, arrogant ideology, and a disdain for due process, end quote. Single-handedly dismantling exiting existing strong leadership while lowering standards for new leadership is not reflective of holding high standards for our district. Your railroading through the superintendent hiring process and downgrading qualification requirements to accommodate Ms. Kane's lack of experience-based or education-based experience to benefit your agenda. Why are we considering candidates without an advanced degree in education to lead our district? Why are we considering candidates who have no teaching experience to lead our staff? To even consider, our, to even consider a candidate whose professional experience is so incongruous with what is considered standard for high quality superintendent shows how little you value public education. Adding Aaron Kane to the toxic leadership of directors Myers, Peterson, Williams, and Weiniger is a recipe to destroy DCSD's tradition of operating independently you, as a school system. Rochelle Wood, followed by Marie Cranston, followed by Kelsey Newlin. Rochelle Wood. Okay, Kelsey Newland, Aaron Wood, and then Tiffany Baker. Kelsey Newland, are you online? I'm here. We can hear you, go Can ahead. you guys hear me? All right, hi, my name is Kelsey. I was enrolled in Douglas County Schools uh, since I was in pre-K. I graduated from Ponderosa High School in 2008. Uh, I heard someone need said that you need to realize the communities you're serving. I am a mixed race uh, person who identifies as black and I am a part of the community they serve. <clears throat> Uh, no, once you lose the teachers, you're done. This abusive relationship you have with them is uh, grotesque. And instructors who are caught in this right now are uh, completely uh, underdeserved and underserved. Attending your schools from K to 12, I en encountered more racism, sexism, and ableism than I have in any other arena I have chosen to integrate into. I have uh, had to spend years of my life unlearning the education you provided. In third grade, my teacher referred to me as a mulatto. In fifth grade, I was called a mutt by my peers. In middle school, I watched boys who physically and psychologically tormented me get slapped on the wrist and ish issued half-baked apologies. Despite all judgment, I end up in AP classes where nigger was used in text, and I was made to talk about how it was a funny word by old white men, traumatizing. And just a quick lesson, no one in this room, in that room, should ever be saying that word. It is the N word to you. There are plenty of words I don't say, you can too. My guidance counselor told me college isn't for everyone. I am currently a post-bachelor pre-med student who had to relearn everything while uh, defending myself, while unlearning and healing from you. Thank you, Ms. Newland. Aaron Wood, Tiffany Baker, Kate Gould. Tiffany Baker, Kate Gould, Alexa Connor. Ms. Baker, are you online? Yes. We can hear you, go okay. ahead. Great. I read an article today um, from Colorado Community Media and it addressed a phone call between Peterson and Meek directors around January 28th about Superintendent Wise. And I'm gonna quote from the article. Peterson said he and Williams had already discussed with the board's legal counsel, Will Trackman, all the options to end Wise's contract. So basically some of the directors talked to Will Trackman before alerting um, the, the directors in the minority that there was a problem. So I have some questions. When and where can the public find the receipts for Trackman's services? Were all seven board members aware that directors were meeting with Trackman regarding Superintendent Wise's job before the phone calls. Did you meet with Trackman as individuals or as a board? Why didn't you use the legal services of Kaplan and Ernest at $245 an hour instead of using taxpayer dollars at around $400 an hour? Okay, Trackman is the general counsel for Mountain States Legal Foundation. On their website, it says, do you want to outsmart liberals? That sounds like you're putting politics in the classroom by using his services. Trackman is also alumni of Leadership Program of the Rockies. 
along with Aaron Kane. Thank Aaron you, Kane. Ms. Baker. Kate Gould, Alexa Connor, Stacia Harris. Ms. Gould, are you online? Yes, I am. We can hear you. Go ahead. Moral stress arises out of conflicts in values. While our county is politically divided, I think most of us would agree on the importance of honesty as a community value. The board majority's dishonesty, immoral, and unethical behavior in the firing of Superintendent Wise has clearly caused moral stress to our teachers, families, and children. Where is your goodness, compassion, love? These are the moral emotions that connect us to the web of life that either preserve, or in your case, threaten and destroy social relationships. Why did Aaron Kane have a copy of Corey Wise's employment contract, especially after meeting with Peterson about her interest in the superintendent's position? Why are you going to offer a job to someone who has personally donated to all four of your ca campaigns? Or was that the deal all along? I implore all of our community members to read the article in the Douglas County News Press that outlines all of your dishonesty and backroom dealings. And I ask the four of you, what has happened to your spiritual orienting systems that you are so willfully trying to destroy our community? I hope each and every one of your pastors pulls you aside on Sunday and truly speaks to your hearts about how you have lost your way and the moral injury you are causing our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gould, Alexa Connor, Stacia Harris, Michael Dubrovich. Alexa Connor, are you online? Ms. Connor, can you hear us? Okay, well, I can hear you just fine. There nope, we go. I'm Thank here. you. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, directors. My name is Alexa. I have lived here in Douglas County for 22 years. I have a junior in high school and one about to be a middle schooler. One of the best reasons for living in Douglas County has been the educational system. We have had wonderful teachers who have affected all of my children's lives in a positive way. My children have thrived and I owe that to the wonderful educators who put their heart and soul in teaching. We are now going to lose these wonderful educators due to the board majority's decisions and this will affect the quality of their education and eventually the county's desirability and our home prices. Couple of things to ponder. Our teachers are paid extremely poorly in an extremely wealthy county. Why is that? A teacher's job is to educate, not be a militant armed security guard as well. We don't pay them enough for that. Teachers are not our puppets, nor are they accountable to us parents. Furthermore, why would we consider a superintendent without an educational degree or background? I work in corporate America, and we wouldn't hire a senior level executive who didn't have the proper degree. So why would our school district be any different? Even further, why would we want a superintendent like Aaron Kane, who doesn't embrace every child and actually excludes those with disabilities? My brother was in the special education program, and it sickens me to think of a superintendent who would exclude him. Is this the model? Thank you, Ms. Connor. Stacia Harris, Michael Dubrovich, Kathleen Boyer. Stacia Harris, are you online? Yes, I'm here. We can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. I joined this meeting as a graduate of Douglas County Schools, the daughter of two retired employees of the district, a Gold Star wife, a parent of a young child who chose to enroll her son in another district after watching in horror as this place I care deeply about lost its moral compass. As an educator who believes that in order to be excellent, you must first center equity. You see, I'm one of the many students of color who this district failed. I'm lucky I found success anyway because my parents knew better than to accept when my counselor at Ponderosa High School told me to reevaluate my college plans because students like me don't typically do well at Ivy League universities. I'm the exception to, this, to many students in my position because my parents stepped in. It only takes a few minutes on the Colorado Department of Education website to find that DCSD is failing its students who are anything other than typically developing white and from economically stable backgrounds. You see, picture this. I'm a student standing in a room with three students who are all hurt. One has a broken arm, one has a nosebleed, one has a scraped knee. I hand all three Band-Aids. 
One has received what they need, two have not. I have treated all three equally, but certainly not equitably. Why was this board so quick to throw away a policy of educational equity without even understanding what equity means? Alas, it seems to be this board's MO to move quickly out of fear. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Michael Dubrovich, Kathleen Boyer, Petrina Gorney. Mr. Dubrovich, are you online? Try it now. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Go ahead. Oh, good. Thank you. My name is Mike Dubrovich. I've been a resident of Douglas County for the past 37 years. I served as an elementary principal in the district from 1985 to 2004, and I've had four kids go through Douglas County schools, and now my grandkids are enrolled here. It's pretty obvious to me that uh, the four of you conspired with each other by contacting American Academy Director Aaron Kane about becoming our next superintendent before you fired Corey Wise for no good reason. Which makes me wonder, was Ms. Kane in on your plan from the beginning? I mean, after all, she did contribute money to your election campaign. Uh, but now that the cat is out of the bag about what you've been up to behind the backs of your fellow directors, you need to consider your options. First, you could go ahead and appoint Ms. Kane to the position and acknowledge what everybody already knows. The game was rigged from the beginning. Or you could not hire Ms. Kane, just throw her under the bus to save your own skins and say it was all just a big misunderstanding. But that wouldn't sit very well with all your dark money campaign contributors who paid thousands of dollars for your many TV commercials. Or you could simply do the honorable thing and resign. You've left your mark on this school district it isn't pretty, and you've harmed a lot of people. My advice is to leave now before you hire, before you harm any more. Thank you, Mr. Dubrovich. <laughs> Kathleen Boyer, Katrina Gorney, followed by Chad Cox. Ms. Boyer, are you online? I am. Go ahead. Board directors, my name is Kathleen Boyer. I'm from Highlands Ranch, and I've had students in DCSD since 2009 which incidentally is long enough that they didn't learn cursive under the previous reform board. I'm also the daughter and sister of lifelong teachers. I'm here today to join previous commenters and ask directors Peterson, Williams, Myers, and Weiniger to resign. You've created chaos and mistrust in the community and among employees and have cost the district money in the short time that you've been in office. If you leave now, you will save the district and the community the cost of a recall and the cost of your future mistakes. Your clear and repeated ignorance of policy and best practices have alienated and angered both your supporters and the community members who supported and worked for the last bond and MLO. I knocked on doors and talked to voters the last time around to convince them that this district was way overdue and in need of those funds. This time, I am not inclined to help with this effort. I don't trust your motives, and you seem unable and unwilling to explain the new direction for the district you speak of. There is almost no chance a bond or MLO will pass with you in charge. Do what's best for the students and the teachers and the whole community and resign now. It is the only way to begin healing and the only chance we have of passing a bond and MLO. Thank you, Ms. Boyer, Petrina Gorney, Chad Cox, Morgan O'Hara. It's Petrina Gorney online. Yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. I'd like to start by saying how sad it is that our teachers and school leaders must speak out at this forum because they feel unheard by the board majority. They are the heart and soul of this district and deserve better. Instead, it appears that the majority board would rather drag us into a national movement to dismantle public education that seeks to oppose equity and diversity, revise history, champion parent choice, and ban curriculum they do not like. Attacking unions is another part of this national agenda, and we have seen the majority board demonize teachers, fire a beloved lifelong educator, and seek to put in a superintendent who has zero teaching experience and, of course, aligns with extreme far-right national agenda items like arming teachers and considering recent exposed text messages has questionable ethics. The scariest part of this national agenda is the lack of care for local communities and families. While the individuals leading this charge do not have children in this system, they are only concerned with defunding public education to lower their taxes, so much so that they are willing to donate large sums of money for school board races, just like we saw here. 
The chaos being created and dishonest actions of the board majority beg the question, who are you taking these actions for? The thousands of hardworking Douglas County families or a few wealthy donors with ties to a national political movement. We do not need to be part of this national drama. I echo the calls by the others for the four majority board members to resign because while the pockets of your donors may be deep, the resources of this district are not. And our students cannot afford to be pawns in a national political agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gorney, Chad Cox, Morgan O'Hara, Robin Miller. Chad Cox. Hello, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Great, now I ask that you actually listen, pay attention. On February 3rd, Douglas County staff, teachers, and parents, such as myself, participated in a collective action in direct response to the abhorrent resolutions that you passed on the equity policy, on the equity policy which has now made it weak to the pre-existing policy, as well as the pathetic display by the four majority in the senseless, senseless firing of Corey Wise. Some board members in the majority stated after the collective action that they wanted to move forward and unite, yet in response, they go to locals, local and national right-wing media to villainize those teachers and their union. Some some directors in the majority, even using incendiary verbiage towards those actions of union, saying that they are holding the, quote, children hostage. This is not the language of people that want to unite, but rather further divide. Earlier this month, supporters of the board majority chose to place flyers on the cars of teachers around the district, calling them bad and telling them to leave and get out. Additionally, a Cora was pulled on those teachers for the day that they had called out sick. That led to a discriminatory and vile act. That same day, I took lunch to my children's school to show support for the teachers. Thank you, Mr. Cox, Morgan O'Hara, Robin Miller, Casey Nice. Morgan O'Hara, are you online? I am. Okay, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, um, Director Peterson, you clearly stated you spoke with Aaron Kane weeks before you spoke to the rest of your board and you made your intentions clear when you changed your tune as to where the job would be posted. People like to say that everyone is simply listening to narratives or other people, but many of us are simply watching and listening to you and drawing conclusions, conclusions about the right here and conclusions about the right now. As a parent, especially one of children with IEPs, I implore you to reconsider the apparent agreement you privately made with the person who donated to your campaign, who you spoke to before you began this process, and more importantly, who doesn't have an education degree or history of teaching and who is known to prefer, prefer private education. If you believe in the concept of trust, please grasp how this defies it. Public education is vital to our communities, especially for those with extra needs that private schools cannot meet and aren't required to meet. I say this as a parent who started my child in a charter school. I'm not against them, but we need to be honest about the differences. Fellow parents, I ask you this, what are our children and our education worth? having the last word on masks that aren't required anymore, winning this fight among adults, pledging our allegiance to the school board and their campaigns, or trading their education for people who want to move towards education for profit. Our kids have endured so much, and I hope we ask ourselves more than what party or group we have allegiance to if we are going to sit by and watch the loss of our amazing teachers and a continually divided community. That is already in the works, and it's because too many of us are not paying attention to what we're really voting for. We have to pay attention to what we're really voting for. Thank you. We have Robin Miller, Casey Nice, followed by Laura Wolf. Robin Miller, are you online? Yes, I am. We can hear you. Uh, Go thank ahead. you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you all over Zoom. Directors Myers, Peterson, Williams, and Weiniger, are you listening to the speakers that have come before you this evening with the words such as chaos, trauma, hypocrites, unethical, and resignation. I certainly hope that your conscience are rattled to the core. Director Peterson, you are a VP of Innovation at Spartan TP, and on your website in multiple instances, it is quoted as saying people deserve to work where they feel energized, valued, appreciated, and able to make a difference. Please follow these words while you are in this position, whether you choose to resign whether there's a recall 
or you are you remain in your position for the term. For those who feel the abundant privilege and power of your newly elected uh, roles, I implore you to do better. You've caused this chaos and trauma in our district, and you are only listening to those who support you. Your Facebook page, the Kids First page, should be shut down. You are no longer campaigning, and that page reflects only four opinions out of the seven. It is toxic to our community. Your choices have consequences that are negatively resonating throughout our community. Do not continue to bring politics, much less guns, and ed un uh, qualified professionals into our schools. Please listen and please act with your consciences rather than your donor's paycheck. Thank you. We have Casey Nice, Laura Wolf, and Amber Alvarado. Casey Nice. Thank you. Can you hear me? You can. Go ahead. Good evening, board members. I have a few comments and questions. I'd like to state for the record that Corey Wise took an interim position at Jeffco through June. He has not moved on. Firing anyone abruptly would require them to seek insurance benefits for their family quickly. I know Corey Wise has a desire to work for the best of the students and the teachers to make a difference for the better. Even after everything that has gone on, he still cares for us. You have canceled retreats. You have had refusals to get on the same page. Please take the time that is necessary to do so. The petition to not fire Corey Wise had 8,000 signatures before you, were, you fired him and you did it anyway. You have proven time and time again you will not listen. Your goal is to divide us more, not to unite us. If you have any hope of winning anyone's respect in this community, this decision needs to go slow. There has already been open conflict of interest with Erin King. Why are we even considering her? And also, is it true that you took out an insurance policy was it this month? Was it to protect these lawsuits? Why was it not taken out when you first took your role? It is evidently clear to most that are listening that you have a plan, and yet your end goal has never been revealed to us. It feels as though you are purposely trying to drive our school district into the ground, and that you can completely want to control Douglas County with only charter schools. While charter schools are not bad, they are not for everyone. Parker is already saturated with charter schools. They have 33 already in our district. Thank you, Ms. Nice, Laura Wolf, Amber Alvarado, and Kimberly Cleaver. Laura Wolf, are you online? Yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. President Directors, your priority should be to create an environment that meets each student where they are at academically and to raise the bar for them without any obstacles. Under the previous leadership, there is an equity policy passed which reflects a general diversity policy and looks great on paper, but as it was rolled out, it took on a life of its own. It gave the activist teachers permission to teach our kids their political biases versus core academics and to shame the kids for having an opposing belief. As a result, the mismanagement, as a result of the mismanagement of equity policy and the lack of in-person learning, I transferred my kids out of the DCS scene and enrolled them in the private schools where they are finally getting caught up on core academics. I commend President Peterson, Directors Williams, Myers, and Weingar for gracefully standing their ground and acting like the leaders who majority of our community voted for. The lack of leadership from President Ray led the district to lose 3,000 students last year. At a time when our students needed stability and a quality education, the district failed them. The kids are behind. I'm asking for Directors Hanson, Meeks, and Ray to lead by example and accept that your former colleagues lost the election. Further, to lead their followers to acknowledge this loss and to stop generating this unnecessary drama that is a distraction to our students, teachers, and community. Keep this up and the MLO will never pass. Is your political gain worth it? The community voted last November, we voted for change. It's not too late to redeem yourselves. Do it for the teachers and the students, not the politics. Stop being an obstacle to good education for our kids and pay raises. Thank you, Ms. Wolf, Amber Alvarado, Kimberly Cleaver, Marianne Omar. Amber Alvarado is not online, sir. Okay, Kimberly Cleaver, Marianne Omer, followed by Ursula Kakos. Kimberly, Good evening. We can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to address the board. Last week, I spoke about the importance of leadership that is vulnerable, value-driven, includes trust, and is resilient. These qualities build stability. Stability was given as a reason for hiring a new superintendent in a quick timeline. Multiple directives 
directors listed this as their primary reason for the quick process. How will choosing a superintendent without the voice of the community, parents, students, teachers, and staff lead to stability? I do note that there is room for this in the current process stated by the board, but having participated in the previous two searches, it seems implausible to accomplish this with fidelity in such a short time frame. If the board truly is looking for a stability, you will need to create a process that honors the voices of the community, parents, students, teachers, and staff. You have the ability to change the process at any time, as you wrote it. If you truly want what is best for the district and students, you will take the time to hire a superintendent with a thoughtful and well-planned process, which includes the voices of all stakeholders. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Marianne Olmar, Ursula Kakos, followed by Karen Pennington. Ms. Olmar. Hello. Go ahead, we Hello? can hear you. Hello? Ms. Ulmer, can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Okay, good evening school board members. These last few board meetings seem to be a gathering of people for a funeral. This is a business and we need to move on with the business of education to find a new superintendent and not wait around for a mourning period. According to one of the board members, it was going to have a devastating effect when the board lifted the mask mandate. Show me the devastating effect it has had. The only effect I see is kids smiling, not having to yell at each other to be heard, and happier kids. Do the jobs you were appointed to and stop trying to divide us. Pick a new superintendent. Corey Weiss is not the only person capable of doing this job. You may be unhappy with the decision, but being dramatic and saying this will be devastating and destroy Douglas County School District is irresponsible. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will have Ursula Kakos, Karen Pennington, and then come back to Marie Cranston. Ursula Kakos. Hello, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. What is school for? The ability to debate across differences where we won't reduce children to individual immutable characteristics. Instead, treat each student as an individual human being with great capacity to achieve. A fundamental issue facing our school children is less than 40% are reading at grade level. Equity, diversity, and inclusion have nothing to do with improving the outcome of academic achievement for our children. It pushes children to be political activists. We need to empower curricula that rigorous, that is rigorous in nature, a pro-human approach to schooling. Curriculum seems nearly to revel in the bad and the broken, suggesting to children that they have suffered a great misfortune to have been born into a country that is racist to its core, whose founding documents are lies, and where democracy is hanging on by a thread. A few short years away from climate catastrophe, certain to render the world a burned out, broken husk. Counting on them for deliverance from problems grownups have created, overwhelmed young people paralyzed into learned helplessness. Suicide attempts have grown by 31% in 2020. Teachers are not therapists, social activists, or church leaders, they are educators. Please leave politics out of education. Majority board members, Please stand strong for our children. Thank you, Ms. Kakos. We have Karen Pennington, followed by Marie Cranston, then Kara Clark. Ms. Pennington, are you online? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Go ahead. All right. I'm Dr. Karen Pennington, a nurse educator. I live in Parker. I have three grandchildren in the district. I'm commenting tonight on the recent media frenzy of demonstrations, sick calls, etc., in response to the exit of Corey Weiss. The majority of Douglas County voters have spoken in the election. The new board is a good thing, a good diversity of thought. We do totally respect diversity of thought, don't we? 
We want education that teaches our students how to think, not what to think. Equity education was vague and open to stereotyping children into groupings. Racism of this kind only recognizes the benefit to the collective, aiming at mediocrity, control of thought, and is a Marxist ideology. I want to thank all seven of you for your service. Now put kids first and get back to educating our children to think critically, respecting all points of views, all races, genders, religions, etc. The resolution honors our country, our constitution, our families, our children. Now implement the resolution as you were given the opportunity. Identify and eliminate tenets of critical race theory and curriculum, get back to basics, ensure life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for our children. I support the entire board. Now let's get back to work. Thank you for time to present my comments. Thank you, Ms. Pennington, Marie Cranston, Kara Clark, then Kirsten Gardner. Marie Cranston, are you online now? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Thank you. Director Peterson, you frequently said, I'm committed to restoring peace and unity to our school district. I agree, but it's time to take some real actions. Here are three things you can do now. Number one, drop the conservative rhetoric in your messaging and denounce your ties with political groups. Statements on KOA like, we understand there's a difference between our awesome teachers and union operatives is an attack on teachers, not a healthy and respectful debate about policy. You didn't put those flyers on those teachers' cars, but your words embolden your supporters to take those verbal attacks further. Interesting shirts, by the way, today. Move forward and advance unity by separating yourself from the conservative organizations that funded your campaign. This is a nonpartisan board. You represent this community, not politically driven groups. Number two, engage with the parent community, not your, just your voting base. We respect that you won a fair and open election. Let's keep in mind though that only 17% of Douglas County residents voted for the four new board members. And most of those voters do not represent the parent community. If you truly care about parent input, commission a third party survey to all parents and guardians so that you can confidently say you understand the views of this community, not just the people who voted you in. Number three, share your direction and vision for this district, a board that cannot state a clear and concrete vision with more than just campaign slogans cannot lead. Thousands of students and parents are looking to you for responsible, accountable leadership. You have the chance to right the ship and make ethical decisions. Start now. Thank you. Kara Clark. Kirsten Garner, Jennifer Lehman, Kara Clark. Hi, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Good evening. I'm a single mom of four kids. One graduate, two left the district for the lack of their needs being met, so I'm fighting for my youngest. First off, thank you, Peterson, Myers, Winnegar, and Williams for your dedication to our children. I appreciate that you are here advocating for our district and community and persevering in such a toxic environment. In the November election, Douglas County vo voted in four new board members. A record number of people voted in an off year, and the win was by a significant margin. And while I could throw out those numbers, the point is the majority of this county has some serious issues with how the previous board conducted business and the direction the they were taking our district. So we asked for change, specifically a focus on closing the wage gap for our beloved teachers that the previous board failed to do. Refocus on core academics, inclusion of all students' needs, not just to select few, and parents' rights to be involved in their children's education, just to name a few. The district works for us. The board was elected to carry out our will for our children. The superintendent serves the board. When he doesn't serve the board in a way that there is a lack of trust and support, it is appropriate to find a replacement. And I support our board finding a superintendent quickly so that the district can focus on bringing up academic excellence that we claim to have. I'm hearing a lot of whining from the minority, reacting with only emotion, lack of true facts, and tons of assumptions. The whining has turned into ugly name calling, the spreading of misinformation. Thank you, Ms. Clark, Kirsten Garner, Jennifer Lehman, followed by Calista Braga. Kirsten Garner. Hello, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. 
Good evening. Thank you to the new board members for stepping up and doing such a great job in the hardest of times. Do not bow down to the calls to resign. You have many backing you up. The chaos was happening before you got on the board. Mental health is a huge concern. One of my children has been constantly bullied and no matter what the administration has done, it hasn't helped. And once those bullies were confronted along with their parents, it has created the bullying issue to intensify. They feel that it's pointless to go to the teachers as some have wanted to ignore it and sometimes condone the bullying behavior. I do not feel all parents, teachers, and board members understand the gravity of their own actions and words that have on our children. Ray, Hanson, and Meeks, over the past month, you've pointed fingers and have been verbally abusive to the other four. How can anyone expect your supporters, parents, teachers, and even our children to act any different? Your negative actions and abusive words have fooled your supporters, teachers, and students that it is okay. It is not okay. I expect all of you to hold each other accountable and not allow that kind of behavior from yourselves. If you cannot adhere to being kind and finding a way to get your point across kindly, then I will ask you to step down now. And if you decide to stay but still cannot fix yourselves, then I will make my voice louder for you to leave. No one should have to put up with abuse, and you are not one to represent our school teachers, administration, and students, my children. Do what is right and let's find a way to help our ch children with mental health, academic excellence, and securing their futures. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. Jennifer Lehman, Callista Braga, followed by Emily uh, Gutino. Ms. Lehman. Hi, can you guys hear me? We can, go ahead. All right, hi, my name is Jennifer Lehman and I'm a mother of two younger children in Douglas County a Douglas County graduate and a Douglas County native. I am absolutely terrified of public speaking. So this is 120% out of my comfort zone. I am tired, disheartened, but this mama bear is determined. I have sent many emails out to every member of the board, but have yet to have a single response to any of them from Meek, Ray, or Hanson. How does this build community or transparency? And Hanson isn't, quote, that is part of the job, end quote, as you told Myers, and according to the 2015 Ray, that feedback is what is needed and requested by the board. What happened to that? I have been quiet until now, but mark my words, I am not going anywhere. This mama bear is done. I want and need change in order for our district to be what it can and needs to be. In order to hold you accountable, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire so you better hang on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lehman, Callista. Braga, Emily Gugtino, and Tara Cole. Ms. Braga, are you me. online? Yep, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. As four people who ran on the platform of transparency and kids first, it amazes me how far you've strayed from that so quickly. One, knocking down any public comment to only 90 seconds or not allowing it at all is appalling to me, especially when it comes to hiring the person in charge of running our children's schools. Two, yes, you hold the majority, but that majority is for the voices of the whole district. How do you expect to speak for that if you are choosing not to hear it? Many I've talked to voted for you and are also appalled by the recent events, so I suggest you start talking to the people in this district instead of your outside puppet masters. If you truly believe you speak for the majority of district-wide parents, then why not find support for that by talking to us? What would it hurt? Unless, of course, you know that isn't the case, and instead you're trying to ram your agenda through no actual input from anyone in the area. Three, I guess you're no different than the majority of other politicians and money talks, particularly the amount of money sent to your campaigns from the outside the district, except, of course, from Aaron Kane, the person you plan to hire for this farce of a superintendent posting. To the minority three, Corey Weiss and our amazing teachers and staff, I'm sorry. We fought this fight with reformers a few years ago. This is already far, far worse, and I don't blame you if you need to walk away. I'm in disbelief of how much our district has become a pawn in the conservative political game. Although Fox News, George Brockler, and Mandy Mon are enjoying this, the rest of us are not. For the amount of interviews done, I've still not seen one reason given for Weiss's firing. My kids aren't here to be used by you or Erin Kane. If she's accidentally texting pictures and threats now. Thank you. We have Emily Gugtino, Tara Cole, followed by Constance Ingram. Ms. Gugtino. Okay, Tara Cole, Constance Ingram, followed by Jessica Metzler. Ms. Cole, are you online? She is online, and she's unmuted. Ms. Cole, can you hear us? Okay. 
Okay, we'll move to Constance Ingram, Jessica Metzler, followed by Carrie Street. Good evening. Go ahead. I am speaking on behalf of a professional educator tonight. I'm a career educator with my last 15 years putting my heart and soul into the children of DCSD. I'm saddened to feel that I have to anonymously share my thoughts tonight for fear of retaliation. Board majority, you say you are a pro teacher, but your actions speak louder than your words. The last few weeks have catapulted my longtime colleagues and myself straight back to the reformer years. None of us trust that by speaking out against your extreme political agenda, we won't be escorted out of our schools by security and told we no longer have jobs. I see social media posts bashing teachers for participating in the sick out earlier this month. In fact, we had your kids at the heart of our decision to participate in the sick out. We are incredibly concerned about the future of our neighborhood schools. We are discouraged that we have not heard from the board directors, not even once, to talk about why so many of us walked out, except to hear that we must have been brainwashed by the union. I find that highly insulting. I don't need a union to tell me that a lack of integrity, shady backroom dealings, horrible treatment of others, and radicalized political agendas have no place in DCSD. Why haven't we seen the board majority reach out to us, staff? Aren't we the ones keeping this entire district afloat? A board member made a comment that she would like to visit one school a week. Wow, that really sends the message that you are invested in us. Another director said this job was harder than she anticipated. Really? Tell that to a teacher whom you've taken no time to ask about the direction of the district. When you fire a career district employee without cause after the three pro 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 Thank you, Ms. Ingram, Jessica Metzler, Perry Street, followed by Paula Lucas. Ms. Metzler, are you online? Yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the time. It is important to all constituents that we feel heard and all opinions are weighed when making decisions. I am disappointed that the four new elected board members are not listening to the voices of concerns coming from teachers, students, and families. It is important to represent a broad spectrum of views, not just a specific group. It is frustrating to watch board meeting after board meeting where many Douglas County residents express concern, and then an hour later decisions are being made that ignore these decisions. Why are we rushing to find a superintendent? Why are we not listening con to constituents, students, teachers, and administrators? I implore you to pause and consider all views and how to bring this divisiveness to an end. One step that you can take to turn things around is to pause and listen. Secondly, I wanted to express my disappointment in the newly elected board members and their connection to the attacks on teachers. You blame the teachers union for causing unrest. A labor union is defined as an organized association of workers who form to protect their interests. When teachers organize, they organize to improve conditions for fellow educators and their students. You are blaming teachers who speak up for, for the unrest instead of analyzing the role of your own actions. It is easy to blame a union when you don't understand education and have no background in education. Instead of blaming educators for academic concerns and not putting kids first, inform yourselves on actual issues affecting classrooms, such as equity gaps, a rigorous curriculum, large classes. Thank you, Ms. Metzler. Carrie Street, Paula Lucas, followed by Jana Hutton. Carrie Street. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Uh, piggybacking off what someone else was saying earlier, I'd like to direct most of my comments to Mr. Ray um, and the rest of the minority board. You would think by looking back at your 2015 comments, you would be proud of the new board that you are a part of. This new board did hold the superintendent accountable and they are representing the values of the surrounding community. After all, in 2015, you were in support of these things, but sadly it seems you are only in support of them if they are aligned with your vision. I sat here through these meetings last year as parent after parent begged you to listen to them and you ignored them. It's so comical to me that your supporters now are complaining about the very thing that you did to us. It's no wonder that you lost control of the, major of, of the board majority because in November, the parents spoke and you were forced to listen. Almost 30% more voters showed up to tell you that the values of the surrounding community no longer paralleled the, val the values with which you were guiding your board. And now the tables have turned, you have res resorted to be a part of the very confusion, distrust, and division that you spoke of in 2015. 
If you detest this division so much and care for a unified community, why weren't you telling your supporters to stop advertising the hateful shirts with Becky Meyer's face plastered all over them? Why are you not telling your supporters to act like respectful adults instead of petulant children dressed up in handmaid's tail costumes mocking the no new board members? your counterparts. Director Ray, I implore, implore you to realize that you have deviated from the path you were once on. It seems your motives are no longer in the best interest of this district. And I ask you to again- Thank you, Ms. Street. Paula Lucas, Jana Hutton, Tammy Overracker. Ms. Lucas, are you online? I am, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. All right, my name is Paula Lucas. I'm a parent to a DCSD student and a former DCS teacher. Due to the climate and culture that the new board members have brought to our district, many staff members are not comfortable reading their own comments. Tonight, I will be reading a comment from a, a, from a teacher. Now that you are elected officials, you represent all DCSD community members, parents and staff, not just people who voted for you. You have taken the wind out of the sails of your staff. You have brought more politics into our district than ever before. You are fostering an environment of hate. Please stop. Take a look around. Listen to the educational professionals. Lean into the amazing committees you have at your fingertips. Equity policies and superintendent hirings are big decisions and you should not take an easy, the easy way out. Please slow down, learn, lead with collaboration. Please make our school district a place where all can be, that we can all be proud of. Sincerely, a DCS staff member and parent of DCS student. Thank you. Thank you, Jana Hutton, Tammy Overacker, Corey Daspit. Ms. Hutton, are you online? I am. Go ahead. Uh, these, these are not my uh, personal comments. I'm reading them on behalf of uh, another educator, a veteran educator. She writes, I'm a teacher with 30 years of experience, 25 of them in Douglas County Schools. My comments are directed to the board majority. Please stop telling teachers that you are grateful for the work we do. Please stop telling teachers that you appreciate us or that you hear us. Those are empty words. Your actions tell a completely different story. It is clear from your actions that you aren't grateful don't appreciate or hear us. Stop blaming unions for the ills of society. That's a red herring fallacy. Stop telling us that the voters support you in your actions. Even 10th grade students understand that a little over 50% of the people who voted is not a majority. Stop the charade, stop the lies, stop the disingenuous behavior. Our district, our teachers, our students are not an opportunity for your political experiment. Please stop. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy Overacker, Corey Daspit, followed by Lenore uh, Odekirk. Ms. Overacker, are you online? Ms. Overacker. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Tammy Overacker, and I'm a parent in DCSD. And thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I have always taught my students that being a citizen of the United States requires personal responsibility, and that our local boards, elected officials, and street level bureaucrats are only as good as it is a participation. Tonight, I am not teaching, but I am doing. I am acting as an engaged, responsible citizen of Douglas County. It is my duty to call attention to the continued unethical behaviors of members of this board, particularly in regards to the dismissal of Corey Wise. This afternoon, I had the opportunity to listen to the published audio recordings of the phone conversations between Directors Meek, Ray, Williams, and Peterson. It was truly disturbing to hear Directors Williams and Peterson stumble through their explanation of the unethical actions in which they were engaged in regards to the resign or fire meeting with Corey Wise. Director Peterson, Peterson, you should absolutely have your ethics questioned. And I applaud Director Meek and her commitment of being a responsible citizen and bringing to light the unbecoming behavior of an elected official. Director Williams, you had an opportunity to put to rest unethical behavior by simply stating evidence of the alleged actions going on behind your back. Director Williams, why wouldn't you or Directors Winnegar, Myers, or Peterson provide the exact information that would demonstrate your concerns about Mr. Wise? 
Perhaps we will find out in the volumes of information being requested by Mr. Wise's legal team. In closing, I'm very grateful for the minority board members and their willingness to bring light to such a dark corner. During the special meeting on February 18th, the public commenter mentioned former President Nixon. As I recall, it was tapes that led to his resignation. Thank you, Mr. Overacker. Uh, Ms. Overacker, we have Corey Daspit, Lenore Odekirk, followed by Tara Cole. Mr. Daspit, are you online? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Go ahead. My name is Corey Daspit. I'm a 16-year Parker resident with four kids attending DCSD schools. The following public comment is from an anonymous DCSD teacher. Bring back boring. That was the campaign slogan of the four new board members. However, it certainly has not been boring these last few weeks. In fact, the words I might use to describe these past weeks are chaos, mistrust, and incompetence. If the school board majority really wanted to work together for the betterment of the whole community, not just for those who voted for them, maybe they would deliver some of that boring they promised. Well, I can only assume that boring will not descend upon our community anytime soon. Here are some hopes that I do have. I hope that Director Myers realizes how much she has alienated herself from the teachers in this district. She claims to be one of our peeps, but makes decisions that negatively affect teachers in our district. I hope that Director Winnegar realizes that she must be able as an elected official to work with people who didn't vote for her. She will not win loyalty and trust from anyone that with that attitude. I hope that Director Williams realizes that all DCSD schools are important, not just the charters she chooses to send her, her, her children to. I hope that Director Peterson realizes that the, the Diaz is not his Naval Command Center and that he can't be the wannabe admiral making decisions from the secrecy of the bridge and then expect teachers to follow in line. I also hope he realizes there's a conflict of interest in hiring someone as a new superintendent who's shown to have donated to the majority's campaign. I hope that directors Meek, Hanson, and Ray realize how much we need them to keep fighting for the DSC, DCSD and to continue bringing truth to life. Thank you, Mr. Daspit, Lenore Oatkirk, Tara Cole, followed by Pam uh, Shinehin. <laughs> Go with Shine and Nost, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Lenore Odekirk, are you on there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Good evening. My name is Lenore Odekirk, and I am the parent of a former DCSD student as well as a current DCSD middle schooler. It is my hope that you will hear what I have to say as a concerned citizen, but mostly as a concerned parent. I have read the job listing for the new superintendent, and I was shocked at how low the bar is set for this incredibly important position. The only requirements are a master's degree in any field and some experience in education, presumably administration, although the job description does not say that. Why are we not requiring a doctorate degree, or at the very least a degree in education or educational administration? I have a master's degree in music, and while my education was rigorous and enlightening, it in no way prepared me to run a school district of 65,000 students and over 4,000 employees. How can we talk about academic Academic excellence for our students if we don't demand it for their superintendent? How can teachers be expected to respect and support someone with less education and experience than many of them have? Another requirement is to understand the culture, the current climate, the board's ends and vision, and the district's mission. The board has stated that the district needs to move in a new direction, but I have yet to see that direction articulated. How can we hire a superintendent who understands the board's vision when the board has not stated what that vision is? I'm also concerned about the timeline. Two weeks is not enough time to gather a diverse pool of candidates, review their resumes, and become familiar with their work history. We need a superintendent who is willing to make the best decision for the students and the staff, even if those decisions are unpopular with the board or parents. I urge you to take the time needed to truly find the best candidate for this very important job. Thank you. Thank you. We will have Tara Cole, the next speaker, withdrew. So Tara Cole, followed by Susan McKenzie, and then Tracy Jones. Ms. Cole, are you now online? Ms. Cole. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> I walked so many blocks around my neighborhood with my kids and other parents handing out flyers for the kids' first campaign because we were so sick of the endless divisive messages from the former superintendent, a superintendent that used intimidation to personally report charter schools to Tri-County Health. According to his calendar, he continued to meet with Tri-County Health weekly, even though Douglas County created their own health department after listening to the public, a health department that the old board promptly sued using district funds, although there was no public comment on that. 
The endless lawsuits the minority board is encouraging from your most staunch supporters waste time and money that would be much better spent on academics and teacher compensation. And the online discourse of those supporters is mean and misogynistic. The sole focus of the minority board appears to be to try to overturn the results of the election through fake outrage in Corey's name. It's laughable that kids who spent the last two years masked and isolated would ever want to go back to what you had to offer. You need to be focused on getting a great superintendent as soon as possible. The last two that you selected through long and expensive searches did not deliver. May I suggest a woman, perhaps, maybe one who has already acted as interim superintendent for two years and is currently leading a very successful public charter program? A woman that campaigned with teachers to get the last bond pass? Or would that be too equitable and efficient to fit the narrative? It's time for you to support the duly elected majority board to get the kids and teachers back to the business of education. Thank you, Ms. Cole, Suzanne McKenzie, Tracy Jones, Joseph Rocco. Susan McKenzie, are you online? Ms. McKenzie, can you hear us? Okay, we'll move on to Tracy Jones, Joseph Rocco, followed by Matt Cassidy. Ms. Jones, are you online? Yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Thank you. As a parent, I'm asking that you please listen to our teachers regarding involvement in, in decision-making, especially with our new superintendent. Our teachers make up our children's community. They are there for them at least five out of seven days a week. They push them to succeed academically, and they look after them in social interactions. I consider my kids' teachers as my friends. I lean on them for support, and they look to me for help when needed. It is a reciprocal relationship that has been built over years. It's beneficial for these children to have that stability, and that is what these good teachers bring to the table. Please don't run them away because you haven't had the decency to ask them for their voice in these matters. You all have your own jobs to go to during the day, but these decisions are practically our teachers' lives and livelihoods. They care about our children as, as is evidenced by them standing up for what is right and not having left yet. There are millions of jobs out there right now and most probably pay much more than teachers' salaries do. So no, they haven't given up on our kids. The weight of the world is on their shoulders right now and this superintendent position could make or break these communities. Please give it the essential amount of time to make right choice when seeking the best candidate for superintendent. Please reassess your timeline. We all listened last week and realized that exceptions for the job posting were being made in an effort to hire someone that the majority board already has in mind. Parents and teachers are not dumb, and we can see straight through all of it. So please put your political agendas away and make the right decision and act with integrity. This is not just a superintendent for the board majority, but for Douglas County public school community. To the board majority, I ask that you address these comments and concerns. Thank you, Ms. Jones, Joseph Rocco, Matt Cassidy, followed by Lori Gu uh, Guasta. Joseph Rocco is not online, sir. Okay, Matt Cassidy, Lori Guasta, followed by Christina Courtney. Mr. Cassidy, are you online? Good afternoon, or good evening, directors. Can you hear me? We can, go ahead. I wanted to thank you all for your continued service. It seems overwhelming to sit up there and take the vitriol and personal attacks from all angles. I appreciate you taking the time to hear from each individual willing to speak up at this meeting. I wanna remind you that despite their claims, no one you've heard from or will hear from speaks for an entire group. You've heard from people with wildly varying perspectives and many have made some great points throughout the night, but they've also impugned and attacked you personally. I applaud all of you for refusing to shy away from it and for continuing to show up. Your dedication and courage is admirable. I want to applaud you as a board, not as a minority or a majority, not as conservatives or liberals, the Douglas County Board of Education. Thank you again for hearing each of us tonight. Remember that no person who spoke here tonight represents anyone other than themselves. Each individual had an opportunity to weigh in at the ballot box in November. And if there's one group you have to hear, it was that one. The Douglas County Board of Education received the will of the people in November. The will of the people told the Douglas County Board of Education to change the direction of this district. The Douglas County Board of Education is delivering. Thank you and keep going. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy, Lori Guasta, followed by Christina Courtney. Ms. Guasta, are you online? 
Yep, I sure am. I'm uh, Lori Guasta. I have a PhD in, in organizational leadership. I do the same type of consulting that Mike Peterson does. But I'm speaking tonight as a mother of four elementary school kids that go to a neighborhood public school. The recent actions of the board have had a direct and negative impact on the performance of teachers first. If teachers aren't properly supported and enabled to do their job well, our students will suffer, our schools will suffer, and ultimately our community is suffering. Public education is a cornerstone of a healthy democracy and every healthy community. The four new members that are here, they, they you, you campaigned under this slogan, Kids First. In just three months, you've betrayed the kids you promised to prioritize. Politics first should have been your slogan. The partisan actions you've demonstrated have shown the need for increased participation in local government and elections because our, com our, our community is the target right now of an extremist agenda that aims to undermine the strength of our public schools. Our community will hold you elected officials accountable. Uh, Mike Peterson, tongue, as you like to be called, your actions, I know you don't want to hear it from your colleagues, but your actions are unethical and antithetical to good leadership. I call on all of you to abandon partisan politics and serve the whole district with integrity. Please do better. Thank you, Ms. Guasta. Christina Courtney will be the last speaker for this evening. Is Ms. Courtney online? Hi, can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. I read an article today in the Douglas County News Press that gives a detailed look at the day Corey Wise was asked to step down. The article cites that Aaron Kane accidentally texted a picture of Corey Wise's contract to Corey on the day that the board majority gave him the ultimatum to resign. Questions that come to mind are, why does Aaron Kane have a copy of Corey's contract? Why did she accidentally send a picture of said contract to Corey? This reeks of deceit, collusion, and dishonesty. Last week's public comment and today's included many who feel that the termination of Corey Wise is unjust. The community spoke emphatically about slowing down the superintendent process and building trust. How are we supposed to trust this majority board when they continue to engage in backroom deals? To the majority, if you truly value DCSD staff, students, and the community, many are asking you to think twice about putting someone in the superintendent position who doesn't have experience in the classroom and doesn't uphold the values of public education. In 2015 to 2016, teacher turnover was at 19%, which was when acting interim superintendent Aaron Kane was running the district. It has since gone down to 13%, with the national average being 16%. However, many have stated their intention to resign, leave this district to go to a neighboring district, or retire due to shenanigans by the majority board. It would be a travesty to lose great teachers after so much has gone into rebuilding this great district. If you want to honor students and ta staff, take the time to listen to your community and stop making decisions deeply rooted in political agendas. P.S. You are amazing, David, Susan, and Elizabeth. Don't forget it. Thank you, Ms. Courtney. With that, we will move to item number 10, adoption of the consent agenda. Uh, yes, go ahead. She is? Okay. We will give Ms. McKenzie uh, one more shot. Ms. McKenzie, can you hear us? Can you hear me? We can hear you now, Ms. McKenzie. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for your patience. <clears throat> I live and teach in Douglas County, which means I am a stakeholder in the district. I continue to have many concerns regarding the current direction of the board. First, I would like you to reconsider your timeline for finding a superintendent, as well as considering hiring an interim superintendent. While I agree that the district needs stability, I think you're rushing through the process is creating more instability and yet more division. As you already spoke to Erin Kane prior to firing Corey Wise, it would appear that as she is most likely your top contender. She was interim superintendent for a lengthy period, so why not again? I truly believe choosing somebody to lead the third largest school district in Colorado deserves more of a thorough comprehensive search and one that is strong for the whole district and not the vision of four people, three of which of you have not been in education. I think rushing this will cause more confusion and more distrust. I also am gravely concerned about what direction you want to take the district. You said Corey Wise isn't supportive of your direction, but you have not yet clarified what that direction is. Your elusiveness, as well as your pattern of under the table behavior, 
leaves me suspicious that you already have clear intentions, <clears throat> excuse me, but you're not disclosing them. Lastly, I'd like to know what your intentions are with the equity policy. This was formed by a group of stakeholders. Thank you, Ms. McKenzie. At this time, we'll move on to the adoption of the consent agenda. We're on item number 10, and the uh, consent agenda includes items 11 through 19. Do we have any motions regarding the consent agenda? I would like to uh, remove item number 19, approval of the proposed timeline for DCSD superintendent identification from the consent agenda. Okay, we have a request for removal by Director Hansen. Any other motions concerning items 11 through 18? I'm happy to make a motion to approve the consent agenda um, except for item number 19. Second. We have a motion by Hansen, second by Ray for items, excuse me, 11 through 18. Without discussion, we'll call the roll for approval of consent agenda items 11 through 18. Hansen. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weininger. Aye. Okay, passed seven to zero. Um, we will, uh, with uh, Director Hansen, if we can delay number 19 to the study action items, if that will work for you, to take those up together. Sure. Okay, we will move number, IT, number 19 in with the study action items. We will now move to number 20, approval of minutes, and the recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the board minutes as presented for January 25th. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve the minutes for January 25th. Motion by Ray. Second. Second by Myers. Take the roll. Hansen. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weininger. Aye. Passed 7 to 0 for approval of the minutes. We'll now move into study action items, and we will start with number 19, which was pulled by Director Hansen from the consent agenda, approval of proposed timeline for DCSD superintendent identification. I'm not requesting extensive conversation and discussion about it. I just wanted an opportunity to, um, to voice my to, to be able to vote no, I, I don't think that the proposed timeline is adequate for the um, for the position of superintendent. Okay, thank you for uh, highlighting that. Director Hanson, any other directors? We have Director Meek. Yeah, we heard extensive um, public comment tonight that our community is, honestly, it's more divided than ever. And what we've heard from many are we need to include the voice of our building leaders and include the voice of teachers, include the voice of parents and community members. I think we can talk about that a little bit on the timeline right now and how we are including their voice or see if we need to revise that. So I, I think it'd be really helpful to walk through the timeline a little bit. Um, if we could put it up on the screen, I think that would be helpful. Mr. Blair, if you can do that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blair.
And this was a subject, obviously, of long discussion the other night. So is there any specific questions that any of the directors have about what this timeline is? Can you help me understand where our employees have an opportunity to be engaged in the process? Sure, Mr. Blair, if you'll scroll down. We are on the February 22nd meeting now. Um, the timeline is proposing a special meeting next Tuesday uh, to screen applicants, knowing that the application process is open through this Friday. Uh, as you know, that may or may not occur in executive session that's subject to a board vote. And then based on a screen to determine candidates to interview publicly, uh, the next proposed meeting would be a special meeting on the 3rd where we would conduct finalist interviews in public with public comment and a vote on finalists and then regular meeting on the 8th and continuing time the 10th to have uh, any finalist engage in community forums followed by a series of cabinet panels, all of which would involve community members. Yeah, so maybe elaborating on what that looks like on March 10th would be helpful. Sure, community forum, um, talking with HR and talking with comms that would solicit uh, questions that people would have for any finalist, be able to address those questions, answer them in front of a large crowd uh, and get any feedback uh, from that crowd. There would be a submission of questions and a post form feedback form and then a series of panels as listed there, staff, uh, student, board committees and cabinet panels uh, to also ask a series of questions of any finalist on the 10th, and those would be uh, run and recruited by HR and comms with a submission of anyone that is interested and meets those criteria to be on those panels to join those panels and also bring their questions forward for a finalist. Do you have any other questions, Director Meek? No, I, I kind of want to listen to our conversation sure. a little bit. Go ahead, Director Ray. You have the floor. Thank you. I want to go back to March 1st. Um, my question is that we have on March 1st that we're screening applicants as well as interviewing or, um, screened applicants. Um, I don't know how we do that on one day. And I'll just kind of give you um, a reference to how we did this previously. But it took us three days to, to screen. Um, our search firm was able to bring to us, well, initially 100 applicants were applied for the position. Um, the search firm then gave us about 12 that we actually did a paper screen on. Um, and I would tell you that our experience has been that that took a, a period of time, but to be able to do that and then also expect those applicants to be ready to be interviewed on the same day logistically doesn't make sense to me. Um, we spent some time with the paper screening part to actually develop a rubric to really begin to have some consistency of what we were looking for. So that took a day and then we had two days where we actually then screened, like I said, about 12 of the applicants to determine if we wanted to narrow that down further uh, to finalists. So, that day is not making sense to me for that reason. I just don't think you can do both of those. I don't think you can do a paper screen and screening applicants um, on the same day. Um, I, and I don't know if you, there wants to be a response or discussion, but then on that same day, I think there's, it says may or may not occur in executive session. Screening should happen in executive session. I don't think there should be a choice because if you remember, we want to protect those candidates in terms of those records they submit uh, who are not yet finalists. So I don't believe that that should be an option. If we're screening, we should be in executive session. Um, our screening interviews should also be in executive session. It's not until we identify finalists that we actually come out of executive session and do it, um, do those interviews publicly. Um, and then I guess along the lines of screening, what I'm concerned about is just um, the sufficiency of the recruitment process. And I, I know I've talked about this before. When you have a search firm who actually actively recruits, that's different than us just waiting for someone to submit their resumes and their two letters of, of recommendation. It's, it's really an individual goes out and really 
helps really nudge people that maybe don't know about our position uh, to consider that. But even more importantly, it's about making sure we have um, a diverse pool of candidates. Or, and I would say even um, that our, our candidates should be diverse. You know, one of the things that I think we were really proud of at our last search is that half of our finalists were people of color. Um, so our, our uh, recruiter um, knew that that was important. Um, so he went out and actually recruited, keeping that in mind that we want to make sure that we have people of diversity, people of diverse backgrounds. Um, so that whole screening process is concerning to me that we think we can accomplish that. And I don't know if, if this meeting is to be held in the evening or, or all day, but it seems like a pretty lofty goal to do all those things I just mentioned to you um, in one day. So I'm going to go with each. I'm going to go with each date and just talk through that. But I want to pause there just to get a reaction about that because I and, and I also I should have prefaced this, uh, Director Peterson. I really appreciate uh, the work, <laughs> having done this a couple of times. I know it's, it takes a lot of effort to organize, coordinate, um, and so I'm really sympathetic, um, but I'm also appreciative. Uh, of the uh, additional work that you've had to do to put this together. And it really helped me, and I want to say thank you uh, for not having us approve this right away because when you start seeing it laid out, you start beginning to see maybe some, some gaps that we need to be concerned about. And those are the ones um, that, that I pointed out. Along the lines of recruitment, I guess one other question I have is, have, is has this been posted? Um, other than just in our district, has it been posted in uh, on the CASB job board? Has it been posted on the CASE job board? Um, so that's that was just another outlining question. As yeah, we're if, doing I, this if I can start to work through a couple of these before they yep, uh, sorry, before sorry, they yep. sorry I think before I'm they the March first. I've been trying to keep these. So let me just get the last one. It's been posted uh, on the district uh, workday site. If you go to just the Board right, of Education for anyone list, listening, uh, go to the district website, Board of Education Superintendent Search for those that. Uh, have access to the Workday program. It directs them there. For those who do not have access to the Workday program, it uh, gives them an alternate uh, pathway to do that. It is also posted a case, um, which for those that don't know the acronym, the Colorado Association of School Executives. So these would be folks that were either current superintendents, deputy superintendents, uh, not just listed to super, limited to superintendents, uh, HR professionals, finance, operations, other things like that. So it is going out. Um, to case and, and other outside entities. Regarding the executive session, the reason it says may or may not occur, I agree with you. If we are screening applicants, we would let them know that um, they are to be screened. Ideally, I think we should be doing that in executive session. Unfortunately, as you know, we have to vote to go into executive session, and we need a two-thirds uh, majority vote, which would be five of seven to go into that. I had to prepare for the uh, potential that we would not get that vote and would have to do that screening in public. I don't think that's the great place for a paper screen, but I understand your, your reservations. I personally would prefer to do a uh, paper screen and elimination in executive session. And then finally, walking back to um, the applicants, I understand from Ms. Thompson, uh, just getting some final legal advice from our DCSD council about how to make those uh, applications that come in. And if I understand from earlier today, we have about eight right now. Um, still have an open window through this week, through Friday. Um, but right now, we're sitting on about eight and the uh, after complying with council we should see a director only ability to view the applicants as they come in by folder and I would assume that that screening process starts as each director looks at the resumes and things and should come prepared to that March 1st meeting uh, with an idea of, of where they may individually sit on a paper screen, knowing that we have to do that paper screen as a group of seven. So I, I think I hit all of those, hopefully, but I will. I don't want to speak just for me. Um, on the timeline, uh, I will open it up to any other directors that have any comments or questions on that. And, and just again, for those that did not watch the last meeting, I think we discussed the timeline for well over an hour, and uh, the timeline was out there. Uh, I specifically asked for director comments on the timeline prior to this meeting so we could hopefully address some of these questions. I had none. Um, but with this, uh, I will open it up to any other directors for comments or continued questions on the timeline. Director Myers, you have the floor. 
Uh, yes, while we um, did listen to comment tonight, I will say as the board secretary, I have also had received numerous emails uh, in support of moving forward quickly. So, and I've probably got that information at home. I've been jotting kind of for or uh, against. And with the timeline happening on Tuesday, March 1st, I, I was prepared to go ahead and know that I was gonna have to devote probably plenty of hours towards this screening and possibly a whole day. So I was, I guess I was under the assumption that it was gonna have to take some time and probably a lot of time next week before we actually went to um, the Thursday, March 10th finalist. Other directors that haven't spoken? Director Williams, you have the floor. So um, as we, we did talk about this last, last week in length, um, and I feel like we did talk about the timeline and we actually ended up extending some of the dates. One of the things um, that I liked about this was that from Thursday, March 10th, when they actually do the forum, it also gives another couple weeks before we actually have to, you know, um, make an offer. So I was comfortable with this because it still gave plenty of time for feedback from students, staff, community, and everyone. So I, f I feel good moving forward with this. Director Weiniger, you have the floor. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we can see what kind of applicants we get um, by this Friday and discuss that on Tuesday on what we think we have as far as um, recruiting nationwide and using a recruiter, I understand what you mean. That would be ideal. It just seems like it's failed pretty badly in the past, so why not try this way? Director Ray. So again, I think, and I, and I just want to be apologetic, because you're right, we did spend a lot of time on trying to condense the timeline, but I think when you walk through it, that's where it becomes problematic. So let's, let's just, for example, say that we have, I think Director Peterson said we had eight applicants. Um, and as Director Meyer says, we'll have a direct link and we'll be able to screen those applicants. So we walk in Tuesday, and let's say we've, we have 25 applicants. Um, we talk amongst us and we say, you know what? I think these are the 12 that we feel like best fit our qualifications. Then you have to schedule the interview for the applicants. How does that happen on that same day? Is, is what I, I guess what I'm not, what's not making sense to me logistically. And, and honestly, I'm not trying to, to slow this so far down that it, it's offensive to your timeline, but I, I'm just trying to really look at logistics. Um, logistically, you don't walk in <laughs> on, on, on Tuesday with a whole stack of, of screening, and all of a sudden, to think that we can schedule 12 interviews to screen them, that just doesn't logistically work. Um, and that's, I guess that's my point. And, and I, you know, um, Ms. Weiniger, I, I agree with you, um, you know, in terms of, I don't, I'm not really necessarily advocating for a national search, but I just think it's helpful, even if we're doing this locally, to have someone that really is assisting us with the recruitment process. Because right now, we're at the mercy of whoever happens to look at our website, or I'm pleased to hear that it's on case, but also, uh, Director Peterson, we also use CASB as well, because that's our Colorado Association of School Boards, um, which gives us another opportunity to get it out there. But my concern really is just, if we can just answer the logistical question of how do we screen and then schedule interviews on the same day? I don't think that's possible. Yeah, I think it may be possible, Director Ray, again, if we're, at a small number, again, I think it really comes down to the number of candidates. If we have a small number and we conduct a paper screen and we say there are, you know, hypothetically four, six candidates, we may be able to do it on the same day. We'll know by close of business Friday how many candidates we look at, that we're looking at, how many have applied. And we'll also be able to get a good feel, I think, individually as directors. I can certainly reach out to the individual directors and without doing a paper screen, get an idea of 
how many candidates uh, you know do you think are legitimate candidates? And if the answers are coming back in the the small number range, I think we can get it done. If we have a large number of applicants by Friday, and we think there are a large number of people to be interviewed, um, we may have to add another another meeting on here just to logistically get it done. Um, so again, I think we'll know on Friday where we sit, just in terms of the numbers and the you know the the physical timeline to to get screening done. I can just respond. <laughs> so, so I mean, I, I think we want to plan for the the worst case scenario. I mean, I think for us to say, well, we'll wait and see what we get on Friday, and then we'll see if we need to schedule additional day. I just think that's throw. I mean, I personally, for instance, on Thursday, March third, I've had a commitment for that evening that I've scheduled for two years. It's going to see Hamilton finally, uh, the musical, and and I cannot be there on Thursday, March third, in the evening. So I think also we want to be careful that we just don't assume that all of us can drop everything and 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 schedule. So I would really advocate that we do that on the front end. I would be very concerned. I mean, right now, Director Peterson, you said we have eight applicants. So let's just say those are what we have. That's that's back to back. If you do an hour interview, that's eight hours of interviewing, right? Um, and so, and that's if we do them back to back, and if those people are available on that day. So, um, so I would just advocate that we. Um, I, I think we heard tonight: slow down, do it well, as opposed to feeling that we have to rush this. Um, but let's not set us up for failure to where we're in a bind because we have 25 applicants or we want to talk with 12 applicants and do screening. So I, I just, I think we have to be sensitive to our schedules. We've got seven schedules here that we need to coordinate. And I just don't think the way it's set for Tuesday, March 1st really accommodates um, what we need to accomplish. And I think we probably should talk about a stop, a stop gap. If we only have three applicants, you know, that after we've done a paper screen, is that sufficient to be hiring, you know, the, the superintendent who's going to lead, you know, one of the top three school districts in the state as well as the top employer um, in Colorado or in Douglas County? Is, is that sufficient to only have three? Um, especially when we have seen in prior searches where we have 100 people uh, that want to come and, and be considered. So I think we also need to talk about what's the stop gap. Um, is three sufficient? I don't think it is. I, I certainly heard Ms. Weiniger and, and Director uh, Myers both say we want a broader pool. Uh, they both said, we don't, we don't just have our mind on one candidate. We want to make sure we interview several. And so I just, I, I think if we're going to honor that value, that we really need to reflect that in our, in our process. So that would be what I would continue to advocate is let's get our days right and get our schedules coordinated as opposed to trying to do this haphazardly. Okay, thank you, Director Ray. Other directors? Go ahead, Director Williams, you have the floor. So actually, um, on our Tuesday, March 8th meeting, what, what, are, what is our topic that evening? Just as previously. The uh, three, the, you're asking the March 8th meeting, is that correct? It is a study session, and the predetermined topic would be safe, positive culture, and climate would be uh, the topic and a potential early approval of the comp plan or other things that may come forward. So we have agenda planning later this week for that? That's correct. We have agenda planning on Thursday uh, of this week, I believe at 11.30 for uh, the March 8th meeting. I'm sorry, Director Meek, go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, I guess one of my biggest questions, why aren't we using the free services of the professional firm that can help us coordinate this? This is a serious process that requires professional input and expertise to help us go through the process accordingly. And it feels like we have a resource that is available to help us manage this process. So I'm not sure if we are open to working with a firm that can just help us coordinate the process. And Director Myers. While our recruit, recruiting 
uh, firm has been mentioned several times. I don't believe any of us, uh, maybe, maybe a few of us, majority have not felt the need to jump onto that. I, I personally would like to see what comes in Friday if we get down to three. And here's where I would maybe want to use a recruit, recruiting firm is if we'd looked at the applicants and went, okay, this wasn't well enough. So I, th I think what we're hearing and we've heard from uh, people out here, we've heard from, we've heard both sides. And I believe it's pretty balanced, but what I, what I feel is that it's time to move forward. And I guess I was thinking the firm can help with the screening like process. They can be there to help guide the, the process itself and help us. So, so I think they can offer those kinds of services to help us ensure that we're doing it adequately and properly. And so it's not as much them reaching out as them helping us through the process that we need to go through. And then also, I will be out of town the week of March 8th. Um, and, you know, I definitely would like to be part of this process. And that's a commitment I just cannot change. Yeah, understanding that the March 8th, at least right now, is a work study session again with the comp. And I, I, I'm not worried about the comp <laughs> right now. Um, with regard to the firm, uh, just so I can understand you, are you saying to bring them in as facilitation for a paper screen? Exactly. Okay, the, the process itself. Director, go ahead. I just, want to I just want to respond to Director Myers. Um, so, that's, and that's the issue is, you know, it, it, we have eight right now. How do we get it down to three unless we have a session or a, or a recruiter that can help us with that screening process? I think that's, that's the question. And, and so we can't do that right now until March 1st is the earliest. Even if you spend all your time looking online at the applications, um, we can't get it narrowed down until we sit down as a board and do that together. And I would just tell you that it, it's a fabulous process. If we're looking for an opportunity to, to unite and collaborate, it really is a fascinating process because you, we do start hearing each other's values and we do do a lot of negotiating and we do uh, talk to each other in a, in a whole different realm than what we've had to when we're sitting behind the dais. So I just would again advocate not to rush this process because it can be a, a powerful process not only for us, but it's a, as Director Meek said, it's a very serious process to find the right person. Yeah, I, I agree, and I'll uh, just to echo Director Ray's comments. One of the things I found good about the meeting the other night, although we were virtual, and, and that's always not optimum, uh, was our ability to kind of agree on on a definition, a positional description, and I think that'll be a great guide for us. I mean, certainly that's my rubric to look at: um, who do we have, who's applied, um, what are their qualifications, and I think that's uh, I think that was a great first step in this longer process to come together and identify who an appropriate person would be to lead the district. Uh, Director Myers, go ahead. And while uh, uh, the virtual meeting that we had last week, while we went through the process and we definitely collaborated and extended the application time through the 25th, I guess I'm wondering why we did not complete the process then of going through the timeline at that time. I mean, if we were on it, why didn't we just keep plugging away till we came to the consensus? So when we closed last Tuesday, the 16th or Wednesday, um, I felt, okay, we've made a collaboration, we've extended application, we're going forward. So I didn't, I didn't guess I understood that we needed to look at any of the yeah. other dates. And, and what I would say is, again, let's see where we are on Friday. We'll have some time to look at those applications as they come in. Um, like anything else that the board votes on, we can always amend if we think that we have a large number of applicants. It's a large number of qualified applicants that we cannot get through. All the applicants will have to take a look and see where we are. Um, but I would recommend that we 
go with the notional timeline as is that we discussed uh, in depth the other night. And then let's see where we are on Friday. And let's start out with the, the meeting on March 1st. That's a great time to at least initiate that screening process, see where we are, see the numbers, see what the applicants look like, and then we can move forward from there. So I guess I'm asking, is there a motion relative to the timeline? Go ahead, Director Weiniger, you have the floor. Um, so Tuesday, March 1st, we're screening applicants, but we're also interviewing them, like a screen interview, or just screening their resumes? It, it's a potential interview, depending on how the screen goes. Okay. Yeah. Director Myers. Well, and then I understand from looking at this, if we're screening, then the applicants would be aware that there would be a screening interview, correct? They would be aware that there is a the potential, possibility to potential have a, interview. To have a potential. Right. Okay. And we would also, frankly, have to inform that that, that interview may occur in public. Um, again, I'm hoping to go into executive session and we could agree that, to have two-thirds to go in and do a proper screening in executive session. I Director Hansen. I think there may be a confusion in how we are each defining the, the process. When I see screening, um, I am I am sitting down, looking through resumes. We're having discussions. Candidates are not involved. Um, we're we're going through and discussing pros and cons and potential. Um, we I mean we even talked about potential questions, things that we'd like to follow up and dig into a little bit more during the interview process. Um, so I guess I'm I'm not sure if we're all on the same page as I listen to everyone else's questions of what the dis what the difference is between screening and actually interviewing. And I'm not sure, just HR perspective, I'm not sure that it's fair to ask if we have three or 23, I'm not sure if it's fair to ask all of those candidates to just be on call essentially for an interview that they may or may not have on that day at an undefined time, possibly in public, possibly, in, it just, that doesn't seem like a very sophisticated process to um, ask our candidates to participate in. Other directors? I agree. Okay. I, it just feels very awkward. And that's where I felt like having a professional firm that does this involved to help us really lock down the timeline, lock down what that process looks like, help with contacting individuals, help with setting up interviews. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of work. And um, President Peterson, you've done all this work already, and I'm very, very appreciative of this, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done, and we, we need to make sure that we do this and, and follow all of the rules that we should be following. Is, is that a hand, Director? Yes, yes. yes. Sorry. okay, sorry. I'm, sure, I'm flat. Go ahead, Director Ray. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yes, I agree. I think, I think that's what we've established is logistically that one day setting is not conducive to doing what you want to do in terms of doing the paper screen, as Director Hansen said, as well. And, and, and to her question, there's two levels of, of interviewing. There's a screening interview, and then there's a finalist interview uh, that we do in public. So... Typically, screening interviews are done in executive session, and I'm wondering if we can just all, so I, I, I hear Director Peterson, you being very uh, correct and not wanting to tie us to an executive session before we actually have the opportunity to, to vote or not, but can we just have some consensus that we see the benefit of doing screening in executive session? I mean, is there anyone that would disagree with that? that so, so I think that should give you the confidence that, that most likely if we were to propose to go in executive session, it'll happen because we all believe and see the value of that. So I would get rid of that uh, if then uh, kind of uh, qualifier in there. I, I, and I want to also address Director Myers. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, I understand you wondering why are we discussing this again? Well, we didn't have public comment. We didn't, we didn't have a group of building principals stand in front of us and say, we need, we need to have input sooner in this process, is what I felt like they were saying to us, you know, so that when you do go into screening, you hear our voices, um, as opposed to waiting until afterwards, and we've already selected the finalists, and now they're just reacting, as opposed to actually being on the front end of this process, which is different than how we did it before, because we had our focus groups 
really not only looking at our job description, but giving us some additional advice about what they are hoping for um, in this individual. And so I feel like, too, that's a missing link in here is we heard our building leaders plead with us, please sit down and, and listen to us so that when you go into the screening process, you know what we're looking for at the building level. So I think that's a missing piece of this too. But I think that's why Director Myers, we're rehashing this is because now that we're walking through it, there's some things that don't make sense. And Go ahead, Director Myers. Oh, I think she's pointing at me. I did want to respond to Director Myers as well. I mean, I think it was very late in the meeting when we got to the timeline and it was just posted that day. And I think it takes me a little bit of time to work through those logistics. And what um, Director Ray was just saying, I mean, that's my big concern with this whole process is we're not allowing our stakeholders to give us input about what's important to them before we are putting forward finalists and saying, now you can engage. And I would love to see some kind of timeline where we allow our employees, we allow our building leaders, we allow our DAC, our long range planning committee, all of our committees that are committed to being engaged in our community and our school district, tell us what's important to them before we pick finalists. And I, I don't know how that happens given where we are in this timeline, but it is a huge missing link. Go ahead, Director Myers. So my question is, is that not what we did when we did the survey? It, surveys that came out with uh, staff, parents, and our stakeholders? No, that, and I think I said at the meeting last week, those were done a year ago. I mean, those are old. We are in a totally new situation right now where you have record number of public input coming in. I mean, we're sitting here, we're listening to hours and hours of public comment. And I think it's a totally different situation right now than it was when we did those surveys prior. Okay, thank you. And I would certainly be amenable to having a flex day on the second as well if we needed to flow over and do paper screens. Um, some interviews, if we had additional interviews that we were unable to complete on the first, we could certainly complete those on the second and schedule those in as well. Director Weiniger. Um I'm okay with that, Director Peterson, if we allow that. And I think we'll have the actual finalist interviews on Thursday the 3rd, which gives us a chance to actually talk to the candidates, and then we'll hear from the community on the 10th. So I feel like this is a good... Um, a good timeline if uh, if you have that flex day on the second year. Director Ray. So I also want to respond to Director Myers with regard to the surveys. We really had multiple places that we gathered and engaged with our community. So the survey was really very controlled. It was very specific questions. Do you know what value do you place on this particular characteristic? That was sent out to the entire community for them to give the results to. But then we had focus groups where you had conversation, like our building principles. You would sit down and say, let's talk about what you need as a building principal because you're closest to the action with children. What is it that you need of a superintendent? And so, there was, so it was more of a narrative conversation and themes were collected then from our, our um, recruiter who could, I, who could say, these are the themes that are coming from our building leaders or these are the themes that are coming from our committees. So there was really, we had multiple ways, uh, Director Myers, that we collected that. It wasn't just through the survey. Other director comments, questions? Okay, uh, Director Williams. So I too would feel better if we actually added another day just because I do think that screening applicants and interviewing them all in one day would be difficult. So that's number one. Um, but I do think that we have opportunities for our community and staff and teachers and principals to interact um, on Thursday, uh, March 10th, and then 
any time in between that, I'm sure we could come up if we needed to with another day if we had to um, for them to do that. But I think that this is a good starting point. And if for some reason we realize that we don't have what we need or what we want collectively as a board, then we amend this and move forward from there. So, so what I heard in all that was a possible amendment um, to add a as required day on March 2nd that we could exercise and obviously we would have to notice it properly uh, depending on the number of applicants and what we think the logistical possibilities are of doing a paper screen followed by interviews on the first. The second would probably be um, just additional interviews internally in any, another executive session if required, again, depending on number of applicants, quality of applicants, all those other things. So if that is what I'm hearing, if I could get a motion to amend to add the March 2nd, we can vote on that and then move forward. Motion to add March 2nd as a flex day. Okay, motion by Weininger to add March 2nd is a flex day. Point of order, Dr. Peterson. Go so ahead. We, we don't have a motion on the table yet, so we can't be amending. I think we're still in discussion okay. questions. Yes, correct, I so thought that's right. I would just correct the process. So if we want a motion, but I mean, I have still have a lot of questions, so I don't care sure. where you put it, you can motion, and I can have these questions during our discussion after the motion, or we can continue to ask questions to revise, and then we have a pretty clean motion yeah, that we can no, go into. Yeah, go ahead, please. So, I'm sorry, would you? Um, uh, indicating, please go ahead with your questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so then on March 3rd, let's talk about March 3rd for a minute. So then on that date, we say vote on finalists. And again, I'm not sure what that means because if we're interviewing finalists on March 3rd, they are finalists, right? So help me understand what, that, what it means to vote on finalists. I, I thought that was our day to actually interview to conduct with the board public interviews with the finalists. So Mr. Blair, if you could go a little higher in the document so we can see March 2nd, uh, or sorry, it would be March 1st, a potential continuation on March 2nd of screening and interviews. At the end of either March 1st or March 2nd as required, we would have a public vote on who would be, uh, we would be giving interviews for basically um, who would move out of the paper screen into a public interview. And then on March 3rd, there would be one or more <laughs> interviews in public, followed by public comment, followed by a board action to name one or more people as a finalist. Um, that, with the uh, my understanding with Kristen Ager, would trigger a minimum two-week window before you would be able to offer any type of contract or things like that because you, at that point, would have, quote, official finalist as voted on by the board. So my understanding, Director Pearson, is you can, you can during the screening process, we can identify finalists. We don't have to come out and say, here's our four finalists. Um, that's the purpose of that screening process. So March 3rd would be the announce, would be our scheduling those finalists for public interviews. Um, I don't believe that there's a vote needed for that. Yeah, I was trying to overdo the public voting because if we go in and screen and we do it in executive session right. and we come out and say there are two finalists, three finalists, one finalist coming out of that, I would like that vote to actually take place in public because, again, as you know, we can't vote on things. We can move towards agreement in executive session, um, but we probably should come out and take an actual vote because I would like to see the public see that vote and see if there are differences in the seven members on who they thought should be interviewed. So, again, then I would, if I, if I may, uh, I would suggest you keep that then on March 1st or 2nd that we come out and vote because otherwise, again, you're in that logistical problem that you don't, no, you can't agreed. schedule the interviews agreed. until then. Okay. Um, and then, and I think the other question then is, when do we, when are background checks due? Uh, when do we do reference checks? Um, one of the things that our recruiter did for us that was really, I think, pretty profound was he would actually go and talk to people that were firsthand associates of the candidates. He would interview, um, the he would video interview the reference check he was doing with those references and then we were actually able to see him 
asking someone that worked with that individual side by side, and we were able to actually see the feedback that that individual gave. And it was pretty profound, I think, for us, because the recruiter also know that you don't just go after the person that writes the letter of recommendation. You, you ask people that you know worked with that individual, maybe the letter of reference was not signed by that individual. And so he was very skilled at broadening who he talked to um, as well. So I'm wondering, in terms of this process, where does that fit um, in terms of background checks, testimonies from references, um, this is also our recruiter really did a search for controversial issues, you know, looking at social media, um, you know, did this person have a issue in their district that got a lot of um, public attention? So, that, so those background checks became very, very crucial to the process too. So I'm just wondering where that fits as well. And that may or may not fit, I don't, I don't know when that, where that fits, I guess, is my question. Yeah, I'll have to confirm that with Amanda Thompson as part of the uh, screen process and the application process. I know that there's a look at background checks. Um, hopefully that would uh, occur before the first, but I will get with her again. And then um, moving on into March 10th, if we can talk a little bit about that, because that's another huge um, Huge task. Um, so with panels, you have a whole process where you select people for the panels. And that process wants to make sure it's balanced, you know, from feeder groups to grade levels to, um, you know, in terms of representations of the different employee groups. So that, whole, that takes a whole in-depth process to be able to first market that so people submit their interest to serving on those panels. And then those panels have to have an opportunity then to create their questions that they're going to ask. So again, when I see that we're doing all of this in one day's time, um, logistically, I don't see how that's possible. If you don't, on the front end, get right. that out to start working on that process that, earlier. That's one of the discussions I had with the deputy superintendents, HR and comms, uh, about panel selection and the differences between panels and forums. Um, I know that there is a uh, interest uh, form that's been developed and can be launched. In fact, it should be launched before even Friday because independent of how many candidates we have and things like that. I was told that HR and comments will take care of panel identification, solicitation of who wants to be on there, screening, and put together those panels. And those panels should be putting their questions together for the 10th, independent of the other timeline. Just as you mentioned the other night, and I thought it was an excellent suggestion, uh, there was an email that went out earlier uh, getting my weeks confused, last week, um, that said, please have questions in uh, by Thursday for initial screening. And then the follow on would be the ask for, depending on who came forward in the screening, for individual directors to develop and consolidate questions for those final interviews, which or the finalist, excuse me, interviews, which would happen on the third. So board directors have their set of questions, initial screening, that will consolidate and then uh, finalist interviews and uh, parallel with that while everything's going on, we expect HR and comms to solicit uh, panel members and have them start working their questions prior to the 10th. And, so, and de deputy or uh, acting superintendent Hyatt, you're looking like you want to comment. So, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in talking about March 10th, <clears throat> there is from a staff perspective, being able to coordinate on one day a rotation through that, depending upon how many finalists, is a more efficient use of our resources and time than trying to schedule multiple different uh, days and opportunities for candidates to meet with panels, conduct a forum, et cetera. So we've talked about the March 10th date and being able, again, depending upon how many fa finalists, to create some sort of a rotation where that person or persons would meet with a number of different groups. And I didn't mean to, to <clears throat> imply that we need to do that over multiple days, because um, that's exactly what we did, is we had the candidate rotate through several panels um, during that one day. I was concerned, but this is the news that I did not know. Thank you, Director Peterson. So on this timeline, you're saying on February 24th, there should be something that goes out to staff and community inviting them to consider being to serve on the panel. And then, and then 
I would add to that then, have we, what we also did, we were very intentional about how those panels were going to be represented. We, we talked about there was gonna be 17 members and we wanted this many from this region and this many, so I'm wondering, has that work been done and when will that work be done? But I thank you for the update on this timeline because that wasn't on the timeline. Yeah, the, the answer to that is uh, that's exactly what uh, HR and comms, they would have already put it out, but they did not feel that that was appropriate till after we had uh, either consent agenda or an independent action item on this timeline to make sure that that date and everything wasn't going to move. So they're, they're prepared to do so. Well, I think only, but I think it should be on the timeline, I guess is what I'm saying. I think that's a task that we ought to be transparent about with our community that we've been thoughtful in saying on the 24th, there will be an email blast that will invite, start this process of collecting names for people interested in serving on panels. So uh, you're absolutely correct. I don't think they should have put it out um, until we've had a chance to, to vote and approve. Um, so then again, March 3rd, uh, I will just again disclose I'm not here on March 3rd. <laughs> and I would sure like to be part of the process, just like Director Meek, because I have an investment. Uh, I want to work alongside of all of you to, to do that, but I will not be here in the evening on March 3rd. So, um, And then I think, as far as the dates, um, I think the other thing that, as I reflected on what we did last time, that it was also some important data points as we're talking about engagement and wanting to get our community's input. All of our candidates went to uh, different schools on that date. So while they were rotating through the panels, they were also going to host schools. And why that was really critical, it was really we had observers that watched those candidates, how they interacted with staff, how they interacted with children, and they gave us a whole nother uh, data point uh, to help us understand that candidate even more thoroughly in terms of how that host school visit would go. Um, but it also was very helpful to our candidates then who were able to see our wonderful schools in action. Um, and then they came back for a second interview with the board to be able to talk about their observations. And that was insightful. What kind of things did they notice when they went into our schools? What did they notice? What, what kind of things did they value that they felt were positives? What did they see that maybe they wondered about? And so that whole second round interview, which is not on this schedule, um, was really critical as well, just because we had a better picture of this person that we want to invest, I believe, a great deal of time in making sure we have the best candidate for the position. So that's one of the other things I didn't see um, listed on this uh, schedule. And then the other piece is how do we get the feedback back to the board? So we have these forums and we have these panels. Where, when do we get that feedback? How do we get that input and how do we process that input? So again, just to give you an example of previous practice, so those panels then, they would do a plus delta, they would, they would um, process as a panel their observations of each candidate, and then we would meet with a facilitator of that panel and hear back about their observations and their insights. So again, the process, I guess what I'm emphasizing is, we can't just make a decision based on a screening interview and then how, you know, if we don't have, if we don't take time to actually collect the input we're asking for, it does us no good to have these forums if we don't have actually a process where we actually process their input and feedback to help us make our, our decisions. So um, I'm wondering about second round interviews, I'm wondering about school visits, um, and I'm wondering about, again, the whole uh, ability for us to talk to people who actually work with these individuals. So those are three things that I'm really concerned about that's not on this um, timeline or in this process. Okay, certainly happy to amend to put a explicit uh, cab uh, cabinet panel feedback mechanism to the board on there. Um, again, I didn't go get as granular. I thought it was implied that we would have panels and um, we would hopefully at attend and, and monitor those panels and get some feedback. It would be, it'd be kind of, uh, um, it would not be beneficial to have panels and not have some means to have the panels feedback, but I did not put a date on the feedback.
So I guess I haven't really heard answers to some of my questions. One is um, second round interviews uh, with the board, which I think for us to just make our decision based on one screening interview, which or one finalist interview, um, is to me pretty um, woefully uh, short in terms of us being able to make an informed decision. So I haven't heard that. I haven't heard um, how we're going to investigate the people that have actually worked with these individuals so that we have some confidence in knowing that that person, um, how well they work with others. Um, and then I haven't really heard um, whether or not we're going to provide an opportunity for any of our principal groups to actually influence our process when we are actually screening these applicants. So maybe the answer is no, 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 and I can live with that. That tells me how I should vote when this timeline comes up. But I, I just, I think that in this process, when I, I don't mind that we feel a sense of urgency, I do mind that we're being, I feel like it's careless. I feel like we're ramming it through without being thoughtful and giving ourselves time to make the best decision possible for our kids. And that's, that's what concerns me overall. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Director Williams. So just a question to you about that. Um, when the finalists or finalists uh, went to the schools, was that done in one day? Was it done in three days? What was it done in and, and what did that look like? Because I wouldn't have a problem adding, you know, March 11th or whatever for the finalists to go to the schools. I, I don't, I don't fore foresee that to be an issue. I just am curious how that looked. Yeah, so we, so we pretty much um, housed each panel at a different school. So there was two things that they accomplished. One is they had that school visit, but then there was a panel waiting for them to interview. So it really was, I believe it was done in two days, actually, as I think about it. Um, I think we carried it over to two. Um, but primarily with three candidates, I think we were able to do one day. Um, it was the fourth candidate that kind of threw us out of whack a little bit, so, yeah. Any other director questions? Very simple question. Um, we are all going to have conflicts on these dates, just given seven different schedules. Do you know when we will have times? I think the earlier we have a specific um, time commitment, the easier it'll be to navigate or move things as needed. Um, so what, when can we expect specific times? I can put those draft times out tomorrow easily. Um, obviously the first and possibly the second would be longer commitments again, all based on number of applicants. Thank you. Director Myers. Well, and just to accommodate Director Ray, is it, does it ever happen that we could do something in the daytime, I mean, public comment and everything, so that he could make his, I mean, I agree, two years he's had his tickets. I'd like to see you go also. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm amenable to it during the day, on that day, just can't, and, and we did. We, we did interview um, finalists during the day as well. Director Williams, go ahead. So, um, Deputy, oh gosh, Acting Superintendent Hyatt, mm -hmm. um, just out of curiosity, when you were looking at the date for March 10th, because you wanted to make sure it accommodated staff and such, which I think is really important, and we don't want to put anybody out there, um, would this be held at a school? I mean, what is, have you thought about where it's going to be held, um, that sort of thing? Yes, we did have some just initial thinking about location. We did not talk about it being at a school or schools. Um, that is the day before spring break. Um, so that's just another consideration uh, in our schools. But if that is the desire of the board to, to um, facilitate that process, the sooner that we know that, the better, so that we can logistically plan what that looks like. <clears throat> Otherwise, our thought was if we're 
also um, facilitating or providing the community forum opportunity, um, we may be able to do that at the, the CU South Legacy Campus um, with all of the different panels and the community forum. Okay, other questions or comments? The Director Ray. So going back to March, so going to March 22nd then um, is the day that I think we said we want to make a contract offer. What we haven't done logistically is we haven't picked a date where we collect the input from our community and our panels, we process, and then at that time we also decide do we want to push forward a sole finalist? Um, because it doesn't really make sense to make a contract offer if we have four finalists still out there. I don't know how we get to the point of where, who, who are we gonna offer a contract to unless we've, again, had that process time as a board to do that. So that's, again, where second round interviews make sense. That's, again, where we take the time to have that process time um, to deliberate on each of the finalists. And then that's the time where we talk about a sole finalist or if we can get to a place of recommending a sole finalist moving forward to have a uh, contract offered to. So just again, as we're looking at adding things onto this that are not there, I think that's a critical task. Yeah, my understanding was that we would name finalists on the third um, and then we would be able to make a contract offer to any finalist. Um, after naming them as a finalist. My question is when, though, when do, when do we as a board, so the third you're interviewing the finalist, when do we as a board actually process those interviews? During, on the third, conduct interviews with finalists, uh, can finalist interviews in public, followed by a series of public comment, followed by votes on finalists. Again, that would trigger uh, the CRS minimum, it, although it'll be longer than that, minimum two week waiting period. And then we were able to collect all types of community input, uh, staff, student, you know, the panel input, get that all back to the board before we would make any type of contract offer based on that feedback. But Director Peterson, if we do that on the third, we're preempting the feedback we're getting on the 10th. I mean, if we're, if we're on the third deliberating who we think we want to contract with, I'm not, right. I guess I'm not understanding. Yeah, we, we would not offer a contract to someone on the 22nd or any time thereafter that we did not feel um, reflected positive feedback from the community and the rest of the, uh, the ownership. We would vote on finalists or a finalist on the 3rd. We would have the session on the 10th. We would get all types of feedback based on those engagements, both the forum and the panels. And then we would either not offer a contract or offer a contract depending on that feedback. So that's where the feedback would come in. I'm sorry, I thought we, I thought we established we're not voting on finalists on the 3rd. I thought, I thought our previous was that we would do that on the 1st or the 2nd when we came out so, of screening. So go ahead, Director Williams, you, you want to comment? No, that's, I, thought, I thought that's what we did too. On the first or second, we would determine who our finalists were going to be, and then we would interview them on the third, uh, preferably during the day, so Director A could be there. And, um, and that would then start the two week. Yeah, I, again, I wanted to overdo this in terms of transparency. So either on the first or the second, depending on the number, to come out of executive session, have a vote to say, we will interview these finalist finalists publicly on the third, actually conduct those interviews in public, and then have a, another vote in public to name a finalist or finalists out of that meeting to officially meet the CRS requirements to having named finalists. So one is just, these are the people we're gonna interview, we interview them on the third publicly, you know, beyond the screening interviews. And then we have a vote as a group of seven, again, to get every member of the board on record for who they believe a finalist or finalist should be on the third. Um, and then trigger the timeline. So um, we have, well, in this case, more than two weeks, over three weeks uh, uh, since that to then vet those people, get more feedback from the community, and have the potential to make a contract offer having named a finalist or finalists on the third. 
I think you and Director Williams said something different to me. Director Williams said, first and second, we vote on the final. I don't, I don't think there's a vote to be taken on the third. Okay, so you're thinking that on the first or the second, whenever right, we come out of screens, having not had a public interview um, yet. Those are our finalists. That those are our finalists, and that yeah. all we need to do on the third, because those are officially on the first or the second, right. the finalists are finalists, right. as voted in public, right. that we just need to have interviews and public comment, and there's nothing actionable. I just wanted to make sure that we differentiated between, uh, and thank you for the clarification. I am fine with that as long as there is a public vote taken to name a finalist or finalist because I don't want this to get be confused between next stage interviews versus finalists. So I am happy keeping that on the first or the second as appropriate. Right. So again, I think what what is what we're concerned about it then is how do we go from, let's say three or four finalists to a sole finalist that we want to ask that a contract be offered to. How does that happen? Does that make sense? Yeah, my understanding is we, we get the feedback from panels and everything, and then we make the decision on the board on the 22nd. We've taken the feedback, we've heard interviews, we've seen everything that's come back okay. from the panels, and, and we make an offer uh, or, or, or don't make an offer to any of them and then expand a search, and you know it's wide open from there. So on that day, you're going to process all that information from our panels and our, our forums. Then you're also going to have us as a board deliberate on each of the finalists. And then at the end of that night, we're going to say, we want to offer a contract to this person. Uh, are you talking about the 22nd? Yes, sir. Uh, the, the forums, the panels, all that stuff will be done on the 10th. I expect them to start reports out. Um, to the board based on, on what they, their considerations would be immediately following that. We have the entire week of spring break as individual directors to consider that feedback, consider what, is you know, what happened in the forum, what the individual panels reported back to individual directors uh, during that entire week. So yes, I would expect us to come back on the 22nd um, we do have a regular board meeting scheduled, um, but to have a session where we deliberate on all that feedback, talk openly in public, because once we have finalists, as you know, there is no more executive session. All the conversations must be public among the board members uh, to have a deliberation about where we are and on that feedback, and then basically offer a contract, uh, or again, or not, um, to a, a single finalist, but to do that on the 22nd, but having received uh, feedback from the forums and the panels really starting on, on the, uh, the 11th, you know, after all those are complete. I'll yield my questions at this time because I, I still have a lot of apprehensions about the process because I, I don't think it's clear. Um, I think we've had a good discussion. I think, again, it would be helpful to have kind of a final copy, <laughs> but, I, but I respect that I've already asked you to delay that once to, to clean up what we did last time. So I will yield and just say that I'm still um, not convinced that we have a process that truly to me is in depth enough to find the right person for our district. So, uh, but I'll yield my questions from there. Director Williams, then Director Myers. I was actually gonna make a motion, so if you have uh, Director else. Myers. I was just gonna ask, is it possible, since I've made notes, I'm assuming you're gonna get out a little more detailed timeline, since there were some I, that were left I would, out? I would read a timeline with all the notes here and then ask if uh, we would have to have a motion first for uh, approve okay. a timeline, and then we would have to have a motion to amend uh, the timeline, and I could read those and see if we have a motion to amend as read and then come back if I understand the process. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Director Williams. So I motion to approve the timeline, but with amendments. So I don't know if I just start with the, do I go ahead and add the amendments now or do I motion first? You can move to, uh, have a motion to approve the timeline 
And then I'm just struggling on this. I move that I guess we can have a motion to approve at the timeline, table that motion, just sit on it, and then a second motion to amend the timeline, and then we can approve it as amended. If that is correct, go ahead, Director. Just Ray. to help you, we've yep. we've uh, we've wordsmith and amended it. Yeah. I just think the motion would be to approve the timeline as amended. As amended. Okay. So let's discuss what that amendment would be. Go ahead, Director Williams. So I motion to approve the timeline as amended. With the twenty fourth, an email blast is going to go out uh, to the community to ask for uh, people to be on the panels, and then also adding a flex day on March 2nd. Okay, friendly amendment as well to require um, on Thursday, March 10th, uh, to add one bullet that says um, feedback to board upon completion of forms and panels, just to explicitly put that in there. So that is three bullets, adding a 24th panel solicitation by um, HR and comms for the district, a flex day on the 22nd as required for additional screening, and then a bullet under March 10th to report back uh, to the Board of Education um, from the individual panels and forms. Okay, so we have, I believe that is a motion to approve the timeline as amended from Williams. Seconded. Second by Weiniger. I'll call the roll. Hansen. I appreciate the conversation and the feedback. Um, I'm going to still vote no because I don't think this is adequate, but I genuinely appreciate the back and forth and the, the genuine discussion. Okay. And calling the roll on the, to pass the timeline as amended. Uh, Director Hanson, I'm sorry, I didn't get here. Uh, no. Okay, thank you, no. Director Meek. So I'll be a no as well. I'm not confident in this timeline. Frankly, it's offensive to our stakeholders that we're not, we're telling them we don't care about their input before we do the screening process, so. I'm a no. Director Myers. Yes. Director Peterson, aye. Director Ray. Yeah, I'm, I'm a no as well. For similar reasons, I don't think we've mapped out an adequate process. But I think uh, what weighs heaviest for me is we watched our building leaders stand in front of us saying that they need us to hear them. And I don't think we've, 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 we've basically are turning our backs on the very people that are going to be most impacted by this uh, superintendent position. So my, my vote is a no. Director Williams. Aye. And Director Weiniger. Aye. And I was an aye. So we have four, three passed as amended. Excuse me. President Peterson, may we please take a 10 minute break? Yes, we can. Let's, Thank you. Uh, it is. 22, let's come back at 35, thank you.
in session. We are on item number 21, the study action items. We have the Mill Bond Exploratory Ad Hoc Committee, also known as the MBREC membership approval. And the recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the Mill Bond uh, Exploratory Committee membership as presented. Uh, questions on the membership or any motions after questions by directors. And I know that uh, before we do, uh, I don't know if Sandra Brownrigg is still available. Okay, she is, Mr. Blair. If there's any questions, she uh, should be uh, available to answer any questions by Zoom. And I know that she did reach out to each director individually to discuss uh, potential board members previous to this meeting. So with that, any questions on the list of individuals? I move that we accept the membership list as presented. Second. Motion by Ray, second by Meek, as presented. Seeing no discussion or other questions, I will call the roll. Hansen? Aye. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed seven to zero. Moving on to number 22. Uh, pending acquisition of Arapahoe Community College Parker Campus, located at 15653 Brookstone Drive, unincorporated Douglas County, Colorado, zip 80134. The recommendation will be that the Board of Education approve the pending acquisition of the ACC Parker Campus. And uh, before we get into any questions or motions, we will have a short presentation by Mr. Danny Windsor and Rich Cosgrove. All right, is this working okay? Perfect. Well, thank you for stealing my intro to the slide, said Director Pearson. I appreciate it. I will keep it short, I promise you as well. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. If we can go to slide two, please. Or does this clicker work? Yes, it does. All right. Which way am I clicking? There we go. Perfect. Um, well, real quick as a brief, um, just recap real quick. It's been about three years that we've been working on this project that we made a commitment to our voters three years ago in the Bond and Mill to offer a alternative education campus in Parker. Um, it is in a very exciting day to actually be here today um, as we've been working through a variety of scenarios from looking at our Pine Drive campus um, that we were looking at that was near the um, Parker Libraries um, to get to this place where we are today. We obviously had gone through through some challenges, um, whether that was through COVID and increased cost and pricing to the significant land work that we we're going to have to do in the project, which led to some pretty significant cost overruns, upwards of $21 million to potentially build this alternative education campus. Knowing that those cost overruns were going at an alarming rate, we began exploring other options, which one of those options was engaging with um, our community partner in Arapahoe Community College which is a part of the Colorado Community College system. Um, while engaging in that conversation, uh, we were very fortunate to potentially open dialogue about securing um, and um, getting to the place where we are now looking at a purchase and sale agreement. Um, this space is very equivalent to what we were looking at on that site, um, roughly within 1,000 square feet of one another, and actually the classroom space sets up even probably a little bit better than what we're looking at for our educational programming. It's a fantastic location. It's actually on the western side of Parker, which makes it more accessible to um, our Highlands Ranch locations um, as well. There's also public transit that is actually also very close, and it's tied right next to Chaparral High School, which makes transportation also another very logical use. And so we spent some significant time um, evaluating educational programming as well as other aspects of due diligence on that, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Rich Cosgrove to talk through a few of those details. Good evening, directors. Similar to our due diligence for CU South, we had the same architect, engineering subconsultants. We performed all due diligence with respect to zoning, FAA uh, regulations, standoff distances, height restrictions, um, the building uh, aspects of all infrastructure components, uh, as reflected in our feasibility analysis and test fit and addendum that's posted with this agenda item. Um, the facility is in excellent condition, very well maintained. Um, minimum requirements for code upgrades, minimum tenant finish upgrades needed for programming. Um, we performed a full uh, on-site as well as off-site traffic uh, uh, impact studies, environmental risk assessments, radon testing, asbestos testing. Uh, we have no concerns and it would be extremely beneficial for the district. 
we would use the same 2018 bond funds that were allocated for the Alternative Education uh, Center on Pine Drive. While the purchase price is higher than initially estimated, we're not concerned. The budgets for both CU South as well as this facility has a 15% contingency, so twice the normal that we'd normally carry. Plus in CU South, you may recall that we have uh, three bid alternates. Uh, one of them is significant for the roof replacement. And if we need to, we would not accept those ultimates and roll that in as far as uh, capital improvement costs uh, as part of a future bond similar to that of any one of our schools. At this point, um, I'd like to turn it over to Leanne Hayen, one of our alternative education principals. Good evening, directors. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, I also want to make this brief as I know it's been a long evening for you all as well. Um, since last July, I have met with all district um, department heads, high school leaders, and most importantly, kids in this process to find out how we might better support learners in Douglas County and what different kinds of learning experiences we might put forth for our students. And so after navigating this plus a pandemic for the last two years, uh, the realization is is that our needs are great and my goal has really been to align those needs with how we might best move forward for our kids. Um, one of the first things that we have really decided and honed in on is this idea of passion and purpose. So many of our kids need smaller, more personalized learning experiences. They don't see themselves in their learning and they don't understand how their current learning experiences might help them choose a future career or pathway. Small class sizes, in-depth learner profile analysis, and personalized project-based learning will be at the heart of what we're trying to do to move forward to better meet the needs of our students. The second one is mentors and cognitive dissonance. This idea that our students might engage with mentors out in the community and try on hats long before they make decisions to go on to college is a huge opportunity for our students. While the cost of college is growing eight times faster than the cost of living, and 40% of our students across the nation are truly making it to graduation, it's more important than ever that we offer them different pathways and different experiences. So we want them to be deeply exposed and um, offered those experiences of work-based learning continuums so that they might experience the world of work at work, through work, and even be able to have those chances long before they graduate. And then finally, the entrepreneurial mindset is really at the heart of what we're trying to do to move forward. These fostered skill sets are going to help our kids navigate an uncertain future and look at how they might be able to create their own startup, create or join a company with a mission and a value that they so find themselves aligned with, or even go on to college and pick the majors that are best aligned to their own purpose. And so these are our school's why. And I've had the privilege in Douglas County of teaching valedictorians and students who ended up incarcerated. I've had the triumph and heartache of loving and losing kids in this district, and I am so ready. Since July 1, this has been a true dream of mine, and every day has been living in an ideal state. But this is truly the opportunity to take something and make it tangible and make it real. And more than anything, it's for our kids. So the sooner we get rolling on this project, the sooner we can open the doors for these kids and really make something magical happen. So I thank you so much for your time and consideration. And so really we wanted to keep this um, very short, sweet to the point for you as well. Obviously answer any questions you may have um, in general around different programming. This is obviously attached to the agenda as well for you to look at any of the details that are there um, in the sense of what this potentially this um, um, new opportunity for our students would be. And obviously we're very excited for Ms. Hand to be able to lead that work as our founding principal for that work. As you can hear, she has an, uh, just a little bit of passion about this work, which makes her so incredibly special in the work that's there. So um, we uh, want to answer, help any, any questions you may have um, or anything we can provide some clarity on. So um, please let us know. No, appreciate it. And uh, obviously a lot of this was work is a reminder of what we discussed in early December in conjunction with CU South, now known as the Legacy Campus. Um, and, and the other things I recall is uh, the level of renovation required because we're going from learning ACC to DCSD, what was largely minimal. Um, is there, my last question, because I forgot to write it down, when is the projected doors open date if the purchase is completed now? 
If purchase is completed now, the goal is, is for August of 2023. So it stayed true to that same timeline. So if there was any deviation, that's part of the reason why. And thank you for the urgency of getting this on here as well as to make sure we stay true to that timeline. Okay, other director questions, comments? Dir director Ray. Um, so there's no other program other than the Alt-Ed High School that's going to be in this facility. ACC's point out, CCCS is, they're, they're not going to have any additional programming, is that correct? So what we're working, and again, really want to be thankful for obviously our ACC partners and community college system partners as well. There is a possibility of potentially leasing back some space after hours for them to potentially utilize that space. They just, there was a pretty significant investment that was made in the bio lab stuff for bio 110 um, there as well, but nothing that would be conflicting during the day, um, but there is a possibility maybe after hours for them to run a bio lab. That is still not confirmed, still working through those details. But again, want to be good partners um, with them as well as they make this transition to, to support Douglas County Schools. So the facility, I'm, I'm sorry, can I just continue to ask a few? So the, the, the facility itself then is 1,000 square feet less than what original uh, facility was to be constructed. What are we, uh, it, what, what, what shortcut are we making in this facility that we wish we would have had in the, if we were to build from the ground up? I think that's the really exciting part about this is really there has been no sacrifice as far as what we're going to be able to offer to students. If anything, you know, when I was hired in July 1, um, the path and the, the design build for Pine Drive was already a little bit flushed out. So a lot of it at that point was finding out how our programming would fit that space, whereas the opposite has kind of happened and it's been a beautiful thing with this new space. So the programming was already designed, the outcomes were already, figured, you know, determined for how we want to succeed with students, and now we can make the space actually better fit our needs. So I would argue that we're actually better able to utilize the space that we are being given at this point. Outstanding. And in comparing that to our other alternative high schools, then, uh, so this one has 150 students, 10 classrooms. How does that compare to our other um, alternative ed programs. Absolutely. Very similar as far as small class size personalized learning opportunities. Um, so Oaks really offers that experiential learning experience. Eagle offers their student population as more of that night work-based learning opportunity as well. So it is a slightly different spin, but the idea is still the same, is how can we really lean into our students and provide a more intensive support through their learning experiences with our size and programming. The other piece that is an added bonus with being so close to CU South is that we will be also able to offer half day programming where students can come to us as well as engage in CTE programming at the Legacy Campus or even be able to um, engage at SHAP because it's going to be right next door. So it's really been a win-win. Great. And I would just echo Mr. Windsor, your passion is so contagious. I don't know how the two of you can, can be in the same place at the same time. We don't get a whole lot done. There's a lot of dreaming, but. <laughs> so, and then Leanne, one, one other quick question. So as we're, I love that you're talking to students um, because I think this is such an opportunity for them to own this place. This is their place. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, so it's not in the high school like we've had in the olden days, but it's their place. Any thoughts about how we might involve students to name the place or, yes. you know, all that kind of <laughs> So many process? ideas. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Danny's been pulling back on the reins like, all right, hold on, it's coming. Um, but yes, absolutely. I think, you know, after this, this is going to be a huge step for us in the right direction and we really can start making this official. And the first thing on my agenda as we do move forward is to start engaging our student body. Um, a big piece about this is storytelling. And so making sure that our students across the district to understand where we're headed and how they might be a part of the journey. Um, I think this the student um, advisory group is going to be definitely our first stop in, in the process of where we're going with this. But yeah, at the heart and soul, um, that's my calling. That's why I've been in education. I think they guide number one first and foremost every day. So their decisions come first for sure. Very good. Thank you. No more questions. Other directors? Okay, with no more questions, just to be specific, um, we do have as part of the attachments actually a resolution and it would be approval of the resolution is how we would um, go forward and complete this purchase. So do I have a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing the purchase of real property, specifically our Arapahoe Community College Parker campus located 
15653 Brookstone Drive, unincorporated Douglas County, Colorado, 80134. So moved. Moved by Ray. Second. Second by Myers. I will call the roll. Hanson? Aye. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed 7 to 0. Thank you, Mr. Windsor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we move to item number 23, President Reports. Uh, as mentioned earlier, agenda planning for the 8 March school board study session is scheduled for 1130 on this Thursday, the 24th. Um, board of Education special meetings regarding superintendent identification are planned for the first, possibly the second, and the third. And uh, also wanted to give a shout out to uh, DC Kid. Uh, back on February 15th, uh, the Douglas County Kids Identified with Dyslexia, also known as DC Kid Personnel, provided a really excellent immersive dyslexia presentation for uh, a few of the directors. We had four directors attend. We also had Mr. Reynolds uh, attending and uh, really got a firsthand experience on what it's like to have a processing issue like dyslexia in multiple areas. Also got some great education, some wonderful suggestions. I was glad Mr. Reynolds was there uh, to hear them on some, some possible things we can do programmatically, professional development and curriculum moving forward. But that was an excellent presentation and I thank them for their time. Um, one last item that I have is the MBEC, uh, the Millbond Exploratory Committee uh, Board Liaisons. Uh, we generally ask for two volunteers for any committee. And if we have two directors at this time that would like to support the MBEC and be their liaison as they go through their valuable work, I'll take any, uh, any volunteers at this time. I volunteer. We have Director Weiniger. Do we have another volunteer to liaison with the MBEC. I'm, I, if we can make the second one kind of rotating in, I, I have some conflicts on some Wednesdays coming up. Um, in addition, LRPC is on Wednesdays, so there's some conflicts, but I would like to attend when I am able. Okay, and knowing that we can always substitute in directors, so we have Weiniger and Williams, unless there are others that would like to volunteer. Okay, Vice President items number 24. Nothing to add. And Director items, Board Committee and Liaison reports from any directors, and I guess I'll just start at this end with Director Meek. Sure. Um, last week on February 17th, we had the DAC forum. So it was really a wonderful gathering. Um, Dr. Cypers gave the keynote um, address, and I believe there's a link where individuals can watch that. It, it's a great presentation talking about anxiety and mental health issues in our students and communities. So that was, that was really, really helpful. Um, and if you'll indulge me, I, I just want to say a few comments about my reflections on tonight and, and where we are as a board. And, you know, I think we all realize we need to bring the community together for our students. And that is a tall order given where the division is right now in the community. I don't think if three of us resigned or if four of us resigned, that would resolve the division in the community. I, I think it's divided because there are different opinions in the community. And I think we were all elected to be leaders and to do our best to bridge that division in the community. And I'd just like us to think a little bit about what our next steps maybe should be. Um, I offered to be an officer earlier, not because I thought I would be directing anything, but I thought maybe that would create a bridge. Um, I pushed for a retreat, thinking that will give us an opportunity to talk about the direction of the district. And I, I want to bring that idea up again, because I think we keep hearing, what is the direction? What is the direction? And I think having a very public conversation around that will be valuable um, to our community. And then lastly, you know, the reason that I feel like I advocate for you know, compromise, changing things, because I feel like I am trying to bridge 
differences of opinions. And, you know, the more that we can compromise with each other to try to show that we're trying to build trust and, and a bridge, I think will go a long way. And so I just wanted to bring that up, but I, I just would love for us to spend time talking about what do we need to do as a board to help lead our community so that we're doing everything possible for our students. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Weiniger, any comments? I don't have anything to add, but I appreciate all that you said, Director Meek. Director Myers. I actually had a Zoom Rimsel meeting this morning, and I have yet to go visit them, but Danny's promised to take me. <laughs> so we're gonna go take a little visit, great meeting, and moving forward. And I agree with Susan. I think we've heard it from emails, I know I have, and uh, comments. It's time for us to start modeling. And, you know, I always say, I haven't been married 45 years without compromising. So you figure out the things. We're not all going to agree on everything, but we need to do what's best for our school district, and that's our community and our kids. We really do have to get our kids the education and get going. And so, yes, actually, I think tonight was a pretty nice example of that we can, we can work together. Director Ray. Uh, Director Meek stole my thunder. I wanted to shout out about DAC Forum as, as well. But I also wanted to shout out to um, our learning service officer, uh, Matt Reynolds, who um, this DAC group pretty much says to Matt, here's what we want. And Matt runs and gets all our staff coordinated to put on an event like that. And it was really uh, an incredible event by our, our mental uh, health wellness staff from the OTs to our counselors. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you um, because that's been a, Matt's been a liaison for this group for many years, uh, thick and thin. Um, and I just really am grateful that he just brings that calm, collect leadership and then he takes it and does the, does the work that's necessary to help that group be successful. So thank you um, for that evening. It was, it was truly a great evening um, to be part of. So, uh, and I would just concur. I, you know, I think we, we all are ready to figure out how do we, how do we move forward um, for the sake of kids. And I agree with Dr. Meek. I think um, compromise is definitely where we need to continue to con see if we can find common ground. Um, but I also agree that we desperately need uh, a retreat or time and that we can just really be people and human with each other. And, and, and I think that's uh, definitely a missing link for us right now. So I look forward to that as well. Director Hansen. Yeah, I have nothing to add, thank you. Okay, moving on to the final item for tonight, uh, which is adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Ray. Second. Second, Williams. Hansen. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Now stand adjourned. <laughs>